People are wondering really why cool. Luigi is in this Mario game. And now I think that that's this, be is the huge this is point. this is unprecedented. This is breaking new ground. Unprecedented. Un unpre What's it got to do with the president rags? I don't understand. I don't know. Mario supremacy is by done. Uh -huh. Alright, that's all online. Let me get the link for you. Oh, while we're doing setup, we should probably be like, hey, who here hasn't met each other? Say hello, because I'm not even sure who it is or not. Hello. <laughs> hello. Well, actually, no, I should probably start with welcome Shady Durags. Sh sh that, that is how that's pronounced, right? I'm doing that right? Uh, I hope so, yeah, because that's how I've been saying it. Oh, thank goodness. Um, you've, uh, you, I've seen you around in the chat. You, you sent me a, was it an email or a Discord? I'm not even sure, but either way... We've uh, got you in to chat a bit about media, and uh, well, welcome, welcome to EFAB. How are you doing? Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Gracious, uh, it, I, yeah. See, I kind of embellish the story. You know, when I tell people, it's like, uh, it's not that I sent Mahler an email. It's definitely he sent me one. Like, oh, it could have, you could have said that, and I would have believed you fans. because I, I can't even remember anymore. I've got so many. Th this, this is the worst time of year for me for like. Keeping my brain in check, there's so much shit going on, but hey, you're here. That's what's important. It's almost spooky ween. It is. The we are minutes away. Me. Minutes. Yeah. It's already spooky ween over here. Wow. Is it okay? Everything fine? Did it get super dark all of a sudden? Or... No, it's, it's pretty chill. Has no. there been music? Yeah, there's always. Have we seen those yeah. ghosts running yeah. around? Pumpkins? No. Oh, yeah, there's yeah. that uh, Mariah Carey song. That they love playing at this time of year. Hmm. All I want for Halloween is you, or whatever. All I want, to, all I want for Halloween is boo. boo. I, I assume that's how it goes. Like the first chords play, and then I stop listening. Well, um, I think, uh, yeah, I, I think it's almost the spooky ween time, and it's great, and we're gonna have the pumpkins with the faces, and there's gonna be the ghosts and the goblins and the witches. We got goblins all year round. What's that about? They don't stick well, to that one where you live. They're mig they migrate. They're yeah, regional. I'm in Wales, so... <laughs> a lot of goblins. It's this kind of the... A lot of goblins in Wales? <laughs> yeah, they, they roost just hang out over the summer. <laughs> they roost. We have the, the queen goblins or... live in Wales, I think. They, that's where they spawn. <laughs> uh, but yes, welcome, and uh, obviously uh, good to meet you myself, but also everybody here, I presume. I don't know if you've met anyone here before, but uh, I just... Uh, you know, assume not. I assume, I assume nobody here has met each other before. This is all brand new for everyone. I, I have not met anyone here. Mm -hmm. I'm alone and I'm confused and I'm afraid. That's the, I get nervous around new people. That's actually the way I always want it to be for guests. I want them to have no idea what's happening whatsoever. I don't even want them to know what English is as a language. That's always created the best results, I find. But um, yeah, welcome anyway is what I'm trying to get at. And I assume everyone did their homework chat. I'm going to make him stress out, because I didn't actually give them homework. Oh um, my goodness. Oh, you guys I better have really... watched Ratatouille, and if you didn't, I'm judging you. It's funny, because I didn't say anything about this last song. But they don't know that. That is funny. <laughs> Look at them all stressing, sweating. Um, I never stressed for a solid half a second there. But we watched it, and by we I mean me, Rags, and Fringy together. And my god, I just wanted to start off with saying, what a great fucking movie, man. Um, been, uh... Yeah, it's top tier. It's uh, one of Pixar's best. It's such a nice thing to get reminded of, like, oh yeah, this is when Pixar kicked ass. Like, they, yeah. they knew what they were doing. 2008. I don't know if there's, like, any studio that must have been something in the water. <laughs> the stream of amazing films. Oh, one of their best so. movies, I think. Great screenplay. Oh, it's, it's you, guys, of, yeah. you guys it's are activating, like, my biggest fear. Like, my biggest fear was the first thing I was going to do is come in here and say something. It's contrary. actually shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm you know, sorry. Most people who see this yeah. movie put it in great uh, Pixar quality. I just put it in good Pixar quality. Oh, my it's God. It's full of French people and Remy's a fucker. <laughs> it's it's not bad. I don't think it's bad. It's just I don't see it as top tier Pixar. I don't put it up there with Incredibles or Toy Story. Mm. Uh, and the the What's thing that stops me from <laughs> the thing that stops me from putting it really up there is uh, whenever I ask people like what makes this movie, or whenever I hear po people talking about this movie, they always reference the themes, and I get that. I wanted to get that, but the plot to me relies a way too much on luck. Like a little bit of luck I can handle, but there's so much luck in this movie. Like e even kid me was like, really? 
Um, I'm inclined to agree with you. I think the character and theme of the strongest pillars, meanwhile, plot has uh, a couple of flaws here and there to make sure everything runs smoothly. Uh, doesn't beat out Wally for me. It's going to be number one forever, probably. And uh, Incredibles is, is hard to beat. Yeah. Incredibles is fucking cool. But those are my top three: are Incredibles, Wally, and Ratatouille. Ratatouille's character work themes are just too. Uh, they're they're too strong. That even even granting that there are some major contrivances in the plot, even granting that it's like yeah, but the character work and the themes they're just oh, it's too too exemplary. Mm hmm. I mean, um, yeah, but with Incredibles, you have a great plot and great character structure. So that's why I'm like, Incredibles yeah, like, is I'm top not, tier. Sure why, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know why the, like, I, Incredibles isn't my top three, like, Pixar films. Like, you're not going to find me disagreeing with you on that one. I think uh, Ratatouille is, pro is my favorite. I think it's just because it hits me in the feels really big. I think it's got mm -hmm. a, uh, I just think that's, it just always, it always so hits say. me. Uh, obviously, all say. of them have plenty yeah. to say. Uh, in fact, they have well, a hell of like, a lot more to say than one might expect, because you're like, oh, it's that message, but it's also that, and that, and if you think about that, oh, and that, and there's been a nuance there for that, and you're like, holy shit. Yeah, and all achieved in less than two hours every single time, <laughs> you know? like the, the Isn't it incredible? Story. I don't mean to absolutely annihilate this dead no, horse's it, corpse, this is Ratatouille. but... Um, Incredibles is the, a different movie. Shut the fuck up. You got Ahsoka, episode one and two, that can almost get up to about two hours, right? Yeah, and think about how much... I, I think they are about two hours, right? Because the first episode's like 50 minutes. Something it, something really close. It, like, Can you imagine comparing the density of content between those two like approaches to storytelling? It's absolutely nuts. Uh, I wouldn't even... I feel like I wouldn't even bother. There's no <laughs> point. It's in a completely different league <laughs> in terms of craft. Yeah, it's not fair to compare them. This For is sure, like uh, this is like well, getting it? Michael Phelps to getting to a racing competition with, I don't know, like a, a cinder block, maybe. Hmm. <laughs> maybe you cinder paint block. a little face. I go, on I go a cinder you mean, block. yeah. Well, paint a little face going... on a cinder block and chuck it in. Was, and that's assuming that. Okay. Assuming the race is in water, if it depends on if you're trying to go horizontal or vertical. Because if you're going down, the cinder block's gonna win. Oh my god, yeah. I was just thinking, why does, oh, why does a rock sink and a ship doesn't? Oh, because their stone a looks only block, downwards. A ah. looks down. yeah. Its eyes are on the bottom. I don't even know what that uh, fucking means! Finrod, what are you talking about? You need, uh, you need the animated Pixar movie from this year about stones with little eyes that look up at him and Crazy like, what do you mean, elf. what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> All of that light All of the Iluvatar is getting to his fucking head. All, all my life I've been a stone, but I've wanted to be a ship. There you go. You There's can't be a ship, son. A stone is a stone. A ship is a, a ship. Stone. Like, I'll show you, Dad. And that's the end of Act I'm not a stone, I'm up. a rock. If you're a rock, you can't be a stone. Yeah, there would be a joke about, what well, Dad, what's the difference between, like, a rock and a stone and a mineral? Like, Glad you asked, son. <laughs> There's something I want to show you. And the dad would be, like, you know, ignorant on some things, but he'd probably say something really inspirational at one point in the movie. And yeah. come out in, in no, the end. Round it all out. Like, yeah. no jokes aside, I love the metaphor in A Bug's Life uh, about the scene in the tree. Absolutely adore that metaphor. I haven't seen Bug Life in, like a, in ages. I feel bad. I haven't seen A Bug's Life, life in many, like, it's many not lifetimes. Of, of that era, it's not like in the category of cars. It feels like it's in the in, in the in between realm. It's like one of the more forgotten Pixar films. I think it was yeah. their. Was it their first? It was their second, so they did, second. Uh, cause they did Toy Story, and then oh, they did okay. A Bug's Life, and, and Toy Story 2 wasn't originally, I think originally it wasn't meant to be theatrical, but then the longer it went on, the more it turned it, like it was, you know, this was the era of, uh, you know, sequels on VHS, DVD. Uh, um, Bug's Life has a lot of highs and a lot of lows, because, you know, they were very exper experimental on a bunch of stuff, and the plot is contrived in a lot of places, but the metaphorical and character stuff, like, really hits the high notes in that movie. You can tell they kind of wanted to repeat the success of Toy Story. So they're like, Randy Newman, again. People yeah. like Randy Newman, right? He's like, yeah. is Randy, can you do the theme song for A Bug's Life? And he's like, no, I can't. I'm doing Monk. And Ooh. they're like, okay, well, yeah, no, references, baby. 
And then when he was done with that, then he's like, okay, I can do the other thing you want me to do. I, uh, man, I really like the score in Monsters, Inc. It's so oh, good. That's brilliant. I... <laughs> oh, wow, yeah, that's I like my favorite well. song in, is uh, Put That Thing Back Where It Came From More So Help Me. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good one. I really like that one. That's good. Help me. Help me. Nice new car. One of my favorite uh, Pixar uh, shorts. Hmm. Is what is he like, is he wait, our favorite one eyed character, or does anyone have another one eyed uh, character that beats him out? I mean, Leela. Le uh, oh, beat me Leela. to it. Oh yeah, yeah. Leela. Yeah. I yeah, mean, I really woman. like Mike. Mike's awesome. Mike Wazowski. Mike Wazowski. Um, well, I was going to say quickly, just out of curiosity, from left to right, if you can, just name what you believe to be the best Pixar movie, out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. uh, best, I'd have to think about it more, but my favorite is Finding Nemo. All right. Fair choice. It's uh, one of it's my favorite Wally. movies of all time. It's great. My, uh, yeah, mine's Wally. Uh, it's one of my favorite films, just, yeah, in general. I, I would say Wally as well. Ratatouille might be a second for me. Wally for me. Wally's the best, but I like Ratatouille the most. I think it's a tie between several movies, but to insert my own personal bias, I'm going to say Incredibles. Yep, bad choice. And I probably between. have to go Incredibles as well, but I have never seen Wally, so I could. Oh my what? god! Can we watch that together, please? Oh, yeah, we watch. EFAP is canceled. We're watching <laughs> Wally. See you guys. <laughs> I'm going to go sort that Goodbye, out. Bye everyone. Right we'll see you next week. <laughs> so it's like, what? Get him out! It's like, no, this is good news. <laughs> a pretender I, to the throne. I have an excuse to watch Wally again. Oh, that does sound good. No, I've heard lots of good things about Wally, but yeah, there's a couple of Pixar ones that I've just I've never seen or just haven't seen more than once. But that one I've never seen ever, which I realize is is a crime. But you know, well, well, that was <laughs> the last film in the golden age for Pixar because uh, Up isn't as Up is overrated. Ooh. Hey, it's a good movie. Mm. It's a good movie, but it's quite over. Well, Whatever, it, it, Up it was, was always so so to me. It was, it was good, but hey, man, love that opening. Love that fifteen minutes. Yeah, See, the, the thing is, I put Ratatouille like uh, below Up. Like they're, they're on the same <laughs> tier. I think <laughs> Up is higher, <laughs> both metaphorically and <laughs> not <laughs> metaphorically, <laughs> than Ratatouille. It's madness. Um, the reason why Up is overrated <laughs> is it's kind of like not. It's not really the film's... That was the first uh, Pixar film that got nominated for Best Picture, which I think is, like, That's insane. That, that all of the films that they made before that were not considered good enough to be nominated for Best Picture. There's only... I think only three animated films have ever been nominated for Best Picture. The first was Beauty and the Beast. Second was Up. Third was Toy Story 3. I think that's really lame. <laughs> that, uh... That, like... Yeah. Wally and The Incredibles and Ratatouille and Toy Story and Monsters Inc. All of these films were considered not good enough to be nominated for Best Picture because animated films barely ever, ever get nominated for Best Picture. I just, um, I remember even when I first watched it, I was blown away by the opening. And then I was like, what the hell was the rest of the film? Like, not in a it way that I thought it was terrible, more, just it felt strange. It got a lot more. I felt normal. that way too. <laughs> And I still, I, I felt that way too. With uh, like the the beginning of the movie is just mind blowing. You do not expect that from this type of movie. And the the rest of the movie, it's like, do we like change courses somewhere? Like yeah. what happened? <laughs> hey, you know, they they can do like, yeah, they once he once like he gets on the dog. island with the talking dog. It got like a little too yeah wacky for me, like relative to the way it started. I didn't I dislike like, it, but uh, it felt like, like it went dog. off the rails a bit. He's a good lad. Yeah. And I like Kevin. I like uh, I like that bird. Mm -hmm. I like those fellows. Yeah, Kevin's great. He's good. She's like, great. The thing about Up is that, like, after that first 15 minutes, it becomes, like, it, it just, it, it, it's not as bad. It's just a lot more normal and just, like, conventionally good, but, like, not exceptionally good. Deja vu. Deja vu in what way? I mean, that's almost exactly what I said about Ratatouille. Ah. Oh. Well, Ratatouille starts off its first, like, 15 minutes is excellent and then starts to become <laughs> more just normal good. Uh, well, not not the first 15 minutes part. It's that it's not that it's bad. It's just that it, it's good, but it's not top tier quality. Mm. That's, how, that's why I say Ratatouille and Up are in the same tiers. Although, personally, I put Up totally, above Ratatouille. Totally disagree, but... <laughs> 
It's okay. And that's the beauty of art, criticism, analysis, and discussion, which is an easy segue into what we're talking about today, which is a video called The Problem with Overcriticism, and it's a referential oh to film review in YouTube, or on YouTube, and uh, it's using Ratatouille as a vehicle to try and let us know about the truth of criticism, the reason for it that we may have lost along the way. And I don't mean we as in any particular person, but he does make reference to particular people. So. It means we as in the French, as in Ratatouille. Yes, they've lost their way, those French. They... Anton Ego is just too cruel. The, he wasn't French, though, right? He was, like, in the story, I guess he would have been English. Was... Um, I actually don't yeah. know. Some of the characters, yeah, I can't tell if they're supposed to be French, but they're just played by Americans and or Brits or what's going on there. But I think he's French with... I don't know, actually. Anton? What is Anton? An Ego. <laughs> what is, is Oh, wait! Isn't it interesting that the man named Anton Ego, his last word in the movie, is me? My god. Isn't that a completely <laughs> worthless fucking fact that I just thought of in my brain? <laughs> All right, we can carry on. There you go. We can wrap I that just, up. I yeah. tried so hard to make that have meaning. I was like, where is he getting at? And I just did the meme where the person's staring in space and there's math in front of him. I was trying so hard to figure out what you were trying to say. No, I, that's I it. it was, we're there, baby. And it's one of those things, Raz, where you don't even want to like explain it to people. You just want to be like, it's art in and of itself. You just let you it said. sink in. You just yeah. want to let that sink in and simmer. And so it yeah. did. Uh, had to marinate. Well, there's no reason not to get started. I think everybody's in the watch together, so exciting times ahead. Uh, I'm not going to say what to expect with this video. I'm mostly hoping for us to have a little chat about media criticism, I suppose. Well, art criticism, I should say. Do we got to talk are, about art uh, on this podcast? Damn. We do be doing that, apparently. But yes, uh, before we even oh start God. the video up, we've got this slide here, and we've got... If you were told what is the connecting factor with all of these, I guess you'd have to go with review. Yeah, yeah. reviewer, okay. media criticism. Yeah. RogerEbert.com. I don't know what that's about. Pitchfork. I've never heard of Pitchfork. I've never heard of Pitchfork. Uh, can, review. Can, can you put like, is Sin's review? Or? Like, isn't is Sin's more parody than it is review? I don't know I, uh, anymore. I, I, think, I think that they still have to be. Because they, they say they get things it. wrong intentionally. Well, maybe that. But they say that they get things right intentionally too, and then they're wrong. So, like, <laughs> I feel like that has to. I don't like the uh, the whole power. Like, they make real criticisms in there, so I think I think it's fair to throw them in the mix. Well, I would also say it's that a great standard um, to have though. It's like if I get this wrong, then I'm joking. Yeah, and, exactly. You know, and th that's it. So it's on you to determine. Really, is. It's in the audience's imagination whether I'm right or not. But if I'm wrong, yeah. then it's deliberate. And if I'm right, then it's also deliberate. It's uh, it's what's known as bullshit. <laughs> well, I guess the, I mean. <laughs> the thing that's worthwhile putting it there maybe is representative of, even if it's parody, it would count as among all of the people who are doing the thing. There are, there are certainly I... people who would view Cinema Sins as like a source for understanding whether a film is good or bad. There are some of those would... people out there. I would call it more so feel comfortable calling it commentary than review, but I'm not gonna die on this hill. It's um, I see what you're getting at. It's just that like, yeah, those words could be swapped out so easily in the average sentence that it would only be relevant to distinguish them if we were having a full-on conversation about it, which we will be today, I suppose. Oh my god! But goodness. we'll let this lad take it away first. There are a... oh. sorry, I'm going back. There are a lot of critics in the world, and I'm not talking about just Ooh. one Start kind bold. of critic. You oh, got look, film critics, critic. music critics, yeah. food critics, game critics, car critics, spicy chicken wait, wing critics. Wait, 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 yeah. wait. That was the friendly Geordie's parody thing in there. I guess that's meant to be a joke. <laughs> Well, especially when it was spicy chicken review here, I suppose, I suppose yeah. it's just like, you know, we got everything. We got all the things. He looks like the kind of guy who reviews spicy chicken. I think he, I, I, he'd have, I was going to say, I'd trust him. He probably knows the best spicy he, chicken. He's missing he a very like, specific feature to be reviewing chicken. He's not. That? What are we going? <laughs> right. It's okay to make those kinds of jokes here. I just didn't know if that's where we're going. It's, well, the punchline <laughs> hits harder when I don't say it. Oh, oh. Talking about the fact that he's American the and they don't know the... shit. They're ignorant. He's not, because he's not French, so he can't be a proper food critic, is what you mean. Yeah. Yes. Aren't, they, aren't the French known for spicy chicken? Mm-hmm. They love it. Put yeah, it in their little baguettes or whatever. 
Critics, Ikuni. hell, you've even got critics of critics, and then critics of those critics of critics. Hey, that's us. Allegedly. Shout out. Mm. <laughs> also, Game Players University. That's not Mark Brown, right? That's someone else. Because he does, he does game do game players university. So is that like the university where you learn how to play video games rather than make them? Well, we're gonna need that for a lot of Jados these days. Okay, for you, like it's an important well, yeah, element. I mean, <laughs> that Dean Takahashi Cuphead thing still. How condescending that, it would be to be like, mind. we need you. We're gonna pay for it. We need you to go through this university course about playing video games. And like lesson one is literally pong. And they're like, you got a paddle yeah. in front of you, everybody. <laughs> Just uh, push forward, pull back. <laughs> Or, I mean, are we going to get to the point where you have it and it's like the VGA chess, right, of, like, university for competitive video games, like, to get to esports or something? Well, that would be interesting. Like, you, you know, you, you yeah. can get S marks if you're able to beat, like, I don't know, what's, like, a really hard campaign? Maybe World at War on Veteran, uh, if you can do that. War on Veteran, yeah. That'd be, that'd be a big challenge. Or, you know, and, like, like, the exam um, is, uh, you know, you can show evidence of it, but you have to complete, like, one of the missions in the university, that, and we have to be done within two hours or whatever. had exams on, like, understanding of the mechanics, you know? Like, a, like an actual quiz on the understanding of the mechanics and how they work. Down they're like, to, what like, is the maximum real... amount of grenades the AI can throw at you during World War on Veteran Difficulty? And you, there's, like, the <laughs> options are, like, 5, 10, 15, and infinite, and you just choose infinite because yeah. that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, kids, a degree is like real life gamer score. True. <laughs> but it's as is like getting married yeah. and taking baths. Oh, Just imagine, treat it all like gamer. You score. know that's happened. There's a nerd out there that got married and he said achievement unlocked after it. <laughs> oh, so yeah, we, we, we met in Halo. Saying. Yeah. What? Oh, and and the wife was probably yeah, like, oh, honey, don't say that. <laughs> like, no, it, no, degrees, that doesn't mean degrees are useless. Sometimes people are impressed by them. <laughs> but what exactly makes a critic a critic? Why do we have so many of them? And more importantly, what should make them good at their job? I, uh, this is a fair foundation to start with, but I think you should probably cut to the chase immediately and say that basically everybody is and they are automatically it's just part of judgment. We all judge all the time about everything. It's how we categorize and we make our lives better. You know, it's like what makes a critic and why are there so many of them? It's just like, oh, well, it's just like a basic function, but given a professional I level. Think, uh, I, I think, I think I, I agree that that's probably something to like, but I think people would like, that would be kind of contentious, even though I, I don't think it should be. I feel like there's a certain, like the, the idea of, of criticism that you bake into your own process, for instance, of making something. I don't, I don't know that that would be what people colloquially think of when they think of criticism. They are thinking of, like, the movie critic guy, right? Well, no, like, but he asked why. why. Why is this happening? Why do people do it? And it's like, oh, oh that's just a part right, of a basic right. function that we do anyway. Yeah, Did yeah. I, gotcha. I, I um, think I missed that. I know he asked what is a critic. Yeah, he said, why are there so many? And I'm saying that it's just everyone does it all the time on a lesser, not necessarily a lesser format, but a simplistic format or one that's not meant for um, consumption by other people necessarily. It could just be for yeah. you. Um, that's why I said that, uh, you know, this doesn't include professional levels where it starts to get to a point where you need to standardize things. You need to have consistent the methods process. and presentation and formats and reputation and industry. There's all these things that'll come with it. But, you know, like, why does anyone end up in those roles? It's like, well, in a way... The simplistic format we're already all there from the get-go we're always judging and categorizing things uh it's just something we do this pea soup is as weak as the acting and nowhere near as hammy it's actually a pretty good line from homer <laughs> like, <laughs> good, yeah. dad that's so mean the other critics told me to be mean and you should always give in to peer pressure you know, just be careful for copyright of course and yeah, this is a very true fact from Homer. Always give in. But what if someone bad tells me to- Always. Is there any real value to them? Or are most of them just narcissistic, super cynical people who criticize absolutely every little detail there is just for the sake of nitpicking? Well, maybe some are. But let's start with what makes well, a yeah. critic. And don't worry, I'll bring in Ratatouille soon enough and explain why it's important to this whole idea. Um... I, th I guess he just presented like the opposite end of the unrealistic or the uh, extreme section, right? Being like, critics suck. They're already there to ruin everything. Like, no, obviously not. But probably are some, I guess. There are people out there who would accuse us of being um, like solely invested we, in just ripping things apart. Yeah. All we do is blah, blah, blah. Obviously, the 
the counter to that, at least a simplistic one, would be like, what do you call it then when we like appreciate tiny things in a good way? Like, what, what is that? Uh, you know, it's like the desperate desire yeah, to just get credit appreciate. for that. No, and, and it's, it's interesting because it, I think a lot of people do it, but it often doesn't get remembered. Small uh, praise, but you know, small criticism does because it's such an intuitive and easy thing to say, right? It's like, oh, you fucking you're just going for something tiny. It doesn't really matter. You're just trying to be mean. Neat pick, I'm indeed. Still, I'm still waiting for him like to fully define critic because, like Mahler was saying, like pretty much everyone is a critic. And that's we have reasons for wanting things to be better. Like that's where critiquing comes from. We want things to improve. Well, I guess yeah. Criticism uh, is sort of like a like in a way a, an often necessary force to having things improve because a lot of things just won't get better if no one's there to you know criticize it, kind of push it forwards a bit. Firstly, How do you know something's bad if no one tells you, like, and you think it's good. Um, yeah, this will more than likely come up as soon as he starts getting into more detail, but it seems like the reason he started with this is just like, it's it's almost like a reflexive reaction to too much criticism. It's like, you're all mean, and then he's like, well, maybe it's something else. It's like, okay, what's the, what's the reasonable take? In my opinion, to be a critic, you must be a person with judgment. You have to have the ability to judge the merit of something, and from there determine its value. It's someone who determines if you're looking at a priceless artifact, or just a worthless piece of junk. It is a characteristic that sounds inherently harsh on the surface because, well, no one wants to be seen as judgmental. Even one of my favorite TV shows- I feel like the action of judging and being judgmental a bit different. Like, when people call you judgmental, I assume they're saying it's like um, a negative aspect of being judgy as opposed to just judging things in general. Like, if you're judgmental, you judge too much. Yes, or judge in a yeah, way that's very biased everyone and judges toxic. Or everyone does judging. Yeah. Well, yeah, nobody nobody would say that somebody is judgmental if they're like the helpful tutor who gives very constructive criticism levied in, a, in an incredibly, like, kind way. Uh, yeah, and there are contexts where, like... Very explicit goal of trying to help them improve. Say in a or factory, if they're like a judge. Yeah, say in a factory you have to knock out like defective parts that are going on a little uh, conveyor belt. Nobody's going to call you judgmental, but you are doing a lot of judgment at that point. Lots of, I um... really like this soup. I'm like, well, you're being awfully judgmental, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What about like a courtroom? Would you call a judge judgmental? I guess. So. <laughs> wow, you're being awfully judgmental. It's like, yeah, yeah, I guess. I'm paid to you know do what? it. You're right. I don't want to do so, this anymore. Like, first off, yes, I am, and also you're still guilty, so it doesn't matter. It's, 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 I'm actually curious because I always feel like judgmental has a negative connotation going beyond um, judging things. So, what is it defined as? Of, I would say that morally, right? Yeah. So like the primary definition is just concerning the use of judgment, but the the second definition is having or displaying an overly critical point of view. Um, I would still say that, like, how it use, people use it colloquially is usually, like, you're judging things in a way that is not either healthy or useful. Or you're being condescending a lot. Yeah. That's probably a big part of it. I suppose of a, a better way of encapsulating somebody being judgmental is they are too often vocalizing their judgment. Because, like you guys were saying, everybody judges pretty much everything and things <laughs> that they come across. Yeah, yeah, but uh, they don't always... They keep it to themselves, I think, most of the time. Even one of my favorite TV shows of late, called Ted Lasso, preaches this mantra of being curious and not judgmental. You know, they thought they had everything all figured out, and so they judged everything. And they. I'm gonna put up copyright cover actually, because I'm not fully trusting uh -oh. these vi this visual editing. I'm worried about yep. it. Yep. Judged everyone. And I realized that they're underestimating. Right, is, that, uh, that's, is that Anthony Swift? That is indeed him, yeah. That's it's Bomb Voyage, you can tell by the chin. <laughs> <laughs> Who I was had nothing to do with it. So maybe this is why we look towards others for guidance, as we would rather let someone else take this burden of being judge, jury, and executioner. I, uh, I don't, I'm not going to say that that's not a thing, but I've always assumed the simple, simple, simple answer is just time-saving. We rely on people whose job it is to get us the stuff we need quickly in terms of good food. Instead good, of having no information, uh, you have film. some amount of information to make a choice with when yeah, if you, you're... Know, you don't have that time to look into it. There, sure. there are people who are so busy with hobbies, careers, friends, family, life and stuff that when they sit down to like, I want to watch a movie, they don't want to... You can't, you can't have the life experience of a person who's reviewing movies every single day. 
just for, for nothing. But you technically, in a way, can when you're like, hey, person who's done that, what should I watch? And then they're like, I recommend this. And you're like, okay, I'll watch it. And especially if it's reliable, if you like everything they recommend, it's like at that point, why would you need to become, you know, like super familiar with all the film to properly, yeah. like directors, writers, or histories with different industries and production companies? It's just like, no, 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 I'm just going to get this person to tell me where to go and what to do. Well, I don't I know mean, that. You know, it's it's just kind of the same as a friend recommending a movie. It's like, yeah, all right, well, I like my friend and I like their perspective, so I'll check it out. I don't think it's people like are listening to. Judgment, you know? I don't think people are listening to or reading Siskel and Ebert going, oh, thank God you guys will take the burden of being judgy off yeah. of me. It's just well, like, no, well, oh, I'm only going to see one movie yeah. this month or something. So, like, what are the good ones? I found well, it consciously yeah. they're not going through that process. Quite a lot of I find in my life, like, people are more than willing to admit when they're, they're like, against the grain in terms of, like, if, if a group of people are like, oh, I fucking love uh, Lord of the Rings, if there's that one person who's like, I don't know, I don't know, I thought it was fine, I guess. Like, I don't typically see them being like, I'm not going to say anything because I wouldn't want to be the person seen as judgmental. Because I'm going with what he seems to have defined it as, which is... Um, because it's funny, if you praise a movie, are you being judgmental? We kind of went over this, but I just... No, uh, it's the same as, like, the term opinionated. People don't often say you're opinionated when you give very positive yeah. opinions about things, only when they're negative. Nobody, nobody's particularly fussed if you're positive about something, for the most part. <laughs> yeah, it's, um... Well, I, I think if you're constantly voicing even positive opinions about things, somebody might call you opinionated. You know, it's like, I don't think, but, but no one would ever call you judgmental, I don't think. <laughs> right. Which is interesting to think about. Mm, even though you are always mm. judging. But maybe it goes into the, the condescension part that I'd mentioned. It has mm. that, uh, like if you judge things negatively, it's like, oh yeah, that's beneath me. I'm, I'm better than it, potentially. People might get that attitude. Think of the times we, where a new film uh, comes out. We kind of strayed from this topic, but I want to circle back to it before I forget. The essence of community is uh, others doing things that you don't want to do and you compensate them for it. So with people who do uh, criticizing professionally, uh, they are usually incentivized to do so. And the people who want them to do it usually incentivize them to do it so they themselves don't have to. I, I don't know if it's always that they themselves don't have to, but quite often you'll get people who actually, they are judging on their own. So anyone who goes to a cinema or watches something and they will be judging it all the way through and they might have somewhere yeah. deep down this sense that actually the thing isn't very good, but they can't quite put their finger on why. And then the critic fulfills the function of that sort of always felt ne'er so well expressed thing and that the critic well, actually puts into words things that they've not necessarily sat down and, and put into sentences, but they have definitely felt there is something wrong there. And uh, this is going to get super complicated if we actually include the part that does happen, which is judging the critics' judgments as a judging viewer. Like, <clears throat> when you have, let's say, ten recommendations from person, and they're all great, and then the next five are all awful, but they highly recommend them, you'll at first be like, wow, this person just nails it, they know exactly what they're doing. And then the next five, they're like, whoa, this person's kind of fallen off, I don't know if they know what they're talking about anymore. And what was that all based on? It's like, well, it's actually your own judgment at that point of the films. Which is uh, right. interesting to think about because, yeah, the, the reality is we're all constantly judgmental by the definition of we're judging shit a lot. It's like, yeah, it's always happening. Yeah, the, the taking off of the burden of like judgment is weird. That that point that he's making, mm -hmm. like Platoon was saying, I don't think like, anyone does I, that. If, yeah, if I listen to a critic about a movie, it's usually just about like, do I want to spend the money to go into the theater to actually watch this thing? And then when I do, then I'm judging it. I'm figuring exactly. out whether I think it's good or bad, yeah. You'll form your own opinion, and that might be one that differs from the critic. It's not like you, the critic says that the film is good and then you watch it. It's like, the only reason I'm here is to, I guess, spend time to then leave and wholesale agree with what the critic said. That's just kind of strange. Yeah. Usually our first instinct is to turn to sites like Rotten Tomatoes to give us the lowdown on what other recognized critics are saying about the movie. So I gotta like, say, well, I gotta true. say, yeah. right, like, <laughs> for me, absolutely not, and basically never, I don't think I ever at a point in my life was like, I gotta go check out the Rotten Tomatoes, but I accept that people do this, I suppose. There was actually mm -hmm. a study I saw in a recent article that came out about Rotten Tomatoes, and uh, apparently... A third of adults, I don't know if they surveyed internationally or whether it was just America, but a third of adults said they checked Rotten Tomatoes before deciding mm. to go see a movie. 
Yeah, okay. I don't know if yeah, that's up or down from previous right. years, but it's roughly a third of people who do. Well, I suppose the interesting thing, though, is that the highlighting the part where people look at the, you know, what the actual critic said, I'm like, I wonder how many fewer people do that than just look at the number score. Of oh, even just looking sure. at the, yeah. the, the excerpt that Rotten Tomatoes picks, let alone reading the uh, review. And then, of course, Rotten Tomatoes is an aggregate I like a lot less than Metacritic. I just feel like Metacritic is a way better aggregate than Rotten Tomatoes. Because yeah. Rotten Tomatoes, is yeah. positive means a 6 out of 10 or above. So if a film gets like a, you know, a 90 on Rotten Tomatoes, it just means 90% of the reviews gave it a 6 out of 10 or above. But like they could have all been a 6 out of 10. Yep. Compared to, you Which know, Metacritic or the average over the number whole, score. Maintaining a 100% record is much easier you know, on this site compared to basically any other one. Uh, well, I guess what I would point to is that a lot of Marvel films have really good Rotten Tomato scores because they just get... But, the, but like, the actual number score that they're getting is, like... I think that some people don't know how the aggregate works, and that when they see a 90, they think that it's, like, reflective of, of like, a scoring system, but it's not. I'm not sure how many people do that, but I don't know how many you know, people I, fully understand how the system works. I wonder about a phenomenon of, like... Go to Rotten Tomatoes and you're like, oh, Captain Marvel, ninety-six uh, percent or whatever. Like, sure, and you go see it and you're like, well, that was shit. And then uh, mm. go back to doing your dailies or whatever, just living your life. And then you're like, oh, 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 Ant Man's coming out. Oh, it was Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, ninety-six percent. Oh, yeah, I'll go see it. And mm. basically, this this repeating process, and you never sort of draw back. Like, oh yeah, why the fuck am I looking at Rotten Tomatoes? You, you, like, they almost forgot why they were uh, boosted to go see it by the time they finished it, and they're just like, mm. well, that was a film and it wasn't good anyway. Yeah, if people need to be more attentive to the amount of people reviewing something that contributes to that score. Like, if it's just, like, two people reviewing a movie, that that could get 100% if both those reviews are well, no. positive. Um, but the only um... reason I'm going to Rotten Tomatoes nowadays is to specifically to check the ratio between audience and critic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's the only thing I score. find really interesting about it. It's the only reason I go there. Yeah. Um... Right. Yeah, and and you'd think maybe with the current results for superhero stuff, the, the that wouldn't be reflective of Rotten Tomatoes engagement from people, but it could be reflective that people aren't uh, encouraged to go and see those films by Rotten Tomatoes anymore. Unless, what are the scores lately for something like, um, I don't know, like Ant Man? I didn't check the Rotten Tomatoes. Ant Man for that. was like, I think Ant Man was something like fifty five or fifty six, so mm. it was rotten. Which uh, not many Marvel films are, because remember that was Eternals was like the first one that uh, got below six. Which is insane because that one was made by an artiste. Well, that one kind of crippled that movie. <laughs> I think I think like that that one was actually something that did like cause that film problems because there was a perception around that film, and the film sucks. But like it's not it's no more like distinctly awful than any other film that came out in Phase Four, honestly. <laughs> But like that's definitely a perception that it is. Oh, it's good old sludge. Um, but it's it, it's like it was sold as though it was supposed to be special and different. It was, it was definitely being hyped up as like ah, this is yeah, this is like a real movie. We want to know <laughs> first and foremost if it's good and worth our time. After all, someone else might have more experience with these things and can determine as well as articulate better why something is of value. Thus, yeah, we usually true. leave yeah, that yeah. power to someone else's hands before then copying their thoughts and making it our own opinion. Uh, that is no, something no, you no, can no. do. No. You had me into that last <laughs> yeah. bit there. It's not that they necessarily copy their thoughts. It's well, just like, oh, they said it's good. I'll give it a shot and see if I like it. So the interesting thing here is he presented that as a noble and almost like wholesome activity while I'm like, I agree with you. It's It's terrible. Like, and you'd be like, wait, what? And I'd be like, oh, you know, the, the, when people watch a review and they just copy it into their brain, they don't think about it, they don't incorporate it. Because I'm totally fine with someone saying, you know, um, I watched your review and I like, I totally, I've, I've started to share with friends, like, the, the, the whole thing about this particular scene. I completely agree with you. And, and, and you know, what else I think if someone you missed is actually the, if you think about this, 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 from this, and it's, and it's like, oh, shit, they've really, like, they listened to it, it changed their mind, and now they've incorporated it, and blah, blah, blah. As opposed to... You repeat the criticism because you heard it and you're just like, that's got to be true. And then someone else is like, well, wait, what about this? And then they just like a stone face like, oh, shit. Uh, I didn't think about that. And it's like, yeah, because you didn't think about <laughs> it at all. You've just copied, which sucks. Yeah. And it's then, literally like that NPC meme where he opens up his head and he just clicks in like a data card. Yeah. <laughs> and then he has angry eyebrows. And like nobody wants to be that guy. Like you want to think for yourself, don't you? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, stuff like that does happen, but to like make that assumption is a, a pretty poor like it's faith. The norm. 
Well, so, uh, yeah. I wonder if this is like a, a poor wording thing because he seemed to present this as though that's like the normal and good process of uh, reviews when I would say that the primary use of let's take Drinker as an example from what I gather from his audience is that they want to see him review most of the new and big things that come out just to know whether or not they should give it their time. Not whether or not necessarily to copy his opinion of the film. Like that, that's, I would um, assume that the point he was going on to make would be a, a nasty, mean, negative one. It's, it's the usual sort of brainwashing the sheeple type argument that yeah, people always make it. of the media. That you see it in newspapers all the time. It's that you only think the way you do because of the evil right-wing press. As opposed to the right-wing press actually just gives people what they want to, or what they already think because that's profitable because the audience already believes what they're hearing. Um, and they, usually if you hear someone say, well, you just take someone's opinions and parrot it as your own, it's a lead into saying, and that is why there's a whole brainwashed mass of the fan base that doesn't like, I don't know, TLJ or any given film which is sort of polarized its audience. Which I, I would mean, be... Well, will... That's an interesting example because that, that got great reviews from like, <laughs> like I'm pretty sure the Rotten Tomatoes score for that film is quite high. It was like the fan discussion, right, around that film that was way more polarized. Mm. I would be but willing that... to believe that this point was meant to be a joke, but he just had bad tone with it. Because okay. the way he, the, <laughs> with the diction, it could be seen as that. It's just the tone is off. Well, I'll roll and it I again. I thought that he was saying this is the normal and good process. ...experience with these things and can determine as well as articulate better why something is of value. Thus, we usually leave that power to someone else's hands before then copying their thoughts and making it our own opinion. But is that all a critic should be? To merely point others towards should the direction be. of what is good mm. and laugh at what is bad? Merely point to the direction of stuff that's good and laugh at what is bad. It's kind of a weird thing because in a sense, you could probably categorize everything a critic's even able to do as one of those two things, in a sense, very broadly. You're being reductive, yeah. Like, well, I, mean, I wouldn't even, if he wants to try and, if if I said either I'm praising something or I'm criticizing something, that's covered the vast majority of my statements. I'm trying to think of what ones wouldn't apply to that. I think he's, well, about, he's made a distinction between criticizing something and laughing at what is bad. There's a sort mm. of, like, implication that what negative critique is, is mockery or uh, condescension. Like, Which haha, is this valid sucks, and an art stuck. form. <laughs> Rather than, see. you know, like, that's all negative criticism can be or is, you know, because sometimes, well, like, often you can tell from it's the, like, well, um, this could be better, this could be better, yada, yada, I would like it to be better, you know, that sort of thing. As you would have gathered from the title already, uh, this, this video's got an issue with the negative side of criticism. They uh, always do. But, you know, it's, so we're, we're probably going to be fighting for that team, because it, it's always the underdog in these discussions, because it's so intuitive to be like, don't be negative, stop it. But in, in fairness, he said over-criticism, so. Also, mm -hmm. someone in chat just said, uh, Cinema Wins has just released his Puss in Boots The Last Wish video, so it <laughs> oh looks <my> like <laughs> that episode right. is back uh -oh. on the menu, boys. Here we go. Yeah. We got the Cinema Wins vs. Sins round two, that's going to be fun. Uh, we'll set that up, don't you worry. Could separating out the good from the bad be just one half of the story? Once separating the good from the bad is one half of the story. What would the other half be under speculation right now? So I do like that he said that rather than what he said before. Because before he said point to the good and laugh at the bad. Which if you're laughing at the bad, you're also pointing at the bad. Him specifically saying laugh at the bad seems very manipulative. Uh, saying that you're separating the good and the bad is... A much better way of phrasing criticism, although I think it's so, there's more to it than that. I'm going to signpost it's kind this. Of just this a rephrase, the... though, isn't it? I mean, you, all all he's saying is, well, yeah, pointing out the good and laugh at the bad is still just saying you're separating the good from the bad. I would assume the other half, the most important half, would be you're then going to on to explain why that separation is what it is. I was going to push what makes um, it good, what makes it bad. I was going to push even further than that. That's what I was going to say. I'm going to signpost this because we're probably going to end up talking about it several times as this video goes on, but. The nature of pointing out something is good, you've already pointed out something is bad, even if you don't realize it. Um, yes, yeah, that's why I'm like, why did he say right. laughing at what is bad? Because you're also pointing at what is bad as well when you do that. Yeah, when you, you when can you say, be. Um, just, well, to be super simplistic about it, you're like, you know what I loved about Ian McKellen's uh, performance is that he really captured this wise old man sort of thing in, in Gandalf. And you're like, oh, so you're saying that if he hadn't done that, it would have been either neutral or bad? 
And it's yeah. like, well, yeah, I guess so. If you'd if you'd played it super young and spry and, and idiotic, that might have been at odds with Gandalf's role in that world. So, sure, yeah, I've I've created a scale by praising something in a sense by an equal opposite. Exactly. You know, it can mean a lot of things, but you have you you can't have good without bad. We've gone over this before, and a lot of people seem to not appreciate it. Um, Every time you praise a thing for a connective tissue, you're automatically implying that a lack of connectivity would be a flaw or a neutral. This, you know, something has got to happen there. Inside of a more complicated coin, enter the mise-en-scene with Pixar's glorious film, Ratatouille. And look at him go with his herbs and his spices on the pot. Oh, Boo. wow. Mid, mid, <laughs> It looks Ooh, so it's so, rated. it's so good. Oh, a rat it's cooking so food? Oh, it's so good. Look at him go. Prepopesteresto. Right. I reject this premise. Uh, don't you get all of you worry you got to listen and watch that scene in full? For the EFAB fans, I just muted, so we're all good. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I gotcha. It's fair. In my view, Ratatouille presents an interesting case about criticism that peels back more layers on what makes a good critic and what should be their most honourable goal to aspire for. Um, Honesty? Before we let him uh, give his take, what would you guys say Ratatouille has to say about criticism of art? Whoa, mm. don't all talk at once. No, well, <laughs> I, I'm just pausing to think, you know, just getting my thoughts in order. There's a complexity um, to it, which is... That is the is... big message of the movie, and it spent a lot of time making sure the diction was correct. So we don't want to, you know, mess it up with our diction. That's my excuse. I will anyway. No, I just... Oh, my goodness. Here I go with my dick. Okay. Also, can I just say, I love his, uh, his skull typewriter. Skull typewriter? So yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> it's no Amenhotep, but it's pretty good. Like I can show the old EFAP people probably. There you go. Beautiful. Yeah. Yum. Let me see. I think that what it's really, or, or, or a big part of what it's trying to say is not just in addressing the people whose work is criticized, uh, criticized but to the people who do the criticism. Uh, not to get too, I guess, full of yourself. Not to think that you're necessarily better than the thing that you are criticizing that it takes a lot of you know work and effort to and there's a lot of uh, value in the things that are being criticized even if they're not all that good um and in a way i agree and in a way i disagree um i don't think that i i i don't criticism is a is an art form in and of itself it is a difficult task it's not something everyone can do in fact i think a lot of people do it very poorly I think to do criticism well, it does take a familiarity and a skill and the ability to be eloquent and to communicate well your ideas to people. And to be able to criticize well, it, it's just a skill set that not a lot of people really have. Um, and that shouldn't be undervalued. A good critic is of incredible value to the people around them and, you know, all of us. Um, just to follow on from that, I think uh, for the most part, the core of what the movie's saying about criticism, I agree with. But there's a couple things that Ego says at the very end uh, when he sort of summarizes, when he writes his review that changes everything at the end of the movie. Um, he says something to the effect that negative criticism doesn't risk anything, but like going out on a limb to defend something that you think is good that other people, that's new or original, like that's risky and you actually have to put something yeah. of yourself on the line. I don't agree with that. Neither I think, do I. I think a lot of people in this call have experienced the risk you take by criticizing things that everyone seems Absolutely. to love. Yeah, the, so that's the weird ears. thing about that statement is there's an obvious equal opposite. I don't know why when writing it they wouldn't have spotted that. Like, it's risky to say that something is good when it's untested and unfamiliar with an audience or whatever. It's like the implication you're giving is that the audience are automatically poised against it and that you have to stand up for it. And it's like, so what would the equal opposite be? To stand against something when everyone stands up for it, right? And it's like, yes. that would be a risky thing to do. And of course, Anton's whole reputation in this film is that he's basically an asshole to everybody. Like, uh, he can destroy everything with a flick of the pen sort of thing. In the same vein as the character in... Uh, 
Birdman, the myself Fringin Rags watched semi recently as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah and the Birdman chat. had similar things to say, a similar perspective, and I was expressing while we were watching that. that I think it's it would be nice to have a movie that would have a character that could push back on that sentiment because it's so widely accepted and it's kind of boring yeah. at this point. Like a Just critic never risks them. anything, and a critic isn't artistic. Um, meanwhile, the artist is, and it's like that's exactly. lame. Yeah, just to find the truth in the middle. I mean, it seems like, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but his problem is his ego, not that he's critical, you know, because clearly criticism and um, gatekeeping is how you get five star restaurants. You know, it's seen as something it's seen as a bad thing in the film that they've been demoted to three stars because clearly they deserve more. And it's like, well, criticism is how you credential places, you know. Well, let, let like, me see if well, can you change my mind on this or not, any of you here. Um, I might posit that there's nothing wrong with Anton's behavior throughout the whole film. Uh, which one's um, Anton? Is that the head chef? I no, would Anton Ego, uh, the, the critic. Ego. Oh, okay, yeah. I think I think I uh, um, I think that he has an attitude where he's being negatively biased towards Gusto's. I don't think there's anything well, wrong the, with that. The problem the movie. You don't think a negative bias is... No, I think that the negative biases can develop for good reason. The problem that the movie says that he has is that he's not... He, he doesn't believe uh, anything new is out there to experience. The, the big thing about his, uh, his final speech is that he is willing to admit that greatness can come from unexpected places. And he's not just talking about a rat cooking him food. Uh, he's talking about an unusual experience can take him to some place he didn't think of before. The Ratatouille brought him feelings of nostalgia that he hadn't contemplated in years, and that fascinated him, um, and that was part of it. And that's why he ends with saying he's going to return to Gusto's hungry, not just for the food. He, he just says hungry, but he's not just hungry for the food. He's hungry for a new experience. The problem the movie has with him is that he's not hungry for new experiences. Yeah, and and so the the problem then with with him is not necessarily that he's rendering judgments or that he's a critic. His problem is that he has a great deal of power, but he also has an immense amount of prejudice. And you combine the power and the prejudice, and the critic effectively starts ruling out the very prospect of of something good and new in the world because it, it's self fulfilling. You have the power; your words have the power to put everybody off. You can destroy a restaurant even if you. You know, you don't really give a damn about it. You might never try some of the dishes they have on offer, but you have the power to shut them down because you've already convinced yourself that you're right. And so in that sense, he's failing as a critic. So it's not that he's a critic that makes him bad. It's just that he's not doing it see, well. See, I disagree because I feel like he did everything correctly. He did have a huge negative bias, and yet he still gave them a chance, and he liked the food so much he praised it before he even knew who cooked it, and after he knew, he still praised it. Uh, I wonder if there's a relating to his attitudes towards chef gusto and the anyone can cook idea if he was repulsed by that idea that idea and that gave him uh, a negative bias that wasn't fair yeah but i don't th but this is kind of what i'm getting at i have a negative bias and i assume most people here do to the next thing that disney put out in relation to marvel or star wars but we still give it the chance and then we'll praise it if it's good which has been evident by things in the past like andor um I feel like that's kind of what he's doing. He's presented as very uh, cruel and dark and spooky and sharp, but like I don't really take that much of an and issue arrogant. with much of his actions. But part of but it you is still but you still acknowledge that Disney could do something good. As does he. No, that that's what I'm saying. He wasn't willing to acknowledge that something new and good could come to him. When he when he goes up well, against uh Linguini, yeah. he was very overly pompous about surprise me, you won't. Um, I'm not sure I'm, how I feel about I'm, that necessarily, because if, for example, I could be caught saying something like that about Filoni, <laughs> but I'll still give his work at Chad's every time, assuming it's you know, there's there's decent reason to I'm not I wouldn't be doing it if he like made a thousand TV shows. I'd be like, okay, I'm not fucking watching all them. Um the the, the hyper-negative bias and the closing off from new experiences, I can't quite buy it because he does engage in a new experience and then he does praise it. Like, it's... I feel like it's hard to maintain that that's his attitude when we clearly see him not do that. Actions yeah. speak louder than words is what you're saying. Yes. 
Yeah, because it's not like he pretends to have hated it just so he can save his reputation or anything like that, you know. But uh, the one thing I will say is that he does have an air of, like, my word is gospel. I am the king critic. I am the one who decides who is good and who's bad in this town. My opinion is the one yeah, that like, matters. I guess I'm, I'm not saying like he's perfect uh, or, or even good. I'm putting him more so in neutral and that there's some things, some attitudes. I'd be like, you could use a little bit of work on that. But, I mean, whatever. It's A lot of people have these attitudes about different things. He is valued as one of the greatest critics of all time, more than likely because... I'm saying this almost, I feel, in opposite to what the film has to say, that he's very good at his job in the sense of, like, an artist. Like, mm -hmm. he knows he's exactly how to best express his own perspectives while also combining his knowledge of how food is made and how it's supposed to taste, or at least uh, something that a lot of people can empathize with in terms of taste. And, like, this is not something that's arbitrary or um, superfluous. He's, he's, he's really worked at it. And then he puts that standard to the test of a place where he believes it would never you know, reach a high level, but it does, and he acknowledges that, like, it, you know, it's um, interesting. I know what you, I can see what you mean, I think that the, I, the, at least the takeaway that I got from him is that I think that there is a general attitude about food that is in opposition to how Gusto felt about food and where it can come from, and that sort of paints him in a kind of uh, that sort of sets him up, I think, unfairly to do things. So I think his I think, the um, actions. What? I'd say the attitude of the film overall is very, very, very pro creativity as yes. a uh, as a thing. Yeah. It's throughout the film, like the advocacy for the creation of the new new experiences. Um, and 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 it's 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 part of Anton's speech, right, when he says that the critic puts themselves out there for judgment in defense of the new. It's like the critic is valuable in the lens of um, enabling new creation. I think that's like that's one of the statements of the film in terms of the purpose and, and value of criticism. It's just kind um, of one sided, though. Well, it's a shame uh, because yeah. it it doesn't sure. seem to acknowledge yeah. the creative aspect of criticism. I yeah, but that's it's kind of a not many things do. That's the that's, <laughs> like, that's kind of yeah. yeah. I, I kind yeah. of agree. Not many things do. There, there's not an added. Because, you know, he points out, right, like, oh, you know, because uh, it's, it's it's interesting. The, the part of the speech that is often much more remembered is is the that the, the uh, average piece of junk is, like, more valuable than the review designating it so. Uh, and then they forget about the second part, about the, the, the it's more positive. Um, but, like, <laughs> it's, it's kind of interesting because... Um, it doesn't really address the fact that people, I mean, that's said and people agree with that, but people still like and value, like, criticism, including negative criticism. Yeah. Um, like, sure. they well, yeah, are, you, are you highlighting, like, something that they consume and enjoy assume... uh, as, like, a creation in and of itself, right? Yeah, like, like when, Anton's when in his position that... because of everyone else. They see his work and they're like, yeah. this is good well, shit and I mean, relatable or understandable. and. Say... What does it mean to say that the review, the review is fun to write and to read? It's like, so it's it entertaining, it's enjoyable, it's interesting, it is consumed for to create some experience in the person who's reading it. Well, yeah, like, and like, that's, uh, you know, that's, that, that's what art does, yeah. <laughs> I'm not even kidding, that line from Homer was a relatively artistic expression saying that um, the soup is almost as bad as like the acting and not when anywhere near as hammy or whatever. Like, it's, it's like, ah, oh. you can read these things and be like, huh. You, you, you can be amused, you can be invested, you can be made angry because you love the restaurant or whatever. It's like, it's obviously an artistic expression happening uh, from a critic to a, a reader. But I think because of the fact that critics can be seen as like vultures or at least reliant on something else to exist, that uh, they're, they're like, you know, it's a very common sentiment to sort of downtrodden them. And uh, the film... I, it's also one of, one of the only art forms, because I'd agree with you that criticism is itself an art form, but it is one of the, the few art forms which does actually rest on, uh, well, a, at least a judgment of other art forms, in, this, in the way that you can paint a painting with no real reference and no commentary on any painting or any work of fiction or anything that anyone else has created around you. By nature, a critic is commenting upon something somebody else has done it's kind of so yeah obviously if it goes to a negative criticism then it's intrinsically an attack in a way that many art forms don't replicate like literature can do it as well you do get sort of literary inserts and even film does it when uh is it the godzilla film where roger ebert's name is given to the the fat lecherous mayor the incompetent oh guy. yeah so uh siskel and ebert in that itself. film yeah yeah 
like like, like critic, as parodies, criticism yeah. is the one that has to do that as opposed to it being completely volitional i, I assume that, that really nobody quick. here disagrees with uh re review and critique being art right we all agree that that's it's artistic to review to critique i yeah, would agree yep yeah. Yep. I just want to point out James Moore, who who said in the chat that the irony is that the dish that that won him over isn't a new dish at all. It wasn't anything new or invented or innovative. It was an old dish that reminded him of his childhood, which is kind of an interesting mm. tension. That's what, the, what the movie shtick, concludes. Wasn't his shtick, it. Like, he rejected the idea that anybody can cook. So it's not necessarily that he's looking for a new art form. He's rejecting initially that anyone is capable of producing even old art forms. And then by no, the end the of the film, his arc makes, is essentially realizing that that's not so. The movie sort of makes a point to to say that in defense of the new and innovative. and like, Yeah. It's kind of the writer's... Which comes in with the rat having, having cooked the food. But well, him that's, loving that's the food. Part of the, that's, yeah. that's part of the reason why I like lump it in with luck. Because like, why why did Remy make Ratatouille? Like They, they don't ever say why he made it. And I, I would have liked it if he like knew that ego came from an old place or something. And I'm like, um, I, well, so it's, it's what was pointed out, right? It's a peasant's dish. It's like, it's kind of, it feels poetic, right? That the rat would take something that is considered a low, a, a relatively lowly kind of dish and then create something that's like yeah, beautiful it's, there. It's and almost then it's like, not the and then it's reflected. Yeah, Remy's goal there is to be like, we're going to make the best food he's ever tasted, and I'm going to make it from one of the like least exactly. expected places, yeah. least expected dishes. Exactly. Yeah, because you then, don't want to give it... somebody like Anton a dish that's like flashy in any way, right? Because like he'll immediately be like, oh, you're trying to impress me. I would assume the way that, that it looks, I don't remember right? Remy ever saying that. Well, I, I just remember Remy just I, making the dish. I, I don't. I don't need him to say it. Like I can understand yeah, he, why he, he presents the story. book, and then she points yeah. that out, and then he smiles. It's it, like it's, 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 I, I think the film wants says, us oh, to pick yeah, that will up. Be perfect. Yeah, he yeah, senses. Exactly. And, and, and how unexpected is that? That you serve this highly feared uh, critic a, 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 a like a straightforward, simple peasant's dish. What if someone? And what if he served like the... fried chicken from America? Well, that's... and it worked because oh, it was something it was different. An, as I was, was saying, American in, film, in... and they did that. It would serve a similar point. Yeah, yeah. in the menu. Like no, the, the... It, in this film, what if it, it because it was different and it was fried chicken and he liked it, but he didn't expect it. Oh, do you mean like because of the fact that he it wouldn't have worked as well because he didn't have like a childhood memory of. I'm, yeah, I'm saying, like, like Re Remy, and... Remy had, uh, we assume Remy has this idea that he's, that he's gonna, that he's gonna do. The movie doesn't tell us. We assume that he has this idea, and then in the movie, the idea works. And so we have to say, well, wow, Remy's idea that we assume he had worked. We could do that if we replaced Ratatouille with fried chicken. We could say, well, it was something different from a country he'd never been to. He was expecting something new. Like, we are interjecting. I mean, the reason we, that also, they had. have a character say that explicitly it is a peasant's dish why do you think they had her say that and then he smiled yeah she also... could have said it's an american dish she could have it, and it, i would have told well, you that that would be the reason at that point i don't it, it to me it doesn't connect accurately as to so you it, think it, it was in like the random movie. that she said it or no i don't think it's random i think uh i think ego has a past that allows him to like this dish Remy yeah, didn't know that. So, well, so the thing is, is that it's it's Ratatouille. So, it, like, he's in France. It's a common, like, it's a common, like, it's it's not like an abnormal, crazy kind of meal that could be made. I could imagine that if he made another common dish in France, that there could have been another childhood experience that Anton had that that could have tapped into as well. Like, it's not like Ratatouille would be the only thing that could have done it. It could have been something else. I, I like. I'm not sure what the. I'm not sure what the criticism is. <laughs> like, I'm a little bit lost. Yeah, and also this also ties back into the who who was the uh, the chef chick Tato was. What was her name? Uh, I forget her name, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, but uh, one of the first things that she tells to uh, Linguini and by extension, essentially Remy, about how to cook, is you can't be like mommy when you're in the kitchen. You have to be you know, expeditious in a way. You, you've got to be quick. You have to be efficient. You can't cook it like mom used to cook. But that's what yeah, they that, do. That's foreshadowing, yeah. That's foreshadowing, yeah. yeah. That, yeah. That's foreshadowing, yeah, but it doesn't go to Remy's No, no, reason. yeah. It, 
No, no it, it, I think a lot of it actually kind of does because it shows that there is this care and this sort of craftsmanship that's very... Um, yeah, Remy sees it as like an artwork, obviously. Hal is Halcyonic a, a word? But uh, it's... Um, but I, I do think that's relevant, actually. It is relevant. I'm, it foreshadows to the audience the direction that Remy is supposed to be going. Remy doesn't take note of this, though, within oh, the context of his Sorry. character. I don't, well, gives you I don't even think that he would have needed to have heard that from her when we presented Remy, unlike several chefs and many artists in the industry, this would be more so a point made in the menu, I would argue, uh, lost the reason for making the, the stuff in the first place, see it as an art form, take care, much like a mother might for their child. Like the, I'm pretty sure that's the aspect that they're saying reached Anton. It's not necessarily that it was even Ratatouille, the meal itself. Yeah, Remy's not about being efficient and expeditious. He's about being creative and passionate. I also don't think that the movie is suggesting that if it were any other dish that didn't happen to trigger one of Anton's memories, that he wouldn't have liked it and given it a good review. Yeah, yeah I, I don't think so either. I think it could have, it could have, it may well have been that it was Ratatouille, like it could have been something else, and then it still triggered that memory because it reminds him of that experience. Like, yeah, it's a, I, it's it's a food made with extreme really care and artistic yeah. integrity. That's what his praise of it is. I don't think it relies on the luck of having guessed the exact dish. No, I don't think it, so. No, it's, like I said, it doesn't matter about the dish. It was Remy's reasoning that I don't think the film presents well. I think the, the film expects you to understand without Remy going through the process of understanding. I think that... Yeah, that seems like, like a nice seeing bit how of the subtlety, whole, not a criticism to me. Yeah, like, when you watch how the whole film plays out, and then Remy, the rat, decides to cook Ratatouille for the, uh, for the, the feared, revered uh, critic to present something that is considered simple and um, not, like, this luxurious thing. Like, that, that, there's so much there that lines up um, in terms of, like, a rationale that I don't need him to explain. Like it, it just follows. Oh, I prefer he doesn't. I don't explain need it. him to explain it. I need him to go through the process of figuring it out in the movie. The information was given to you. If you I don't understand. When up, when did you think he yeah. didn't make food that way? The information was given to me. Yes, I figured it out. I needed Remy Good, to figure it. it out. When, he was did. also in wait, wait, the stop. Room when when, when did when dead. when did Remy not do it? When did when when in the film did Remy make food in a non-creative, spiritual, integral way? Not that he made food in a spiritual, not a blah, 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 blah way. It's that he knew that's what Ego wanted. That's not what happened. It's not that he chose the perfect dish by luck. Okay. It's the way that it's, Remy it's cooks. Specifically, we're going through the cards of the recipe box. It's not, yeah. Okay. The, the, he chose, Ratatouille has a, a meaning beyond uh, Remy and Anton in terms of what the film's getting at. But Anton, as we've said, his results with the food is all because of the way Remy cooks, not because it was Ratatouille yeah. specifically. I think from the beginning of the movie, it's set up that Remy is incredibly intuitive with food, what goes with what. And then I think he can look at a person like Anton and decide, and like, you know what? I, he's the type of guy where I'm going to give him a simple dish done incredibly well. I feel like he would really appreciate that. And I don't need a line of dialogue remy making that explicit like it just it makes sense to me that he would just come to that conclusion you know and you get a little bit of like what's her name colette yeah she says like it's a peasant dish are you sure you want to do this really and he and he, remy it's, nods um, He's like yes yeah it's arguably like, a proof that what's smile. important is the creativity and care you put into creation of food it doesn't matter whether not or not it's, of whether it's um, a peasant's dish yeah, whether or not it's a hamburger or a ile croise balayant que souffrant, like it doesn't matter if it's, it's that yeah, or that. It's all those perceptions that are trying to be breached. With you know, when you think about again the notion of anybody can cook, trying to get past those preconceptions to get to like a more fundamental thing, which is the experience that it provides the person. Okay, uh, I I think we should just move on because I'm just not like agreeing. It's just clear, like it's it's kind of clear. I don't know, man. No, I hear what you guys are saying, and I agree that's what the movie is saying. I'm not saying the movie isn't saying that. I'm not saying that conclusion isn't bad. I'm saying I just wanted a process of Remy figuring that out. He had that figured out from because the get-go. It gives, well, his not he learned. it gives his character uh, a reason to make Ratatouille specifically, or any peasant dish. It doesn't have to be Ratatouille. It just gives his character the reason 
what's to do what thing, he did. What's the first thing he cooks in the whole movie? That uh, mushroom on a stick, if I can remember. Yeah, it's just it's just mushroom on a stick with like a bit of cheese. He just wanted to put some saffron on it, and he was just excited to make this little thing with some uh, cheese and mushroom. Yeah, the, as humble as that was. Yeah, the point being that the like, same uh, context of creation is what he used for Anton's final meal as well. So you're saying that Remy's specific uh, passion, his his specific passion, is what Antoine liked. Uh, it, for what it created, yeah. He liked the food, yeah. It tasted good. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the whole point of the movie, right? That you never expect a rat to be one of the greatest chefs of all time, but Remy's uh, sort of investment in cooking and cookery as an art form is what led to great works of cooking. And he also yeah. liked it before he knew any any of those other details. It's just this tastes I, really good. I agree. I agree with that. I it doesn't address my issue, but I agree okay, with that. Can I ask you a question? Saying. What would you have liked to have seen? Like what? What I would have he, liked Remy to have said, oh, this, one dialogue would have changed this for me. I would have liked Remy to have said, uh, when, Aunt, when he found out that uh, da, 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 Gusto died, just said, saying something like, oh, this guy, he's from such and such village, and he's acting like he's all high and mighty, or just something that acknowledges that Remy knows that this guy can have, can appreciate simple pleasures. He doesn't. Uh, he doesn't know anything about Anton. He's just going to try his best. I, I know. In the way the film is currently written, he doesn't know anything about Anton. He's just trying his best, and it works. Anton, that's what yeah. I'm saying. He assumes Anton grew up in France. He's using his creativity and his inspiration to try and make something that he thinks. I would, like. would go further than that. I think that the idea of like hyper looking into like that that the, there would be even more and more reading into anton's past to almost like try to figure out the optimal strength you know what i mean like it, it seems like i know kind what of i mean yeah i think it would be a fundamental process well, yeah, of, like like, like, like i said i think the point is that he doesn't know anything about right. anton that's important exactly that, that helps uh, uh, okay so just to move away from ratatouille let's say i don't know i was doing a guest video on one of y'all's channels if uh, I could just do what I like and maybe your audience will like it, you know, maybe they will. Or I might know your audience and make something that they will like. I, th I believe a big part of uh, knowing your audience is a big part of uh, creating art. You, it doesn't I have to go full that, that direction. But, um, I think, I think that, will, that will be to convey a very different message than the one the film is trying to get across. So from what I understand of it, the film is trying to get across the importance of art for art's sake, creation for creation's sake. It's not, yes. am I doing something Give to please a specific, specific yes. person? Yes, is, it is. Is there value yes, in it art is. for its own sake? Yes, it is. And I don't necessarily have a problem with that. It's just in context of the story, it makes it more luck-based. That's all I'm saying. I thought we already kind of established that it wasn't luck that he liked this dish is that it was well made. You know, he just picked a dish that he thought would be appropriate to serve him and he made it well. So therefore it was good and he liked it. I don't think it requires any sort of luck that he happened to like Ratatouille. If I make a video that I am passionate about and I give it to the wrong person, they're not necessarily going to like it no matter how much passion I put into it. If you created a really good video, but that was completely out of left field compared to your usual, and then your audience adored it because of how good the video was, that would be closer to what Ratatouille is trying to say. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? If your audience was used to, let's say, videos exclusively on Minecraft, and then you make a huge breakdown of Game of Thrones, and they're like, they adore it, your channel, like, it, it's, it blasts up, and then someone says, like, well... You know, that, that that wasn't exactly wise. You didn't know what your audience was going to like that based on Minecraft. It's like, well, yeah, but it was, a, and it was an excellent video. That That's what the equivalent would be in that scenario. I don't I want to prolong this argument if people would rather move on, but I, I would like to add something here that I think would help. Like, after I had said what I'd said earlier, somebody in the chat said, uh, what was the scene where uh, Remy analyzed... Anton and obviously there isn't a scene where they directly interact at least not until the very end where uh, the mouse or the rat gets revealed to Anton but there is a scene uh, where um, what's his name Laguini he's having there's like a publicity event he's getting pictures taken of him and that's when um, Anton walks in 
and they have this confrontation with with each other. Mm-hmm. And Remy is, I think, underneath Linguini's hat, which is just like on a table next to them. Mm-hmm. And there's a shot dedicated to Remy sort of looking back and forth between the two of them, almost almost like it's a tennis match, you know, where he's kind of, I think in that moment, he's sizing up Anton. And in that scene, Anton has a line where he says, uh, uh, Linguini comes back with a cheeky line towards Anton. And Anton says, I don't like food. I love it. And I think that little beat there is enough for Remy to go, okay, this guy loves food. I believe what he says right now. I believe his conviction. And so based on that, I can understand when he finally cooks the ratatouille dish. It's like, I'm going to give this guy a simple dish done excellently. That's Another way you could read it just following on from what you're saying is that everyone's been talking about this guy nonstop, like leading up to the final moment where he makes the ratatouille everyone's been talking about him like he's a big scary elitist movie uh not movie uh food critic guy and so you know, his name is ego and everything he all he holds himself in very high regard so he's like oh okay he thinks he's all that i'll give him something very very simple you know there's something kind of poetic about that you know like right it, it could be that simple we just he doesn't say it out loud but it's totally reasonable to infer legitimate non-luck based motivations for why he chose ratatouille and it worked i just wanted to mention that scene because that there is a shot dedicated to i think remy really taking a moment to look to study anton like and just figure out what it is that makes him tick you know i could accept that that scene means that i think it's a bit of a reach but i can accept it like uh, and uh, in all honesty, like I, I kind of just want to move on from the subject, but like sure. that that's one of my big nitpicks of the film. Just just so you guys know. All right, then. Um, if right. if if I can touch on like because your initial point, Mahler, when you paused was uh, what what do we like that uh, that Ratatouille says about criticism? And I, I like the film's depiction of criticism the idea that critique is a sword uh, that cuts both ways and like any weapon needs to be wielded carefully. And Anton does that. And despite his care in wielding that sword, he cuts himself terribly. I mean, he loses his job at the end. Um, But it's in service of trying to bring the truth to people that this was an excellent dish and this is a guy that I think, if he's guilty of anything, I think he's become overly cynical because he's been bombarded by shit food constantly. <laughs> and there's a part of him that's, I mean, he's dead inside, right? That's like a lot of the imagery in the movie is suggesting that. The guy looks like Dracula. He's in like a coffin-shaped office. Oh, yeah, right? he's like death. But, yeah. But I think uh, the film would never deny it. I, th- I think that when, you know, when Anton says, I love food, I don't think that the film wants you to think he's lying. Like, he does love food. Oh, yeah, yeah, he, I agree. He definitely loves it. It's, it's not that there's, there's something else that's kind of gone wrong uh, somewhere else, that, you know, something to do with his ego, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> how'd, how'd you figure I, it I, out? I love, I love the end when he's, uh, like, when the, uh, Remy's revealed. And th- you can tell, like, looking at Anton, he, he's horrified by what he's seeing. Like, the, the mice in the kitchen, I mean, he's, I think he's genuinely appalled by it. But like a proper critic should, he is unflinchingly oh, yeah, assessing that's definitely the, the situation. Like, the, yeah. he, Anton's done the above and beyond here and, and basically said, your, your art is so good that I'm going to put aside the fact that you're a rat for a second. Because yes. uh, that's tough. Uh, I, I, it's something that we were talking about when we watched the film, but I really appreciate the uh, the chefs leaving. Because what the fuck? A guy holds up a rat yeah. and says, he's my cook. It's like, okay. But first of <laughs> all, I don't that's... believe you. But secondly, thanks for just not treating this seriously at all. Thanks for ruining our careers. Even, yeah, even if you that... did believe him, like that's a huge insult to say you were taking all your ideas from something else. Like No matter what, those chefs definitely should have walked out. That That was just an insulting thing to do. Well, yeah. they, and they certainly didn't. He didn't do a good job of explaining absolutely anything as well. Like, uh, I don't. That's what I'm saying. It felt like a real scene as opposed to a more wholesome, happy scene where things work out. 
And that I, is... Yeah, I, lo I love that beat where all the chefs leave. And it's so, like, against convention. Yeah, that's what a, picks a, a, lesser, back in the day, a, a less you know? A lesser screenwriter would be like, all the chefs are immediately on board, right? And it's like, let's mm. all work together. But no, they, they behave accurately to the fact that the mice are in the kitchen. It's disgusting. And the chefs are just like, no, I'm yeah. sorry. I, I love the sous chef who's just like about to cry. <laughs> and he hangs up his apron like, I'm sorry, dude, I can't do this. No, like, I, I love that. That's I don't want to go to prison again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Your goal to aspire for, and that is to discover and defend the new. This is different to just simply separating out the good from the bad because it's about finding something that's new and unorthodox and recommending it to others despite where it comes from. I think I'd probably mm. boil it down to an even more fundamental. It's just procreativity, like procreation. Um, the thing is, this I'm should necessarily... You don't normally talk about procreation. That's really, uh, yeah, it's, well, it's really yeah, good. Yeah, You're really yeah. evolving as a character. Yeah, this should anyway, necessarily be included under the umbrella of separating the bad from the good. I uh, will... <laughs> yeah, I, I guess it's um because now I'm guessing that the point of the video is going to be mainly about motive. Um, because it's like because he's now saying that like it's not just about pointing to something saying good, pointing to something saying bad. It's about finding the new, and it's like oh well, I was I, I thought we were already doing that when you point out good, bad, good, bad, good. But like that includes new, old, what you know. In this equivalent state, it would be like I was watching the new Marvel movie, I was watching the new Star Wars movie. It's like have you watched that new movie shot on? that guy's phone who is 10 years old and it's like obviously fucking not and then this film could be like well i mean you know and then you know is it maybe and, and it's up to critics out there to maybe find out about those sorts of things and it's like well within reason but also i feel like they're doing that anyway um and i feel like that's best represented in a way and maybe that's intentional by anton being that he believes nothing is going to be coming out of this restaurant but he tried it and then he was like holy shit it was you know, like, um, those are the good forms, and, and it's like, so that's on good form, but, um, yeah, I feel like pointing out good and bad is a byproduct of doing this anyway, because I think all of us have recommended something that everyone else has been like, what even is that? And it's like, yeah, I know, and more people should know about it. To, Which kind uh, of stems from a willingness for people to express their perspective, both positive and negative on things, to enable that to happen. Um, yeah, because uh, I was about to say, what's, I always think about equal opposites, and I'm like, what about going out there to find very specific and niche bad things? <laughs> like, is that considered a good or bad action on its own? I don't know. What if someone is uh, horrifically uncreative in a way that nobody saw? Is that worth mentioning or using as part of a scale? I don't know. What defines a niche bad thing? Is it something good that you might think is bad, or is it a bad thing that people just haven't discovered? I kind of, that's kind of where I was going with that. So the way he's saying, like, nobody would take this seriously and maybe haven't seen it. Maybe the movie equivalent is, like I said, that 10-year-old on an iPhone. Uh, but it turns out he made, like, an amazing film. Let's say he made, like, the Blair Witch Project back then in that manner. Um, and it's like, no, I'm going to defend it. I'm going to stand in front of everyone saying this 10-year-old couldn't have made a good film. He's like, no, he did. And, you know, you need to check it out, that sort of thing. But equal opposites, is it ever worthwhile to find something horrifically bad that no one cares about or saw to maybe have it be a point of, like, comparison i don't know because it, i'm trying to figure out whether or not it is a lopsided affair that there is times where just being uh, critical uh rather than praiseworthy is just something you shouldn't do because it always seems to be a fundamental point of view in these kinds of videos well there there are uh i've seen critics on youtube who will find very not known uh, shows or cartoons and there'll be bad ones and they'll mm -hmm. talk about them just as an example of what not to do in cartoon well usually just to bring some diversity to their channel but it acts as an example of what not to do in shows in general because um i think we're all aware uh, of certain channels that will play like the newly listed steam games that are made by like one guy in 10 minutes and be like look how fucking awful this is and if someone said, like, well, you're just being overly critical, it's like, well, there's value to that. There's, they're creating art using what is essentially what they would say is a complete lack of creativity. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, um, the, the thing itself, the quote-unquote artwork was made with no soul, maybe flipping assets and just done for money. Meanwhile, the criticism that's made from that as a platform or a vehicle is creative, does have integrity, and you're trying to learn and create scales and, you know, praise things by comparison. And so, in a sense, in that uh, environment, the more creative person... I would assume would actually be the critic. 
And there's the, the corroded point as well, which I think probably would go back to the point and purpose of criticism is that if you don't even need necessarily to be using this thing sincerely as a point of, say, textual criticism, literary criticism, take something like Velma, for example, which everyone knows is god awful and mm -hmm. you only have to watch five minutes of it to know how god awful that show is. But you can actually make a lot more people laugh. You can actually bring a lot more entertainment to the world than Velma itself does. Simp Hello? It's criticism. Hello? Hi. Hey, hey there. He disappeared for a second. Oh, okay. oh well, I'm back. Uh -oh. He's saying how much Did he I loves disappear? Velma. The last word I yeah, heard Val from Velma's Little fantastic. Platoon was Velma's simp. Good shit. <laughs> Velma, you, you <laughs> literally <laughs> cut out halfway through simple, and all I heard was simp. <laughs> oh, shit. He's a simp for Velma. <laughs> simping, <laughs> simping for Velma. Oh, good. Simp, um, yeah. No, I, I, was saying, I was saying that you can bring a lot more Defense joy and entertainment to the world. That's what he said. I... Yeah. By criticizing Velma, uh, then Velma itself is done. And I think I would still class that as criticism. So you don't even need to be textually breaking it down as a sincere act of art criticism. An extension of criticism is also creating art out of the terrible. And ripping on Velma probably qualifies as that. Yeah, and I actually feel like that is a uh, lesser understood point of view and that it's become more and more, uh, it's, it's easier to understand as time goes on because holy shit, like YouTube is filled with some of the greatest videos that are uh, primarily criticism, but also like super artistic and like entertaining, comedic, or tell stories. You know, um, when you tell a story, I assume people in the same vein as Ratatouille would be like, that is an art form. And it's like, well, what if that is told with the purpose of being critical of another story? What does that mean? What happens then? Because technically Ratatouille mm. as a film is critical of points of view, is it not? It is. I mean, yeah, yes. of course. I think so. so. Absolutely. And, and therefore, yeah. of course, uh, one could qualify it as criticism, but would obviously call it art first, or rather creative expression in the form of animation. Well, and you know, what about uh, parodies that are definitely making fun of specific conventions or tropes, or even like very specific films? Well, and that's the funny sure. thing. Uh, if we had category one being artistic expression in the form of media versus uh, criticism, there, there, there's like a strict line between it. If you were forced to put these categories, like one of these things on a category. It's like, Ratatouille is like, well, of course it wouldn't go to criticism. Parody, it's like, that probably, I think most people would, if they had to force between those two categories, they'd put it in art before criticism. Even though it would absolutely qualify as both. However, a review, like a written review of a film or a, you know, a restaurant or whatever, people would be like, well, it's criticism, obviously. Right. I feel like uh, people don't appreciate the blurry line is actually super important in terms of uh, how we categorize this stuff. I well, I think... I like, oh. Go ahead. I I don't really I don't really see it so much as a line as much as criticism is a form of art. It's inside that category. Oh, I, I, that's like actually what I'm trying to get that. at is that I believe that what you've just said, but I feel like society as a whole believes not that that the art and criticism is a distinct line between it, and that's part of why I don't quite agree with Ratatouille as a film, is that its final sentiment seems to place criticism as a lowly sort of profession that attaches itself to art, which is um. I just, I just feel like it. La if there was a Ratatouille two, perhaps that film could then challenge that perspective <laughs> and expand on it. I don't, I don't believe it's a, it's an unfair point of view to come to. I just feel like there's, there's pieces there that are missing. Yeah, it's one sided, and I feel like what he's espousing, the creator of this video right now, is a sort of bias towards uh, like the novel and original and new. In terms of creative expression, I feel like the other side of this coin, if you were to take a balanced view, would be to defend or to um, point out the value in praising things that aren't exactly new. They're you know, but they're well executed. So stories that fall into very specific genres and tropes that we've seen before, and people might go, "Oh, there's nothing new or, orig or original there." Meanwhile, you could watch it and be like, "Oh, this is actually yeah. really good, and it's worth defending." An example of this I feel would be relevant, would be for Jay Ballman to learn from Ratatouille that just because mm. Todd Phillips made Joker does not mean yeah. Joker is not a real film. <laughs> it's uh, Very true. It's like, don't be so harsh as to judge it just because it's the guy who made Hangover, so it's not going to be good. Which is weird, by the way, because Hangover is pretty solid. Hangover is a good movie. Yeah. It is pretty solid. Uh, when it came out, everybody was fucking good. talking about that movie. It wouldn't shut up about Hangover when that movie came out. Jeez. Everyone Did was talking about it. Did Jay say that about Joker? Like he just oh, dismisses yeah. that movie? Uh, I think it was even worse Phillips than that. Did? I think he said Todd Phillips is not a real filmmaker. 
Yeah, I mean, oh that's the God. infamously I, I... <laughs> bad takes from Jay regarding uh, regarding Joker. Yeah, I like Jay, but that's a rough one. Too. <laughs> they got some. Uh, the the Red Letter Media guys have some interesting opinions. Yeah. And what it accomplishes. And Ratatouille does this by contrasting two important characters whose personalities and dynamic explain why this goal is central to being a good critic on top of making the film so much more enjoyable to- So, uh, just another thing sort of for the sake of conversation, what makes a good critic, uh, I, I mean, I would let everyone- Well, fuck it, I'll go first with this one, just like, as far as I'm concerned, go integrity, it, and that's about it. Just, when you say integrity, uh, what do you mean? Uh, you know, honest reflections of your interpretations of the thing that you're dealing with. Like, stick to what you believe to be true and be honest. Uh, I would, uh, I would say that in combination with being accurate about uh, what it actually is you're doing. I think those are like the the big two, the winning combination there. Um, if I you would... have integrity and you're accurate, uh, that that think yeah, you can't really go wrong. And skilled would... at communication. Like obviously, right? You know. Oh yeah. Like, uh, this oh yeah. Where, like the, so the other skills necessary. If you think of it as, yeah, as a tree, yeah. I was trying to go for like what is right at the, the core. Foundation. Yeah. yeah. And then because it'll it'll go all the way up to like maybe roots. one of the distant parts of the branches is like make sure you actually check out things that are different from what you typically check out. And it's like, is that necessary? It's like, um, no. I guess if someone someone could exclusively watch Marvel and Star Wars, and that is absolutely it, and still be what I could consider an excellent critic. It's just that, you know, maybe they should, for the sake of <laughs> expanding, just yeah. check out some other stuff. I would argue the bare, the extremely bare basics of the subject of what you're talking about. So, for example, if you review movies, uh, you should know what a plot is and what a protagonist is. Um, I don't yeah, even think um, you need to. Plus what y'all said, I, the, the integrity well, and honesty, plus that. You know, like, um, if you take a guy who's never seen a film before, in fact, never even known what a story is, you sit him down and have him watch the Lord of the Rings trilogy, is is it possible for him to be a good critic at that point? When he reviews it, so to speak. I think yes. I think yes as well. I don't think you need to know about, like, what... Like, for instance, um, you don't have to know necessarily what themes even really are. You don't have to know what a protagonist is, or an antagonist, or um, and anything like that. I Obviously, think... it, it helps, and those are important things, and they can help you to understand what it is that you're watching and consuming, but I don't think you need it. Um, I think if so... you have those baselines, you could come up with a very interesting, accurate, and helpful perspective on a piece of media. Several people in chat have said, no, he cannot be a good critic. Interesting. I it would make it I was... exponentially harder, uh, given... It would be more I, difficult. I wouldn't say it's impossible, but like, so if it's taking... I don't even know if it would make it harder. Of... I think um, it would. I mean, to be taking the extreme example of someone who's never seen or read any story ever, and you sit them down in front of the Lord of the Rings, a lot of criticism, I think, does rest on comparison. Like, you have to know, or you have to have seen examples of something that is good and something right. that is bad to make your own opinion of what is good and bad a bit more nuanced. Like, to understand what the writer is going for, what message they're trying to convey, whether or not the plot actually hangs together, are there better ways of conveying the same story that have been done elsewhere? Like, all I of think this a lot of that stuff you don't need you, comparisons to do. These are all it options, I think, for them, an assessment, but you could stick strictly to just a 10-minute review of the Lord of the Rings trilogy talking about how you think that the film's broader points were about like unifying to defeat the greater evil, that um, you know, redemption and sacrifice are important, and that they, the, this person, this theoretical person who's only seen Lord of the Rings, could reference life, and that's it. They don't need to have seen other films. Mm -hmm. So here's my question then. Well, life would be a uh, a, a reference, but here's my question then. Uh, if if you have said person, how can their opinion be objective if they have no standard? Why wouldn't they have a standard? Well, if they have no reference, you can have a standard. Um, if you just watch a movie, you could your first ever movie you watch, you'll judge it. Yep. Based on what? How much you liked it? Sure, that's what, one what, standard. What are they judging it by? It, it could be. Could be that. It could your be the say say they're watching your um, knowledge of how physics and causality work in the real world. Yeah, that would be yeah. the. I think that's the primary way all of us judge stories. So would would you, knowing that, uh, accept that review? Yes. Accept it? What do you mean accept? Because I'd say yes, like, unless you have a strange way of saying accept. What do you mean? You would consider it a good review. 
Potentially, yeah. it depends on the review. Yeah, it, potentially. If it's a good review, I, then I, I, I would, would consider yeah. it an uninformed review, which to me, I tend to lump in with a bad review. Uh, well, Just so it's all within scope because if his only things that he said was what he thought the meaning behind each of the arcs or the characters or the themes were, and I thought that he actually had them nailed, I wouldn't consider it an uninformed review at that point. Yeah. It's a good one. Or that yeah, think... the causality of events does or does not make sense as a self-contained Yeah, plot, meanwhile, you know, if I had a yeah. little platoon-type review that covered everything from the source material to every interview about it, all the way over to the comments from different people across the years of review and how it's influenced everything, I'd be like, this is an incredibly thorough, like, huge scope review that's taken a hell of a lot of effort and insight. I totally agree. But I'm, I, I still don't think that... I would say that like Little Platoons in that case is the good one, and the guy who's only seen Lord of the Rings is the bad one. I would just be like, no, no, they're both good. It's just uh, different yeah. scopes. Nothing about what's in the review would be negated by the fact he hadn't seen another film that isn't related to what he's reviewing. Yeah. I, think, yeah, I stand I, or fall I, on the merits of the argument. It's just whether or not, because I think we, we probably agree that it's possible to be a critic, even if you've never read or seen any story except the Lord of the Rings. It's possible to be a critic. Um, it's the likelihood of you being a good critic. If yeah, I'm willing to admit one thing. the likelihihood goes yeah, down the less experience yeah. you have, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just the, the question I had was like, is it possible for it to be a good review, a good critic? And a lot of people said no, so just absolutely not, which I think is unfair. I think you can have good opinions with that happening, but I think it's more likely that's by chance than if you had experience. I think it even could if be you, by chance, you, but it could be through skill. It yeah, all we're saying is the, there's the potential there for a, a very insightful and strong review, even if it's only the one movie they've seen. Because remember, that YouTube is full of critics who do it for a living, and they suck balls I think, at it. I was about to say, <laughs> and I think, what, I don't know if this is what you were getting at earlier, Rags, but when they haven't seen anyone's films or reviews prior, they watch a film for the first time, you're going to get some pure, unfiltered thoughts that may actually have more integrity than your average reviewer. Yeah. In a way... Having all that stuff can be like baggage. Like, yeah, take for example, I'm like um, interested in that review too. more than I, I'm very interested in the idea I because yeah, you wonder what they say. But the to give a counter example, and I bring it up all the time because it's just fascinating to me. Um, Chris Tuckman knew what Blade Runner meant to people. He knew where it stood in society and culture. So he watched it. He had feelings, but he didn't really share them probably because he was like, "Whoa, these aren't the normal ones. These aren't the ones everyone else has. I'm going to keep watching it until I get the right ones." You wouldn't have to worry about that with someone who does it the first time because they don't even know what is accepted or isn't. They could come up being like, Lord of the Rings was shit, man. Too fucking long. And you're like, oh. <laughs> like, well, uh, you know. My mom that's... did once have a boyfriend who said the Lord of the Rings was just people running and fighting. And that was it. Yeah. True. I encouraged her to ditch him very yeah, quickly. They then, stood and talked. They did stand at some points. That's true. Um, but yeah. And, there was and then, a of course, meeting. <laughs> You'd uh, you'd throw loads of criticism, and you'd you'd start talking about how they lack, you know, scales and uh, perspective in order to make the criticism they're even making. But you know, likewise, they could say some really insightful things based on the movie alone. I I find it all fascinating because the nature of criticism is so like downstream. I think of fundamental human action that um, the main like seeming difference that I'm trying to find is mainly that it's just like it goes from being normal to professional. That's that's what makes you not a critic to critic almost. But I mean, people could even make a full hobby out of it, so I don't even know that that's true. Like, it doesn't have to be that they're paid. Taking a different example, just briefly, because The Lord of the Rings is a good one, but The Lord of the Rings is so fundamentally rooted in, in human action and belief and morality and things like that, that it, it, it's almost one of the easiest films to see if you've never seen a film before, I guess, if you're trying to, like, criticize it. If you were to apply it to something more out there, I don't know, like 2001 A Space Odyssey, and you've never seen any film or read any story, and you sat down and watched a film like that, which is, is like conceptually very, very different. Would you be able to criticize that in the same way? Is it, well, uh, it would obviously not be the same way. And that's kind of the another thing that I think is missed by people who aren't as fond of criticism as an art form and a, a huge section of the industry is that there's a huge breadth of different kinds of approaches to criticism. I remember um, when I was doing my Captain Marvel review, the vast majority of the reviews I watched weren't about the story mostly about Brie Larson, the meta of the film, the fall of the MCU sort of thing. And I was checking out loads of different people that I've never even seen before, and I was just like, man, not many people are talking about how bad the story is, which is interesting, because I will be, and pretty much only be talking about the story, because that's the part that I thought was so fucking horrendous, and it's why that I, you know, I don't think anyone's actually truly invested in her as a character, which is why the Marvel's probably going to fall apart, but there's, 
that approach, because like if if all seven of us were told to make a review of Ratatouille, for example, it's going to be very different between the lot of us. Not in, only in like what we say or how we say it or what we reference, but also how we edit. Which um, it, it it's just it's a shame that criticism is seen as criticism, and then the arts and and even like cooking, it's in and of itself is this enormous like in crazy artistic thing that goes all over the place. But criticism will never be given that point of view. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah, maybe one day. Just to tie us back to the video, um, we were talking about what the fundamental of what a good critic would be. And I just, I would like to disagree with his implication that, that the fundamental essence of what a good critic does is discover and praise new things. Yeah, I, I don't agree with that. that. That's, mm. that's half the story and it's downstream or up branch from the more <laughs> fundamental things that we talked about. Yeah, I think um, finding new things and praising them is a result of the more important parts of being a critic, for sure. I agree. Yeah, I think I, there's. I agree. He does need to expand on his thesis a little bit. I mean, in defense of the new, he seems to, yeah, boil down the yeah, role of a critic to just that. And it's like, well, is the new any good? Like, you don't want to defend something <laughs> just because it's. New. Yeah, um, but not to yeah. mention, it's. I would go back to it's a problem of. Possibly the word, the right word would be integrity. You could choose something else. But if you're saying this thing good, this thing bad, this thing good, this thing bad, that's what you've, you've done. He's saying, yeah, but you're missing out on the part where you, you know, find something new and celebrate it. And it's like, I already did that when I said the second good. That was a new thing. Why are you pretending like me saying this thing good, this thing bad doesn't involve new things? That's weird. And at that point, it's, just... it's not about whether or not the thing is new. It's whether or not I'm being honest. If I come across a new thing and I like it, but then I say, like, nothing about it because I'm worried what people will think. It's like, oh, well, that's just my integrity as a reviewer is being in question. It's not about whether or not I'm praising new things. Yeah. Right. We, I, th I think we're in a, a very heavy uh, new is good time. And I think a lot of people fail to realize the vast different direct other directions you could go with new being bad, old being good. I mean, yeah. one of the reasons yeah. Cuphead was praised so much was because it went back. And that's actually part of Ratatouille. You know, it, he, Remy goes back. Yeah, a lot of something forgotten. A lot of writers want to create stories like they'll start with like, oh, the hero kills the dragon and saves the girl. It's like that's boring. Let's make the girl kill the dragon and save the guy. And it's like, okay, that's boring. Now let's make something even crazy. The dragon kills the girl and the guy, and then flies into space. And you're just like, what? What is happening anymore? Like, make the dragon you, a girl. <laughs> you, you've like you've tried to subvert and develop so far that you don't even know what the fundamentals of your stories are anymore. You've gone so far away. Like that's how I feel about um, deconstructions. They're very difficult to nail. There's so much nuance to them. And if you're just like, all right, I've been dropped on this very famous sci-fi fantasy show, or series of movies, sorry, and I'm going to take the protagonist of it, uh, who is known to be one of the greatest heroes in all of media, and I'm going to deconstruct him and, and his like faction. I'm just going to do that, because that's, that's a pretty neat thing to do. I feel like it's a cool idea on paper. It's like, okay, that's an incredibly difficult thing and dangerous thing to do, by the way. Like, I don't know why nobody said, like, hey, you should probably maybe not do that, because the fans are probably not interested in seeing something like that, at least not yet. You're going to want to give them what they're familiar with, like, maybe he kills a bunch of robots and turns up to save a baby. That might be something that uh, people would respond to more positively, <laughs> at least first. So, because someone just said, I really hate deconstructions, I love them when they're done well. Um, just, if you don't know, a deconstruction would, the two things that count would be Unforgiven and The Last Wish, uh, being Puss in Boots. Both deconstructions of a famous, like, sort of well-known, not necessarily hero, but certainly a, a very important character in, in a genre or a world. Um, you've got to, I think a lot of people would say, like, you've got to destroy and build at the same time with deconstructions. Um, yeah, if, like, you're an engineer and somebody takes apart an engine, like, that would be fascinating, right? It's like, oh, okay, that fits into here, that's what does this, okay. Yeah, you asked a few questions, <laughs> like, for example, with Luke, it would be, like, like, were the Jedi so great? And what did you do uh, that we didn't talk about in, in the OT? What did you do that had negative effects that we really don't try to talk about because we want to avoid thinking about it? And what built you as a person? Was it all positive experiences? Was it some negative? Did you learn things that weren't necessarily positive? Like, there's loads of questions you can ask and explore, but if you fumble it... You could end up with something like, I don't know, that everyone despises and destroys an entire fr franchise. Maybe. Uh, that, that, that could be like a potential. Now, now imagine Maybe. with the engine metaphor, somebody says, you know what? Nobody's ever used duct tape on an engine before. So let me just go ahead and yeah. try that.
Okay. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna it's, dip. It's new, you didn't expect it. <laughs> yeah, there's right. pieces of the car that are falling off. I'm gonna dip the whole thing in a vat of glue, and I'm just gonna. That should probably keep it together. <laughs> No one ever talks about how someone was a genius as a child because they took things apart and then didn't put them back together at the end. <laughs> Watch. The first character is Remy, our protagonist. He is a lovable rat, gifted with a good nose for good food, and is driven by a passion to cook, despite his limitations as a small rat. And more drastically, the fact that the cooking world is notoriously out to get his kind. I don't know if they're out together. They, they, they have a yeah, normal reaction to rats as uh, most people will. They just say, sure. go away from here, please. And but yeah, like, it's not like they, they, they don't hunt rats or anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the movie kind of goes into that rats are thieves. They do things humans don't like. <clears throat> it's a versus sit scenario rather than the chef world being out to, or the cooking world being out to get them. Yeah, the movie acknowledges they uh, take, destroy, and they're unclean typically, and that Remy is trying yeah. to uh, sort of subvert that. They're famously bringers of disease, right? I mean, yep. That doesn't just apply to chefs. That's everybody. There's a reason you shouldn't have a rat in a yeah. kitchen. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's not just for memes. It's not like we just hate rats or something. Right. Is this clip necessary? I feel like it is. I don't. It doesn't seem necessary. Certainly not for this length. Uh, too. Also, this is he not a he should have. This yeah. is a bad example because in this yeah. point, Skinner is trying to stop him, not because he is a rat, but because he has stolen documents that he's been trying yeah, to which conceal. He, he should have said. used the clip where uh, Linguini says, "Or I'll treat you ha how rats should be treated." Yeah, that's exactly. the clip he should have used. Or just the clip of you know them all trying to fucking kill, you know, Remy the first time that they see him. Yeah, that'll be another. Yeah, you're right. This, this is a very ill-advised clip. Worst example. Yeah. <laughs> But the second character is Remy's counterpart, Anton, the food critic. Woo! He is the man who represents the embodiment of all society's opposition towards Remy, achieving his dream of becoming a cook. Anton um, is the one... Hmm. Do I don't I agree know about with that. that. No, I do not. Because he doesn't... Anton doesn't spend, like, more than, what, like, five minutes of the movie knowing that he's a rat and opposing him being a cook because he's a rat? Does he ever? He, I mean, he, to be fair, he finds out he's a rat, and then he thinks they're lying to him, as is described, and then he basically is sold. He gets really quiet and sullen, I yeah. think. He's not well, presumably because it. his whole world is changing. <laughs> but yeah. like, yeah. He definitely doesn't represent society, because uh, Gusto's was a popular restaurant until he said something different. And well, then he's... Well, I mean, it, lingui are we talk about Linguini being the exception because he is to humans. That's what changes his like dad's mind in a way. I mean, he is like like a good person who understands Remy. Wait, we're talking about whether Anton, Anton represents oh, Anton, okay. Remy not being allowed to be a chef. No, cool. it's the opposite. Well, okay, it's wait, right, society so assume... is trying to keep him from being a chef. Do you want to? We can roll it back if you want to listen to what he said. Uh, yeah, please do. Maybe I just misunderstood or something. But the second character is Remy's counterpart, Anton, the food critic. He is the man who represents the embodiment of all society's opposition towards Remy, achieving his dream of becoming a cook. Anton is the one... So, no, another reason, because I... I'm thinking about it now, I, I have to disagree. It's, uh, I think the film's point is the way lucky people like Anton exist, because Remy wouldn't have stood a chance otherwise. Like, by the right. end. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because uh, the thing about it is, Ratatouille is not a story about how Anton finds out uh, and isn't believed that the cook at Gusto's is a rat, and that he tries to sabotage their reputation as much as he can in other ways because he couldn't possibly allow a rat to be a famous chef. That's not the story of Ratatouille. It, it isn't, isn't Skinner kind of more the embodiment that he's you could argue that Skinner is much closer to that, yeah. Because he's he he's mostly well, he... more of the movie trying to kill him because he's a rat. Well, at the end, though, uh, doesn't he want to make use of Remy? Like, make him into a fast food a fa a change, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> so he acknowledges that Remy could be a cook, just he has to be a... a he still thinks of him as a rat. The, this film's yeah. depiction of antagonism is so interesting. Because, like, just going by visuals, you would think that Anton's the big bad... But, like, he's really the saving grace of the whole thing. Yeah, you, you can call him um, an antagonistic force, for sure. He's, he represents so much stress and, like, 
he can he can shut down and destroy restaurant. He, I mean, his bad review gave uh, Gusto a heart attack, right? Like right. arguably, I'm That's not going to say that he right, killed him. The, I just, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah that and yeah, the cholesterol. Yeah. But yeah, of, of course. <laughs> I, 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 my suggestion isn't that he killed him. Of course. Um, uh, didn't they say like when you die, it knocks off a star as well or something? Yeah, something like they that. said that was like tradition or something like that. One entrusted one is the one entrusted by the people of France to determine what food is worth their time and what is just plain garbage. And he often does so in a heavily critical manner and without any real remorse. Your remorse. remorse. I wouldn't expect him to have remorse if he's being honest. Well, so yeah, this is the thing. Uh, that would have to come in, I guess, if you thought something unfair happened as a result of your criticism. But the thing is, if a if a restaurant cooks something disgusting or wrong or bad or whatever, and you give them a bad review and then they lose a star, should you feel remorse or should you feel justice has been done? Three star restaurants are still pretty nice, like, and they're they were clearly busy in the Mr. movie. Four over here. Well, th that's what I'm trying to say. Is like, I don't think there's anything <laughs> in Ratatouille like that. He should necessarily. Maybe is he suggesting like as a, as a result of Gusto having a heart attack that he should have felt some level of responsibility? I think the word he should have used or was probably thinking of instead of remorse was something like sympathy or empathy, because he's talking in general terms about yeah. his approach to reviews as opposed to like response to some bad out the consequence of a review that he gave. Um, so he, he's not empathetic to the people he reviews. He's quite, you know, he's very stern, strict, almost seems to revel in being cruel at times. But that's kind of, that's what you sort of have to do as a, as a critic. If you go in with an overabundance of sympathy and empathy, then you're probably going to pull your punches. And that's dishonest and disingenuous. Yeah, people George don't want that used to a lot refuse of the time. to go to eat dinner or have tea with anyone whose book he was going to review that week because he knew he'd end up liking them. And if he liked them, his review would be worse. So he just cut off all social, anyone he was going to review never went to see them until the review was out. And then if they still liked him after the fact, then he thought they were probably pretty good people. I'm Eco. <laughs> You're slow for someone in the fast lane. I love this line. This line's great. Oh, you I'm pausing. For, I love this. <laughs> yeah, I'm pausing for copyright because I want people to hear it. <laughs> so just separate it out. Blah, 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 blah. There we go. And you're thin for someone who likes food. <gasps> Got him. In <laughs> One of the best things about it is Anton looking, like, realizing, like, everyone thought that was a good bird. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> they have no that taste. That whole moment is just, like, perfectly done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dude, I didn't even see that before. Food critic the Grim Eater. The Grim Eater. In the film, he is essentially the Grim <laughs> Reaper of chefs. And when we're introduced to him, we can also see this being hinted towards with a nice visual image of his office chambers that look like a literal coffin. The film also implies that for years on end, Anton has tasted nothing but terrible dishes from subpar chefs. And because of that, he has become incredibly cynical about tasting anything more. The so this is where I'm trying to, this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. I'm starting to wonder whether or not I take issue with that. If you went to like every restaurant and you genuinely, honestly believed that they were creating crap and then you started to become cynical that no one could create great works of food, cooking art, mm -hmm. um, the worry I would have, of course, as everyone else would have, is that you've become so biased you can't actually taste good food. But we know that's not true because he adores Remy's work. So, it, the problem here, I suppose, is has all the food that he's been tasting lately been shit? Or not? <laughs> it, this like, is it, something I'm also confused say. about, because they they established that Gusto made interesting food. Like, he didn't just make fancy food. He, he said, add a little surprise to everything. And it was Gusto's who... Uh, ego tasted so i'm a little confused on it as well the thing about it is for me i'm not going to be too judgmental of anton if he has been served a bunch of shit food in a row and we're talking years in a row of course i think more any normal person would be like really you think that like nobody's serving good food in all of paris and you're like well then so we are supposed to assume then that he's been unfair is that the case i, I guess I'm it seems sure. to me that like he wants people to make absolutely excellent food and he feels like no one's doing that recently or anymore like no one's which i think is the valid of the art form yeah um as a critic's point of view if they if they if there's a person out there who said like there are only about five good films i'd be like okay i disagree but what are those those five and then he names like just five well-known best films of all time 
Um, it's like, uh, I think that's too narrow or the scale is too lopsided. But that at the same time, if you stick to it and you're fair to it and you you know, judge everything accordingly to the scale you've generated, it's just like, I don't know, I think that's that should be allowed to exist and that we shouldn't shame a person necessarily for that. And he is a very, very successful and influential food critic, so there is clearly some level of value that people find in his perspective Absolutely. on food. Thus, he has thrived off being able to give negative criticism and tasting even more bad dishes that just feed this cynical loop that he has. Throughout the course... Is it a cynical loop think... if it's true? I don't um, think that's what's happening. I don't think he hasn't tasted anything yes. good in a while, therefore he's more likely it, to taste yeah, bad because things. Obviously the know. point that's being highlighted is like, yeah, but that's created a point of view that is now making him biased against all the food ahead of time and during or whatever. And that you needed something like Remy's food to actually break him out of this cycle. Like, it was so good, it stopped him from thinking everything was shit. But the part that I'm a little lost on is like, well, but... It seems to me that the integrity wasn't in question at all. It's that he... that Remy's food was great, and he called it great. In the same vein that he would with anything that he was given that was great. But he hadn't been given anything great for a long time. At least that's... you know? I think... I think, uh, to... In the film's defense, what he... What the film is saying he does is that he's overly harsh to anything that isn't excellent, right? I think one he, he compares mm. Chef Gusto to Chef Boyardee at one point, you know, like that anything that isn't excellent is lowest common denominator trash. Like I think the scaling is off. It's a yeah, like yeah. The, it goes, and like that's zero... not fair to everything it's, that's it's pretty of, good, it's a but not perspective. Yeah. Not that yeah. he's like wrong, but that his attitude and like framing is lopsided. Yeah, like like the IGN's fucking scale where it, it's like zero to yeah, eight exactly. means one thing, and that's then nine right. means one exactly. thing, and ten means one thing. Yeah. So are they basically saying he should grade on a scale? Or the, Since the average should, is in it, one part. He needs to rediscover the core. Like, he needs to reconnect with the core so that he his perspective is kind of, like, reinvigorated and refreshed and he can uh, just have a better attitude towards uh, what he does. Of the I think, film. Uh, I, I think part of it is that, yeah, like I said, that, you know, anything that isn't the, the best food he's ever had, he's like, this sucks, this is lame. And I think... Obviously, you could say that's too harsh to things that are all pretty good, right? If, like, Mahler, like you said, the person who's like, only these five movies are good at all, everything else is garbage, you'd be like, okay, come on. But you might say that someone who makes a compelling case for it, as he must if he's this successful as a film critic, or sorry, as a <laughs> uh, food critic, uh, that he, you, you could say his influence would... Uh, push some people to try to be better and try to reach the heights. You know what I mean? Like the, that sort of harsh criticism. Oh, we drifted into whiplash the... here. Cause... Are we talking about? Because if you want to talk about like cooking, right? The Michelin Guide, Michelin stars, and everything. And the well, no, I'm saying he's onto something because yeah, th there are other films that have made this point that like the harshest of critics can end up creating the greatest of artists. And he's like, not mm. even like actually abusive the way what's his name is in yeah. Whiplash. Like, Fletcher. he's just kind of mean. That's like the worst sin he commits is that he's kind of up his own ass and that he's kind and he's mean and he demands excellence from everything or it sucks. And it's like, well, well, if you're trying to be the best you could ever be at cooking, you know, that might motivate you. We watch as Remy struggles to accomplish his dream by facing adversity and numerous critics that range from both his friends to his own family, who are either confused and do not understand. I thought both these guys were his family. Yeah, that's his, his brother, brother and his well, father. Yeah. He's, who, who yeah. Are the or is, he the, talking about, is he talking about the guys that uh, Emil brought along, you know, the other rats? I can't remember if they, did they have criticism for his, um... Uh... I don't think so. I, I don't think we really, really see their perspective no. on it. Maybe yeah. he's counting um, uh, main dude. Well, not main dude. Uh, main human. What? Well, oh, yeah, yeah. I think there's two total characters who have, or three total characters who have criticism of Remy's life, and that's these two and Linguini. Like, nobody I else either Remy. knows Remy exists or they don't care as long as they give him food. He brings them food. He mentions that he has other friends besides his brother, so I don't yeah, know yeah. It's 
understand his ambitions of becoming a cook, or who are simply afraid for where his dreams might lead him and want to protect him from negative consequences, most obviously with him being killed by humans. After all, he is only this scene, a rat. Man, they had balls. Yeah, Take that good man. long look, Rabbit. They this wouldn't do this anymore. A rat. No, yeah, I think this is too dark for Disney. They wouldn't do this anymore. This is like this is this is what Pixar did back in the day. Is they had guts, like when it came to storytelling, they were willing to do this, even though it's a film that you know is for kids. It's a little too a crucial scene too, because like you you might think up until this point that his family is just too ignorant, maybe you know jealous or you know um, they, they just. Well, this is like reality, petty, maybe, is right? Is. But this like, really, reality. in this in this scene, you see that he's really trying to protect him. He's not wrong. The, the uh, world well, then, is incredibly then, uh, hostile to their kind, right? The, the the scene obviously leads into the you know changes nature the the attitude that is important in the film, which is that uh that you know perspective, right? And and that it's like incumbent on um on him and on everybody to like change essentially if they want to make things better rather than just accepting yeah this is the way things are you know yeah. and then nothing changes and everything stays the same comfortable around humans the world we live in belongs to the enemy we must live carefully oh no they're right pause for the second copyright because i feel like keeping these lines are important for the the old yeah. episode itself just so you know what is said here we look out for our own kind, Remy. When all is said and done, we're all we've got. Uh, does anybody remember the uh, the scene where Remy is climbing up to Paris and he bypasses a mousetrap? Yep. Yeah. Does he do that because he knows what a mousetrap is, or does he do so, that because uh... he... Hello? Perhaps. <laughs> But yes, it's because I think he knows it's a trap and he avoided it. Are you going to ask why didn't these rats avoid it? No. Okay. <laughs> I, I, if it, I figured that's what, if it was the other way around, I was like, there's some deep meaning into, it, into that, but I don't think it's that. <laughs> I think it's the other way around. Let me ask everybody else to see if they confirm. Well, I think mean, given the, the opening scene, you know they're they're living in the old woman's house and they they seem to be kind of tiptoeing around. Well, he's, like they don't want the woman to know that they're there. You can just say his dad's a veteran, when, clearly. Like his dad would have taught him everything about yeah. this. Right. Yeah. And then and yeah. then Remy is and spotted Remy's by smart, the old right? woman, and then like the woman tries to shoot him. Like so, I, I think he's aware, definitely, that the world is there are people out there in the world that are trying to kill him. Yeah, I figured as much. I just wanted confirmation. Remy manages to overcome all of these hurdles, but his final and biggest challenge is still out there waiting for him. Anton, the notorious food critic. As Anton comes to see Remy, he tells a confused waiter that he wants to be served the rat's ego on a plate. A symbolic jab at how figuratively he devours the egos of... So I feel like it's important in terms of writing his script here rat. that you shouldn't yeah. call it that he wants the rat's ego. First of all, he has no idea it's a rat at this point. So no, he, he wants the chef's perspective. He says perspective. Well, and uh, I know he's uh, putting an asterisk there, but like it's important to emphasize that. Well, it I feel like this is worth re-recording um, yeah. instead of putting I mean, the corrective word. Because uh, not only that, but if you haven't seen uh, Ratatouille in a while, you might be convinced that Ego knows it's a rat that's cooking at this point. Which he does not. He does not. Nope. Um, he just he, think, thinks, he it's thinks it's linguine. Linguine's going to be cooking. Yeah. Oh, well, the, 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 fact, the fact that he used the wrong word like really damages his point here. I think so. Well, the so thing why is, bother he's, getting it right? He's not identified <laughs> it, but like, he definitely should have re-recorded this one. This is an important one. Yeah. Listen, re-recording takes work. Like you got to set the it mic takes, back up. It takes and moments. It sounds different. It takes moments. <laughs> no rags. It takes weeks. Oh. It wait weeks. Literal it it. and thorough weeks. <laughs> and how figuratively he devours the egos of chefs in his own reviews. And although he doesn't yeah, it seemed know like Remy... what he just said there seems, seems like just a fundamentally incorrect mm. statement. Well, in, in, in realizing... It, so, sorry for me. I, well, it's just his correction would be he devours their perspectives? I, yeah. I don't know what that means. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm not sure what well, well, it, there. In, in studying what the correct term is he'd realized that like that was rhetorical like like he's sort of trolling the waiter here 
it, like leading to the conversation to a point where he's like, let me provide the perspective because I'm the critic. I'm here to that's judge what, you guys. That's right. right. Well, yeah, and yeah. this is his ego coming through. It's like, it's about time this place, because it keeps getting like people saying it's good. It requires perspective and it's not going to be provided by the people coming here or the chef. It's going to be me. Mm -hmm. Right. And a plate, a symbolic jam. Which of course how is uh, really cool that uh, good old Remy provides him some perspective. Exactly. <laughs> he wasn't ready for yeah. that. Right. He devours the egos of chefs in his own reviews. And although he doesn't know Remy is not his typical chef, this line is still a reminder that Anton is someone Remy should fear. He might not be... Should fear? I don't I, know I think that. I think that's a thing. I, I, I think that by the time it's, uh, as you see Remy cooking, he doesn't look very afraid at all. He looks very comfortable. He fears, uh, you can argue there's fear on him when he, in the interview process, but I, I, I take issue with should fear. No, I, I think that's the problem, right? It's one of the things that Remy, it seems like he's not very afraid when he's actually cooking because he's so like immersed in it. He's happy. Well, yeah, and I think that that's the point the film wants to make. Yeah, that, that he's enjoying it for its own sake. Uh, and then consequently that that yields a really good outcome when he presents it to Ego. Chef, this line is still a reminder that Anton is someone Remy should fear. He might not be an exterminator, but Anton is the executioner of chefs, and instead of using a sword, he uses a pen, and as the old adage goes, the pen yep. is Maria. Didn't like yeah. to say it. It yeah, was okay. Right. <laughs> and the sword. Uh, it is okay. It's it's I feel like it's adjacent to using the good, the bad, and the ugly as like a as a statement, you know? It's like, yep, Do had that one a, a billion times, the but the pen is mightier than the sword. Do but Remember, the sword gun is mightier than the pen. That's right, and the, <laughs> the, pen, the, the, the pen, yeah, pen gun mightier than the sword, sword gun mightier than the pen gun. Yeah, this is, also, de <laughs> delivery is extremely important. When you have a saying that people can predict is coming, you have to like say it in a way that twists it a little bit. Subvert expectations. Yeah, that's you'd want to you incorporate to it and re maybe reverse the wording into your own sentence and so that people realize you're using the quote right as you finish the sentence and then you move on. Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, maybe he said, like, in this case, perhaps Anton is mightier than, a, than an exterminator through the use of his pen. There's some, some shit that, you know, you, you, you redraft. <laughs> I don't sort of just take like the out food. Of the I love it. Oh, he's, he's, he's so relatable. Also, I don't, I don't like too, movies. I love them. <laughs> I tolerate to movies. But he doesn't execute chefs. He, like, makes them less critically acclaimed. They can still cook. It's not like they're out of a job. Like, there wow. are only 14 three-star restaurants in all of America. Like, a three-star restaurant is still really, really, really wow. highly rated. The thing is, the Google though, three star, they're not that the, impressive. When the, with the Michelin system. No, 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 no. No, like the Michelin three. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Michelin three, stars are way more yeah, impressive three, than three, Google stars. Michelin Google stars aren't that impressive. Wait, no, no, no. Wait, three Michelin stars is the top. It's not five, it's three. So if you got three, you're like absolute best of the best. Yeah. Oh, Gusto's what's the, dead. So what's it's, it's one, five two, stars? three. What's uh, five stars, stars is movie? like a system in this movie for some reason. Um, oh, okay. Michelin it could be three. like a Forbes or a something like that. Uh, it could be five well, stars on Yelp. Are, I think there's like AA Rosettes. Is, I think that's the thing in the UK. And I think that's like five stars. Uh, so it could be that. But yeah, Michelin is 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 three is top, and then you got two and one. But the thing is, in that industry, you lose a star that can like destroy you as a as a as a a, a, a restaurant. Losing a star is like really potentially catastrophic. Um, it's a, it's a hyper stressful system, the Michelin guide system, because I have like, okay, uh, well, the point I'm trying have... to make is that they got two stars knocked off their five star rating system and they're still incredibly busy. And um, doing just well, no, they, they've got empty seats. Uh, I think, I think that's something that you're meant to pick up in the film is that there are empty oh, okay. tables around in the restaurant. They're not doing as well as they were before. Okay. Um, they, I had the impression that they were still functional. Oh yeah, they're they're functional. It's just that they're not they're not where they used to be. Uh, there's definitely that. I mean, as like well, wait. A, a I think thing. sorry. Cap was probably prompted by him saying he can like destroy careers, which is a matter of semantics, maybe. Uh, yeah. Because I mean, yeah, I guess so. Um, but I mean, it's. I guess it's I'm fine with that as like a slightly hyperbolic. Like, in the case of someone like Anton, it's not just that you know it's, it's, he's hurting their feelings, right? Like it can have a measurable impact on their business. Well, um, and it, so that's well, where I wanted to take this says, conversation: is yes, he can have a measurable impact, but like, shouldn't he? Is that bad? You know what I mean? Um, 
I mean, yeah, I guess it's kind of a, a discussion that just... <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, they had all that right, business. Yeah. And success because critics oh, are you, you need to say that all again cap you are yeah. cut out there oh uh well they had five stars and all their success because critics like him credentialed them yeah no that's where i wanted to go with this so yeah. All, yeah um i was gonna say like i was hoping someone would maybe present the idea that's like maybe that's too much power and it's like so it's power that it seems everyone is engaged with and accepted as the rules of the game and then when they lose the game they complain about the system um, well, it's, it, yeah, it's kind of interesting, because you look at a lot of these, like, chefs, they all put a, a, well, not all of them, I shouldn't say that, you you look at, you know, you watch, like, the documentary about Gordon Ramsay trying to get his three Michelin stars, it's like, obviously, it's this thing that is, like, in the sphere that he's in, it's like the marker of quality, the ultimate marker of quality, and it's like, well, how does that system work, and it's like, well, people put stock in it, people believe in the system, yeah. and, like, you know, and, and then that yields the positive effects, and then also the negative effects, you know, one way or another. I don't think any one person or entity's opinion should hold so much power, but when it, it when this type of system is gained naturally, like what are you going to do about it? I mean, uh, I think perspective is valuable. Like people, I think these yeah. systems will naturally exist. Though, well, I, I think so too. And then I think that what's happening is that there's a natural checking that comes in of like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I feel like yes, this developed naturally, but now you've got too much power. Um, it came up in Bird Member. It's like, why do you? Does this person have the power to sink or swim for like a whole restaurant? It's like that's insane. How can how and and you know you you can make that uh, point of view totally valid, I think. But at the same time, it's like yeah, why did that happen? It's like well, but apparently they're that trusted by people as having a, a valuable and in, an integral point of view. It's like and, and so how much power should they have is complicated. Unless yeah, you've established that he's actually been dishonest or unfair, there's yeah. not actually anything wrong with it. People trust his opinion. Which is not something the film does, I don't think. I don't think the film ever makes the point that Anton has been uh, like like lying or manipulative. No, uh, I don't think so. It's the it's perspective it, that his perspective is askew, not that he's like malicious or uh, lying or dishonest. No, I, I mean, if he's affecting anyone negatively, it's himself, really, because yeah, he's, he's, kind he's of joyless. Off. He's like a shell of himself. I don't think he goes through life happy. Like that's what's so great about the ending. It's like he's he works in a brought, cough brought back to life. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, he he gets reconnected with the core, which is as much as you know, as much as I don't think the film is saying that he when he says he loves food that he's lying, it's that he's kind of lost sight of what exactly it was that he he loved about food. Something's gone off and he needed to reconnect with it. Right. If I don't love it, I don't swallow I will return tomorrow night with high expectations pray you don't disappoint me this is why I feel the character like designs are so good look at it performance I love yeah. it look on, at it's that he death says, for Remy death go ahead this might be an aside but he says high expectations doesn't he mean high standards no because he he's expecting to be dis disappointed well, uh, he will have. He it, expects a lot from uh, Linguini, especially based off yeah, what he's heard. Well, he's expecting Linguini to fail. So, wouldn't those be high standards rather than expectations? Uh, well, it, it's a sign that we don't have to. I, I think he's um, saying he expects a lot of Linguini. That's like Rag said. That it's I, I don't. Yeah, I think yeah. <laughs> you could have it. You could have him say, "I expect you to. You should do well, or something." Or like, if you want to get a good review, but in his head, you know, what I'm trying to say is, what he says and what he feels can not don't have to necessarily match completely. Like, um, you better do great, buddy. Is like not incongruent with thinking you're not going to do great. You're going to do terrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Death for his body, but also his soul. He is someone that out of all people, Remy should fear the most because unlike others, Anton truly knows what good food tastes like, which puts Anton in the highest position to judge Remy's cooking on top of being able to judge him as a pest. Thus, Anton isn't just able to be the end of Remy in just his body, but also in his spirit, dreams, and passion. Um, it's, it's interesting. I don't think I necessarily disagree, though... Uh, we are w working off the operative that, that, like, he must know what good food is. Like, we, we assume so, because there's no real way to, like, I don't know, prove it outside of the fact that he's in his position for a reason, we assume. Mm. 
Um, but yes, that is a stress of it. The fact that if you can't get one of the most respected critics to respect your artwork as, you know, that of strong creativity, merit, or, or just strong execution, then it'll make you wonder if you're actually making art or not. I do this wonder is if it would actually crush his soul if, you know, he got a bad review from this guy. He seemed so confident and self-assured, Remy, that is, you know. Well, and, like, and I don't know. it probably shouldn't, right? Like, that should be a part of the message. It should, you shouldn't let someone saying you did bad make you crushed. You should or like, keep on going. Or want to stop doing it. Yeah, in a different story, that's the yeah. message you would want to send, yeah. To me, something worse than death for Remy, because when he feels like he can't cook, he acts like he's lost his soul. And we catch a glimpse of this when Remy is captured, and all hope feels lost. So, we have given up. Why do you say that? We are in a cage, inside the car trunk. I have to do a lot of pulls and probably, yeah, but I do want to have the scene play out. I also don't... Metaphors it's, are it's fun. Not, it's not analogous, because if he, if he gets a bad review from Anton, it's not like he could never cook anywhere ever again. Well, it, it, you're right, because like, it's... um. The bad, Anton reviewed the place badly, and it's been building back up because of good cooking. So if Anton reviewed it badly again, theoretically, they could still build back up by people liking the food that Remy's creating, right? Yeah, I, mean, uh, I guess it would not... be the concern that it could be the thing that pushes the business over the edge. I think, like in terms of that, in those stakes, it's a lot more about Linguini and like the restaurant. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, well, but that's different like, the more because he's talking about Remy's spirit. Yeah. Oh, like that his spirit would be crushed if Anton thought yeah, his food like was he's bad. He's basically saying if Anton reviews him negatively, that's it for him. His life's over because I, he can't cook. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not convinced that it would. Uh, no, that neither Remy am I. would be destroyed <laughs> by that. I think Remy's got like. A a bad review from Anton. Awaiting a future in frozen food products. No, I'm the one in a cage. I've given up. You are free. I am only as free as you imagine me to be. Just pausing mm. for the sake of safety. Yeah. Also, yeah, um, don't know what's up with either YouTube, Discord, or something today, but we're getting every once in a while like a five-second gap of silence. A little bit um, of silence. So those listening at home right now or in future, don't you worry. It's that's just something that's happening for some reason. As you are. Oh, please. I'm sick of pretending. I pretend to be a rat for my father. I pretend to be a human through linguini. Just just safety, safety, safety. You know how it goes. Mm -hmm. Flim flam fleem. Yeah. I, I pretend you exist, so I have someone to talk to. You only tell me stuff I already know. I know who I am. Why do I need you to tell me? What would you guys say is happening in this scene? Uh, he's trying to build himself up. Build Doing himself back up. Pep talk. He, uh, part of him is talking to the other part of him. Which one wins is, is determined at the end of this conversation. Yep, I think that's all accurate, and I think this brought on by a couple of things all at once, right? Like losing his access to the kitchen, probably with uh, what happens with Linguini. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously this being is captured. Also, this is also the final time we see Ghosto. So nice. this could be yeah. the death of a certain perspective in Remy's head. Or yeah. the letting go of a certain perspective in his head. What do I need to pretend? <laughs> ah, but you don't, Remy. You never did. When Remy doesn't cook, it's a much bigger deal for him. He feels completely lost, and it's worse than being simply caught by the humans because at least he could die as a chef rather than die as just a rat. However, so you're almost crazy. I think I would actually say that he's um. He's actually got it reversed. I think there's more credence to the reverse part, point of view that, in this case, he's lost access physically to cooking, not spiritually. Like, um, it, what I mean is that he's not worried about ego destroying his spirit. Rather, the, it, it would be the, the, that moment in the film is an absolute like restriction from being able to cook. And um, obviously, the, the rat stuff comes back into it, right? The last thing Linguini says is, I'll treat you like a rat if you... Uh, if yeah. you come back or whatever. So, like, you know, the, the conversation is like the nature of a rat being a cook. You're pretending. And it's like you never were. You're always a cook. You're always. You're a cook. You yeah. are a cook. That's who you are. Yeah. You're um, a 
However, while Anton might be death, Remy is also death's counterpart, life. He, to me, is the symbolism of youthful ambition and of love and hope itself, which can never really be destroyed. This is why I... Except by death. Yeah, <laughs> yeah if you die, your, your hope gets destroyed. Yeah. Gusto has no more hopes and dreams because he's because he got fucking, fucking killed died. by the cholesterol believe that regardless of anyone's opinions, even of someone as high and mighty as Anton, Remy would still continue cooking no does matter he what. He does Wait. He did. You just said the opposite like 30 seconds ago, though. That he would be destroyed if Ego gave him a bad review. Yeah, yeah. his spirit would be broken, and like that Anton has the power to destroy I know, his cause spirit. Where you kept saying, like, well, the, the montage where he's cooking, he's real happy and not worried at all. But, I mean, like, yeah. but, but of course, what right. you would point to at that point is that he's already hit his low point. Well, but the, that's that's the, the problem of this video is it seems yeah. like it's told things out of sequence a little bit. Yeah, because it because by by the time that he's cooking for it's it's partially the reason why he succeeds stems from the fact that he is now comfortable and self assured in his identity as a chef, and that he's way less mired in all of these perceptions and like I need to be this or I need to be that. Yeah, for the these rat people. angle, the yeah, like criticisms back and the and low forth. point isn't really spurred on by ego at all. No, it's it's everything no. else. It's the relationship with just, Linguini and the access to the kitchen. The guy making this video just said that, like, oh well, he doesn't really need ego's approval. And it's like, what? <laughs> what is it? He he said it earlier as if to set up the point that oh, that's the power the critic holds in his hands, so he better not be too mean about it. And it's like, <laughs> I just don't think that follows from what we've seen in the movie doesn't care what anyone would think. But although this might be the case, this doesn't change the fact that Anton's word against Remy still symbolizes the fear that all artists face in that they are at the mercy of the beholder who views their work and judges if it's of value or not. But as we see in the final showdown between Remy and Anton, artist versus critic, something remarkable happens. Anton is reborn. I have a question. What's that? Do you, do you, does any, uh, do you guys feel like, have any of you had your works critiqued? Uh, um, oh, yeah. All the time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Heavily, do, uh, do harshly, you, extremely. Do you feel, do you feel the way he just said? Uh, what do, do you mean? You wanna, do, like the idea that when I don't, you create something that you're kind of like going out. That you are at the behold, the behold of uh, the critic and that they um, can. So I mean, I mean, to yes some extent, no. you're going to be judged for what you make, and that's obviously like a part of it, and you accept it. But I mean, I like to make stuff because I like it. Yeah, uh, uh, the distinction uh, between being being beholden to your audience and beholden to a critic specifically, or is the audience just critic in this situation? Because like, I want to do a good job for my audience. I want to make them laugh. I want them to have a good time. And if they don't, I've done something wrong. I don't class that as quite the same as. The opinion of like somebody I know really well, or someone who's really, really high up in whatever industry it happens to be, who's you know taste and I respect, and whose judgment I I really rely on. That's that's a kind of different kind of fear. I don't really mind too much being criticised by people, but like there there are some people that you look up to whose opinion probably matters a bit more to you. But I wouldn't necessarily think that's fear. Yeah, I should have been a bit more specific. Like not not like a audience critic, but like somebody makes a big critique like a, a written review or a video or whatever about your stuff and then while watching it do you feel like you're under their thumb basically i've uh, so i've always wanted to encourage uh the same i think conclusion that ratatouille has in this aspect of the lesson for remy that you should gain your like confidence and value in and of the acts themselves and for you like in terms of the creation of it you should find the value in that that the thing that's created is the awesome thing that you've done you shouldn't necessarily base it on what everybody says it is because it's so mm -hmm. fickle and it can often be misunderstood or lies or there's a lot of deceptive visions of it that can absolutely fuck with your psyche in the same vein you could theoretically create something shit and everyone liked it and that would throw you off as well so it's just like maybe find your own understanding of your own work and what works and, and take value in the fact that you've created something in and of itself or that it's strong but at the same time there is absolutely no denial that having everybody on over Earth, like, we're wired this way. If everyone says we made something incredible that they love, it's going to make you feel good, and it's something that you want. Um, and especially as Lil Platoon just highlighted, certain individuals' opinions will mean a hell of a lot more than than others, and that that's just, like, an 
indisputable part of it. I suppose the equivalent here is that if we all made a video and that Anton would be maybe PewDiePie? Not necessarily a critic of, of videos, but if we knew our next video is being sent to him and he's going to review it in front of everybody, it would be like, hmm. And, you know, mm. is that a fear, apprehension, anxiety, and what, for what exactly, that if he was to give it a negative review, what is the result? That your reputation goes down? Or that your chance to give yourself a boost in career is gone and you wasted it? Or There's all kinds of elements and motivations that could come into it. I, I, don't, I don't think it's unusual, it's just that it's different for everybody, different scales, different knobs and numbers being pushed and pulled in all different directions for why. Um, interesting to think about, though, I suppose. Okay, I was curious, because I've only been, like, severely critiqued once, uh, well, that I can recall. Uh, and when it happened, I actually got it, uh, I had the opposite feeling. I got excited because uh, off script, I'm, I'm not as good uh, with my words. But when somebody is, like, critiquing me on script, that gives me an ability to uh, elaborate further. Because in my work, I have to be succinct. I can't go on long tangents or the audience will get bored. Yeah, but if true. somebody gives Can't, an elaborate critique, I'm like, oh, you're allowing me to expound on what I said? Okay, let's do this. And it was actually like one of the most fun times I had when they gave me that critique. Yeah, that's that's definitely a potential. There's, there could be a strict excitement to anyone reviewing your work. Because you'd be like, fuck yeah, let's do it. Like no apprehension or fear. It's, it's, it's different for everybody. And obviously different contexts. I've, uh, so sorry if I may add a thing here. I've yep. been making videos may. on my channel since 2007. And, uh, not just like videos critiquing other people's work, but like I, I write stories and I made several Machinima series. And, uh, some of my early stuff is, in fact, a lot of it is cringe. And, uh, I didn't know that at the time, but I was able to shape m my craft because of the critique that I got. I never ever saw it as sort of like a hindrance or like shackles or like being under anybody's thumb. I always saw it just as an opportunity to grow. And, you know, I got a lot of mean reviews, mm -hmm. like critiques, people calling me every name insult you can think of. But that shit never really bothered me. Um, it was the stuff, there was the critique that was actually accurate that hurt the most. But I never saw it as like, oh, I'm never gonna make something again. I was, I always saw it as an opportunity to, you know, improve and make the next one better. You're so, right. yeah, uh, yeah. There's definitely an element of sometimes if you get, you know, under the umbrella of criticism, someone labels out something, and you read it all, and you don't even recognize it, like to the point where you're like, did you even watch my video? Like, what is this? What does this have to do with my stuff? Um, this is something that's very incisive and even maybe is like, I love the part about this, but where you really failed was how you've completely missed this element. You're like, oh shit, I did. Like, yeah. But right. you know, you, you, I think any, any story would try and encourage like, that's good. It's a good thing. It means you've got things to learn, places to go, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like trying to see it as moving forward. Well, I think that's, um, it's, you know, you can have an attitude of it. It's not like the, it's a problem because someone said it. It's like you agree with it, right? It's it's it it comports to your understanding of what is good or bad. So you could always even then like try to make it more um focus it in more on like your fundamental experience. It's just, well, I got new information and like it makes sense to me, rather than this person said it was bad and that is the reason why I should be upset. Yeah. I don't know, it's all about trying to find like I guess a good attitude and approach to have that doesn't end up like destroying your ability to create anything new. Yeah, right. Because you can get crushed criticism. in so many different ways. Like, I feel like it's super intuitive and, and simple to be like, a harsh critic can destroy the creativity of an artist. You're like, okay, is it possible for the the excessive praise of a critic to destroy the creativity of an artist? Like, uh, well, yeah, it destroys yeah. Of course. Yeah, it happens anything a lot. Good, and, and, yeah, and that's the thing. I, I I want more stuff to talk about that. Fuck it. Let's get it all yeah. out there. You know, all the different versions. My impression with that is it's always that possible. it's more likely to happen as well as you sort of get older and become more professional. When you're younger and you're starting out and the, your, your your motive is always going to be just like, I'm going to create what I want to create. And if someone doesn't like it, fuck them. But as you get older and you sort of, you start to learn the craft a bit more, but you also gain more sort of relationships with people who you admire and respect. And you're more technically aware, maybe, but you're also aware of more of the critics and you listen more to them. You become more aware of pleasing them. And in a bid to please all of the critics, you end up pleasing absolutely nobody, which is why so many artists just lose their, their verve as they get older. They, they try to become, you know, all things to all the people they admire and respect. They're part of the club. 
and the club mentality is what really sort of kills your artistic imagination. Yeah, I remember when when I was really young, like I started uh, out making stuff on Newgrounds, and I remember I I said that thing that you had said there, like verbatim, like here's my thing, I made it. If you don't like it, you I don't care. <laughs> and somebody think, replied yeah. saying, "How are you ever going to grow from your attitude?" And that was a really pivotal moment for me. I was just like, you know what? He's right. Like, I should be soaking in, you know, trying to parse good critique from bad critique and figuring out where I'm going wrong and well, actually um, try to make better stuff. If I could, I think this applies, but like, you know, uh, Friction will make um, several horror games that are quite celebrated, but still a little clunky and getting there. Um, and then they make... Uh, the Dark Descent, which is a refined version of what they were making in the previous games, and people adore it, they love it, it's so great. And then they were like, cool. And, you know, I'm not gonna try and... I'm trying to be a little nicer than usual. As artists, <laughs> they were like, we're gonna continue creating. And so they create Soma. It's one of the, as far as I'm concerned, greatest stories ever told. And then it's like, oh, wow, that didn't do very well. Meanwhile, Outlast came out after the Dark Descent and, like, almost swallowed up the, the genre's sort of king. It's like it was Dark Descent, but Outlast kind of edged it out, especially with YouTube Let's Plays. That it's more likely people will be playing Outlast for those reactions because there's way more scripted screams. Um, and then Outlast 2 is more hyped and everything, and like Soma is, is, is basically forgotten, if not reviewed at all. But the one thing that was shocking about Soma for me was so, so few people even talked about it, like um, gave it a shot. And of, of those who did, I was surprised at how much like the story was completely fucking misunderstood. In any case... The praise for stuff like what I consider shit, like Outlast 2 or um, Five Nights at Freddy's or a lot of these games, convinces Team Frictional to be like, we should have just made, let's just make Amnesia Rebirth, fill it with jump scares, we'll have a jump scare fucking mechanic that we will justify to our audience. <laughs> and that it'll be nice and scary and it'll go back to what people love and it'll be great. And it's like one of the worst things, like, I don't know if this is exaggerative, Rags, but it's one of the worst games I've fucking played. I have nothing but no, shit memories. No, Amnesia Rebirth was shit. Yeah, I hated Amnesia <laughs> Rebirth. Everything about it sucked. The characters, the story, the mechanics. It was all such shit. I hated it. And like, where's the, where, and I'm not, this is not shade to Ratatouille, but where's the movie about the critics that praise shit and then an artist ends up making shit to try and appease them and mm. it ruins creativity? <laughs> Well, I mean, right. I mean, Whiplash so. presents the story, right, of like, hmm, hmm, like, what does it take to become the absolute, like, best that you can be at something? And, like, how do we all feel about that, you know? How do we feel about that process? So there's that, to, you know? To yeah, yourself. I mean, there's in Sorry, the shoes ahead. of someone making a movie, which I think in fairness, is is slightly different to some of these other art forms that um, don't cost nearly as much to make, and so people can just make and put out there for anyone to see. Movies really need to be successful or else you don't get to make them anymore uh, with caveats for certain dumb decisions people in the business make. But I, I do find I like some sympathy with people, especially in the past, this isn't true as much anymore, where one or a few movie critics really did have a major impact on whether your movie was a success or not mm -hmm. critically. It's been sort of spread out in the era of Rotten Tomatoes, but back when there were more famous movie critics, there they had quite a bit of influence. And But even thinking about that, I don't think there's any reason to lament the power those people have unless they're being unfair. Right, because if they say your movie sucks and you actually think their criticisms were really poor criticisms, yeah, that would really suck to be to have your success, the success of your movie, the fact that people might not see it because of their criticisms and their takes, and that you find to be poorly written or you know poorly constructed. But if their critiques are valid, I don't see how you can lament that they have an influence over people. You know the what I mean? Like ultimately... It always comes. Go ahead. Oh no, I was going to. Well, the critics ultimately beholden to the same audience yeah. in the end as as the film industry is. So they, we were talking earlier about is it bad that critics have certain amounts of power? Is there a right a right amount of power a critic should have? The answer is the critic will have as much power as they've earned, and as they start to yeah. praise crap, and the audience eventually sees that what they're being told to see is crap, the critic loses his power Oof. and influence. That you see in all the the video game journalism outlets that used yeah. to be known and respected. 
which have now just completely tanked because their priorities have shifted. They praise the wrong things and the audience can see that. So those outlets and those critics no longer have the same power they used to have. You see it with individuals a lot as well. Individual like YouTubers, there's rises and falls in terms of people's understanding of their taste and direction. There's also a sense that um, when you have, uh, as we've said with the creative process, right? Being that you create like like the Frictional Games example, I feel like they were like, okay, we can't make whatever we want. We can't make what we think would be awesome. We kind of need to, you know, follow the line here, go, go back on the tracks. We need to make the thing that people seem to fucking love. That's the impression I got from uh, playing Amnesia Rebirth, especially in a long line of playing their games. The, the other games I was referring to, some people were asking, is Penumbra. The, they, I think it was a trilogy. Uh, that's where they like first got on the scene or at least noticed um now yeah. the equivalent with like a youtuber and this has happened i've known plenty of youtubers who talk about it and it sucks is that they make you know video about thing that they want to talk about then you make another video about another thing they want to talk about then you make a third video about another thing they want to talk about whoa third video blows up so the first one was about you know whatever franchise second one same thing third one was about star wars let's say or um marvel it doesn't really matter and then they want to talk about something specific and different, and then something specific and different, and then, you know, nobody's watching, nobody cares, and nobody's praising them, and so they're like, well, now, like, like, I was following exclusively creativity, and now I feel like I have to do something else to format it. And then some YouTubers, they start following whatever the trend or approved of thing is, and then it makes them miserable and destroys the creative output. Yep, and then they hate right. their lives, yeah. and they whine a lot on Twitter, and they get, you know... I get they just get so disenchanted about the whole thing. Yeah, and that that's across all industries, of course. Yeah. Yeah. When your passion does not intersect with what will allow you to be successful or you don't know how to make successful the things you're passionate in. And that is such an interesting reflection, I think, of the point that over criticism can destroy creativity. It's like what about uh apathy and then an over praising of the opposite of creativity? We've got to be careful, right? It's all a big balance, almost with everything in life, everything moderated to some degree. It's always extremes that fuck everything up. And I just feel like, um, no offense to the guy who's made this video, I think this is one of the better videos we've ever covered on EFAP. It's, it's, it's I think so. relatively strong. So far, yeah. Fine, I, I'm fine with it's it. It's things that I disagree with. But, yeah. yeah. But the thing is, like, I don't believe this guy's ever going to make a, a video called, like, The Problem with Overpraise. I imagine that's never even mm. come to his mind. Right. Yeah. A lot of people don't even think about it. Positivity is uh, definitely put on a pedestal. Right? The, that's kind of a, a topic. Yep. It's destroyed a lot. It's the, not the silent killer, but, well. Yeah, I do. I think over criticism is the wrong way to frame this. I don't think that's really the, it's, it's poor criticism. I mean, yeah. you, if there's, if there's a lot of good criticism, that that wouldn't really be an issue, I don't think. Like nobody would be upset with a lot of good feedback uh, yeah. that creates better things. It would be if the criticism is bullshit or wrong. That's the thing. You just said, as you said, good feedback, and it's like, oh, you mean like praise? And it's like, no, I mean praise and criticism. No, good feedback. Good feedback is yeah. in things that will help you make continue to make good things or make better things in the future. Yeah, like or constructive feedback, right? Like, yeah, even if it's like you're pointing out negatives, you're giving the artist something that they can use to make their next thing even better. Yeah, right? exactly. So, I mean, yeah. so some of it could be criticism. Some of it can be nuts and bolts level to the point of like you have a flash frame there and there and there. Um, in future, cut further away from the actual cuts in the source so that you uh, make it less likely that you'll have flash frames. Someone could just be like, "That's just a." outright like pointing out of a flaw and that in future now you'll have less distractions from an audience experience point of view like you can totally talk. what i'm trying to say is like you can get so fundamental that to call that negative is almost baffling to me if someone said like this I, is a well, flash frame at this point yeah. yeah especially right. if you want to you know if that person said was well, like no it's positive because i'm learning and i'm going to be better next time yeah and thanks for pointing it out i missed you... it you know Exactly. And you have a perspective that I didn't have, and I accept it. And then you can have someone point out a perspective, and you're like, that's your perspective? I think it's fucking stupid, and I'm not listening to you. And that's totally fine as well. <laughs> I feel like that needs to be emphasized, yeah. right? You can look at a piece of criticism and go, yeah, I think that's bullshit. Uh, I, I don't care. Anyway, moving on. Yeah, like, not that's all criticism is valid. Yeah, exactly. Just because it came from someone else doesn't mean that you have to listen to it. <laughs> um, <laughs> our, our conversation earlier no one agreed with me in my and criticism yet, <laughs> it went just right. fine and, and yet yeah and i think sometimes it's like when you when you get criticized for a piece of art that you make it's not always about like missing something 
where it's just like, oh, I didn't spot that. You're right. Like sometimes you need to have your tastes shaped, mm -hmm. you know, where like you didn't really have an understanding at all of the thing that they're pointing out and you have to sort of transform yourself, like adapt. Where it's like, okay, I understand this thing now that I didn't conceptualize before. I think that well, can be one of the more difficult things about it as well. It's one of the reasons lots of people will cry about what they call over-criticism is that certainly if you're, if you're an artist and you're putting everything into this work and you think you've got like this brilliant understanding of your characters, your themes, your plot, your world building, everything else, and you lay it out in front of someone and it's your creation, you're really proud of it. And they might sit there in the best faith possible and give this really constructive feedback. It's like, well, I don't think based on what you've described the character as, the character would do that in that situation. I don't think the world quite works in the way you think that it does because of what you've previously said. That, you know, it's fair criticism, but as the creator, it's not always easy to sit there and take it as fair criticism. Sometimes that actually feels pretty horrible. And it's about sort of, you have to get over that block in your mind, which is that, yeah, you can actually be wrong about your, your favorite creation. And you will be improved if you accept that. It's just, it might feel a bit horrible in the process. And yeah, course, I, I agree. Um, and you sort of, I think as an artist, you just have to take that on. Like I, I, yeah. I, I, I'm, I came to that conclusion a long time. Where it's just like, you know, I'm going to get criticism for this and it's going to hurt a lot, maybe. But, you know, I, I used that. You know, yeah, I, like, like, I, I took a people... day to get over it. And, yeah, sorry, go, go ahead. Oh, no, 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 finish, finish what you were saying. No, no I, I think I said it. Yeah, it's just, I took a day to just sort of, you know, feel bad. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. I, I thought to myself, like, it's okay that I'm feeling bad. This is part of the process, right? Because it's like conjuring thoughts about like, okay, where could I, how could I have done this or that different, right? And then it's like the next day, it's like, okay, I had my feeling bad phase. Now I'm going to come back with something that's really going to impress people. And then there's sort of like an invigoration there, you know, where I'm excited to make the next thing because of, because I felt bad about accurate critique that I had received. And if you really don't want to deal with the pain and discomfort from getting criticized, you could just not release your stuff publicly ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's yeah. another option. Yeah. That's, That's the other option. option. That's true. That's true. That's true. You can, just, quote, wasn't you can it? just make a painting and then not show it to anyone. Exactly. Everyone has a book in them, and in most cases, that's where it should stay, I think is the quote. <laughs> oh, my God. That's where it should stay. <laughs> yeah. that's like good. How that's dare. dare. I like that quote. I feel challenged by that quote. <laughs> yeah, some people are like, wait, there's a book in me? Oh, I gotta write. Thanks for the inspiration. Keep your shitty fucking opinions. Uh, I'll show you quote. <laughs> Back oh, here yeah? quote. Well, I'm gonna tell everyone my shitty story. Whoa. Oh my goodness, he fucked up his bike. Oh, little oh, Anton, God. you suck at riding a bicycle. Here, maybe eat you up. Can maybe this will make you better at balance. This is some balance food where you can learn how to get some fucking balance. As as much crap as I was given this one moment earlier, I do love how it emphasizes what nostalgia can do to even someone like Ego. I think it's on point well, with that. I think I think there's a lot to be drawn from this. Um, one of the bigger things for me, we were talking about it when we watched it, was um, it's almost like it's appealing to why do we all get invested in art anyway? And it's like, it's it's this wonderful experience of making you feel, and um, most of the time, better or more positive in some way, but uh, development or moving forward. Obviously, in this case, it's he felt like crap, and his mum takes care of him and makes him some of his favorite food. Like, it's it's not just the food, I think, it's also the the environment, the, the nature food. of this. Yeah, it's yeah. A, it's an experience that he values incredibly, and the, the food is taking him back to it, which is, is wonderful. Um, so is that what you were going to say? Hmm? You, you cut, cut out. out. You, you cut you, out. When you yeah. said ex when you were saying the word experience, you cut out. Oh shit! I don't know. Uh, luckily, it's caught on my end because I'm recording locally, but I can't oh, okay. remember where I was. Basically, I was just saying that there's a couple of there's a lot of things happening at once, and that it, it to me it's representative of like why we all enjoy experience in general. Like it, it can appeal to that as well as more specifically like nostalgia or um, you know reminding ego of uh, why he became what he is. You know how he got to where he was 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 a very very almost wholesome and and, and uh, loving uh, beginning. Yes, and he's, and he's maybe gone too far, right? Like that's part of what he's realizing. Absolutely, experience things. There's a rant in me that I will eventually put in a video, but people need to experience things. 
Go out and do it. Stay in. <laughs> so I just said, Mola, what if he was served yeah. ratatouille at the same it's... time his dad beat him? <laughs> <laughs> well, Eat your shitty ratatouille. He'd fucking yeah hit that plate off the table. His and... drunk alcoholic father comes in and beats his mother and him as he tries to choke down the ratatouille. <laughs> he'd eat it and then he'd say, "You know, this is really good ratatouille, but I think I'm gonna head home. <laughs> I'm not feeling so good." Do you, do you want to meet the chef? That, it's like, fuck right. no. A funny, <laughs> a funny thing that occurred to me was, like, I'm not actually, I don't think this, I don't, I'm not hung up on this, but, like, uh, if uh, Remy's food is actually good, or it just reminded him of his mother's cooking, which might be shit. I mean, maybe, maybe the food <laughs> wasn't good that her mother... That his mother was making, you know? If his and it's mother just like, was a really shit he's, cook, maybe. But he's, <laughs> yeah, but he's so so overwhelmed by nostalgia that he perceives it as good because it reminds it it reminds him of his mother, you know. Oh. Like I mean, I don't think that. I think you know it, it was Remy is a good cook and it was tasty. What? <laughs> Someone got his well, ratatouille I... time with a fist, as if he always beats him whatever ratatouille. Is made. <laughs> <laughs> I I I don't think the the moment in itself really matters whether or not it's quote unquote good food it's the fact that it was a different experience that reminded him of something my like take it, on it was that it, it, feel. the food was made with such love and care just like his mother made it like that's what reminded him of it i figured that's what yeah. it was and that that both of the times it was good that his mom actually made good food and that probably was what kicked off his love for cooking along with where it came from you know the fact that it was made with care and then that, that this is a really great meal that, that that is a good point. It's not just that it's something his mother made for him. It's like he was in pain, and his mother saw that and said, "I want to make him feel better by making something that's good, and I'm gonna make it really carefully." Yeah, yeah there's definitely that element to it. Well, like I said, the power of nostalgia. Like, how many things have you seen, listened to, whatever that just takes you back to a time where you were more innocent or still yeah, when you, in a great place in your life? When you see Vader pop up on like a TV show, and then you have to beat that part of you into submission so that you don't end up praising something that's fucking hollow. That's another aspect <laughs> this film was probably not going to touch. Like, <laughs> why would it go to you do that? So much for the pen being mightier than the sword, eh? Yeah. He's keeping his book inside. Remy's food transports Anton back in time to a memory of him as a, a world child. world between worlds! <laughs> but, hey, Rag, thank God he didn't say literally transported him back in time. <laughs> I just feel like that would Literally have... transported him <laughs> through time. Remy's food opened up a portal through hey, time. That would be a different movie. It cut back, cuts back to the restaurant, he's just gone. Where's Anton? <laughs> Yeah, well, as, as Chad was, pointing out, uh, Anton Vaded in this scene, he did. The last time I saw a time portal in Paris was in Bioshock Infinite. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that movie, uh, that game sucks. <laughs> I wonder if you say that movie sucks is indicative of how you hate the mechanics. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> the, it's barely a game. The most bog standard. Yeah. Lame ass first person shooter imaginable, but luckily it's wrapped in a shit story. <laughs> so luckily. it kind of distracts you from the bland, mediocre combat. Being served comfort food by his mother after coming back home in pain and sadness. This moment in suggests that sadness. this is the first time Anton fell in love with food and is part of why he became a food critic later in life as an adult. So as to further what? experience... No, it, is that what it's saying? That's the first time he fell in love with food? Maybe. It could be, but it's like it's, it's not a moment anyway. Explicit. It's I'm, just I'm a, fine with that interpretation. That he has. Really, that's interesting. I don't... I, th I thought it just goes back to a memory of uh, he did something his mom would make for him when he was feeling down. And so it brings him back to, you know, to that. It's the nostalgia of it. I never would have interpreted that that was the moment he fell in love with food. It's, well, um, I believe somebody was arguing this against me earlier, and it's like he says that he loves food, and this scene food. kind of emphasizes that, that 
food has food has influenced him since his early days and this is a representation of it it might not be this exact moment it's the first time but it's a representation of how food has affected his life yeah obviously showing us what food is to him or what it can be the joys of eating good food and discovering new ways that this could be achieved. In my view, this is something Anton has forgotten, as over the years he has forgotten what it's like to have this feeling, to fall in love with good food. When we are first introduced to Anton, he was painted as this critic who has spent so much of his adult life tasting and reviewing Mahler. terrible monsters. In his office, he literally I is painted as a critic. Have you forgotten hey, what it's like to fall hey. in love with good Star Wars? This is, it's funny, I feel like a lot of people might try and apply it to me, but the thing is, like, we spend so much time praising media, we get in trouble for it sometimes. Remember fucking Lost of Us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember Lost of Us. Obviously Andor. Andor's really good. Andor's yeah. really good. Well, yeah, we like to praise things that are good, so... Yeah. <laughs> like, it's but, nice to see some... Uh, it's nice to see good what things. I'm saying is, like, we famously get in trouble for saying things are good, so how can we be the people that never say anything's good, you know? Like, this is what I mean. It doesn't apply to us, but a lot of people would like to. They'd be like, you're just like Anton. It's like, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's us. We're just like Anton. He's a little... Would you, guys like, say that, like... would you guys say that we're living in an era of shit media? Or do you think that's uh By comparison to other eras, cynical way. Uh, sure. It would, there would be so much yeah. to develop, but I'm happy with that as a broad statement. But I feel like most people would be like, oh, you're over-exaggerating. I'd be like, eh, I don't think like... so. I feel like there's been a massive downgrade in media bigger than we've had in I think so past, too. Uh, yeah, I think so. Decades. I would agree. This, this is the thing. Um, we went over this on the YMS episode. If you take it from a perspective, um, you'd be like, you're just talking about Star Wars. Like, okay, fine. But I'm also talking about Marvel. It's like, yeah, okay, Marvel and Star Wars. Like, okay, Marvel, Star Wars, and Indiana Jones. Like, okay, Marvel, Star Wars, and Indiana Jones. And it's like, okay, but if we're talking strict downgrades, it's like Willow as well. It's like, yeah, fine, throw, throw Willow into Star Trek. It's Jurassic like, World. Fine, throw Star Trek in. Jurassic is a franchise. Fine, throw that in. Predator. It's like, fine, throw that in. Alien. Fine, throw that in. Uh, Terminator, fine, throw that in. Like, unprecedentedly horrific additions to each of these oh, franchises. No. Mahler, Jurassic what? You cut out. No, that's what I mean, like, because it's World and Park and, you know, Jurassic is the easier way to say. Uh, I'm, the... I, I mean, you, it, that's fine. No, I, I we, thought in case you were confused, I don't know, I don't know if you were, I'm sorry. We, we had another dip, that was the thing. We had another like, dip, you went, you went silent there it's, it was swallowed up by the void luckily i was being repetitive you know what my point was right wow. like i was just getting <laughs> yeah, to I know. You, I, you'll label I like 50 feeling, fucking yeah. franchises and then finally they might say hmm i guess it isn't a great time for mainstream high budget franchise media and you're like fine fine <laughs> like i uh, uh i'm obviously not consume. talking about all of the indie circuit i don't i haven't seen all of it i don't know how it compares to other eras i'm just talking about the most influential and watched stories in the form of film a lot of indie movies suck too a lot of indie movies do suck <gasps> they suck really hard um they so yeah in their own special way take all of that i'm happy to broadly say we are in a shitty time for media compared to others for new Luckily, me, uh, Fringy and Rags, and I assume everyone else here, regularly dips into old classics and relives Hooray! a lot of great shit. I oh, keep yeah. going back to it, but there's plenty we could go back to, but um, it was really neat to watch Anastasia and get a complete refresh and have a bit of nostalgia watching it and also be like, holy shit, this film is really fucking good. Yeah. Anastasia is great. Obviously, Ratatouille is really Ratatouille, good. Ratatouille, really good, yeah. So, you know, um, that's another thing I feel like uh, the comparison breaks with Anton, too, is that uh, we regularly go back and talk about and reference uh, great things that, you know, go from being very old to not that old at all. The annoying I part is you have to wonder if you're a part of that group of people who just says everything I liked as a kid was better. And you, you have to try and be objective with it. It's like, um, no, no, things now suck. Because, uh, yeah, I think that's a, another intuitive stance, but the, when you think about it, when I say, I don't know if you guys are the same, when I say everything when I was a kid was better, I am of course referring to stuff like Lord of the Rings, or whatever have you of my era, but I'm also remembering I watched the original trilogy when I was a kid, which is not my era. You know what I mean? Like, you know, and I of course have praise for that, and it's like, okay, that goes back to someone else's era, blah blah blah. It's like, yeah, a lot of films when I was younger, I had the benefit of the pick of the litter from previous eras, and I was living in an era that was bringing out some regularly good shit. I was on, um, I can't remember, yeah, it was Mel's stream, right? We were talking about what the best year for film might be, um, 99 was one of the suggestions. It's like, that's not 
for no reason. Like, uh, you know, the 90s and um, there are other reasons. Like, there's lots to celebrate. But the problem is a lot of people are like, what is to celebrate for film in the 2010s to 2020s? And it's not to say there's nothing. It's to say the list is a lot shorter uh, compared to other decades. That's all. A lot of the audience uh, and even the defenders of the new installments will also recognize that there. So Jurassic World Dominion, when that came out, I had a lot of people in the comments saying, it's just a blockbuster, it's not supposed to make sense. Mm. And you reply, well, okay, just simple comparison's sake, which do you think is better, Jurassic Park or Jurassic World Dominion? Most of them would say Jurassic Park, and then you say, well, why? And they say, well, uh, well because um, it, make, it made a lot more sense. That's now, one that of the 90s, things, anyway. boy, and the thing about... Jurassic Park as well that I find so great is that it's not only an incredibly tight script, incredible effects, and great performances, and a, and a wonderful story. It's a film that sits in a, in a in a sort of section that not a great amount get into of being known for like awe. Like when audiences saw it, they were like, "Whoa!" Mm -hmm. Really hard yep. to get that. <laughs> like that's that's something that's tough, and yeah. you did it. Um, you know, and 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 as like look at Jurassic as a franchise now. Look at it now. Yeah. Isn't it amazing? Nobody, Working like, Dominion, <laughs> fire locusts, that's all I know. Fire locusts <laughs> attack everybody. What does this have um, to do with dinosaurs? <laughs> <laughs> I recently rewatched a film called The Secret of Nim, which is uh, one of Don Bluth's movies. You might know him from, uh, like, Land Before Time, American yeah. Tale. Mm -hmm. uh, the animation is on another level. It's just excellent. And uh, I remember I was watching uh, the behind the scenes, behind the scenes featurette after the movie, and he was just talking about like we have to maintain this quality of animation, otherwise it becomes stiff and robotic and soulless. And I'm exactly what ninety nine percent of animation has become today. It was so. Oh yeah, dude. The like, um, the quote unquote adult animated comedies that you get on like Netflix and stuff for animation is so sad. Yeah, like, well, you don't like yeah they're all they're all shit. You don't I like would say her. that's true for CGI and adult animation. Kid animation, though, still seems to be quality. Uh, Except for that Wish movie, a lot of people are saying that doesn't look good. Well, it's not out yet, I guess, but it looks pretty like I don't know, not very interesting. <laughs> I mean, there's cartoons made nowadays that you know are funny and have some good writing, but just like the animation alone, the the Don. Bluth movies it was it was just like amazing like the sheer amount of skill involved it was just amazing I mean, and I, I would just say I don't that, see uh, that skill anymore in any nowadays in, in theatrical animated films uh well most of them yeah I I, I mean I I, I, I would uh, I would say that I hyper disagree obviously I think Don Bluth yeah like he's he's a he's a fantastic animator there's a lot of great stuff happening in animation in terms of the animation side and, especially if you're talking about theatrical films well like, i'm talking uh, about like 2d animation as well like 3d oh, is a oh, different thing oh uh, right. well, well yeah there's, there's not a lot of theatrical 2d animated films anymore yeah they just, oh, there's just uh, none re yeah. being released so um how what year are you thinking about john like how many years to now are you thinking uh i guess like the 80s no, 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 sorry, I mean, in terms of you're saying, like, uh, we're not doing good right now, because, like, uh, have you seen Wolf Walkers? That'd be one of the more recent, quote-unquote, 2D animated yeah, ones, right? Animated oh, films, I, I, yeah. I, I haven't heard of that. Is that, you is should, that a film? A high recommendation, yes. yeah. It's, uh, you should watch it. It's really good. I'm trying okay. to think of other 2 No, I, I think there's some fantastic 3D stuff that's been... Oh, sorry, yeah, because right that was what I was like getting traditional 2D animation. animation. Yeah. There's so much emotion and soul in that work and it's that's just well, yeah, gone now feels a like. lot of people would argue we're actually in a bit of a maybe a, a lower level renaissance for um animation right now because it's getting a lot more attention like you got puss in boots and um spider verse yeah they're they're uh incredible animated films oh totally agree yeah, yeah. just making sure okay <laughs> like, yeah. same page <laughs> i mean so like I, I don't i'm not resistant to like computers playing mm -hmm. a role in like animated film. I mean, Pixar um, fully you, um, embraced that technology and like, did you see Arcane? Like, great for that. No, I haven't seen that yet. Oh, I know you guys um, talk highly of it. Yeah. Easy recommendation. Go for check it. Check it out. Yes. Okay. I'll Agreed. check it out. 
recipes from so-called chefs instead of discovering and reviewing good food that he can actually fall in love with. He has spent so much time experiencing bad food that he has thrived off negative criticism and has completely forgotten that original moment he shared as a child and maybe forgotten part of why he became a food critic in the first place. Until, of course, Remy brings him back. Who cooks the ratatouille? I demand to know! <laughs> um, yeah, just pausing oh my goodness. for the sake uh, of flea We're protection. just marveling at uh, what we're looking at right now, because, boy... Also, wow, yeah, now I, I, I did check it. I know why you asked uh, whether or not we do who was voicing that character for you, because I never would have yeah. fucking guessed, ever. <laughs> yeah. Who? Fucking Ash from good old Alien. Or uh, you may know him as Bilbo from Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. I think, what, are the, what are his most famous roles other than those? Black Panther? <laughs> Wait, what? Oh, sorry. You said Bilbo. <laughs> I thought from Bilbo. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I was picturing Ian Holm as Black sorry, Panther. <laughs> <laughs> Just showed my credentials. Cancel Shady. Get him out of here. Kick him. <laughs> <laughs> However, the final test comes after Anton finishes his meal and asks the waiter to see the chef that made it. But now the critic has to wait and wait. He does. And after all the restaurant patrons leave, we finally get the face to face showdown between the critic and artist where Anton and Remy look at each other eye to eye. This is their first face to face confrontation. To me, this scene is about Anton first checking that no one is pulling his leg, but secondly, also a moment where he is scrutinizing as to whether Remy is a true artist by staring him down face to face to see if either he flinches or backs down or scurries away. It's a symbolic representation of Critic now assessing the artist themselves after assessing their artwork because to Anton the two are intertwined and they must be. Part of true great art has a part of the true great artist and he is searching to confirm that this is the case. But as he finishes he doesn't say a word and simply leaves. Then the next day his review comes out and it says it all. In many ways, the work of a critic is easy. This is going to take a lot of pausing, but we'll try and play the whole scene, of course. Yeah. Because uh, I imagine that he's probably going to play the entire thing, which is like, what, like 20, 30 seconds? Uh, oh, I think it's longer than that. If, yeah. If yeah. Talking I mean, the whole, he's, the whole he's quite generous with letting the scenes play out, yeah. We risk very little, yet enjoy a position over those who offer up their work and their selves to our judgment. See, so something I'm, I really want to resist being so overly critical of Ratatouille. How hey. ironic! But um, do you do you never think that there is maybe artists out there who do low risk and low creativity artworks, ones that don't give a fuck at all about what anyone thinks, not because they want to create, but because they want to maybe make money or that they have to satisfy a particular like contractual thing or people who just put shit out to put shit out, like. Let's not fucking joke around here. It's been said by a lot of people. Book of Boba Fett is a meme. Like, that TV show was dumb as fuck. <laughs> it was produced so quickly and without care, with no, like, artistic integrity for basically anybody. Uh, I, you know, I'm not trying to be too mean to a lot of the people who put a lot of effort into, like, sets or um, even, like, Tamura Morrison, who was clearly sad about his role in that. I'm, of course, talking about, like, the overall nature of the creation of that thing. It, it, was, it was designed to keep people busy. Um... Yeah, until, until, Mando, until the next thing. Yeah, which is also uh, the same thing. Mando season three has got the exact same fucking problem. Um, these are like mm -hmm. soulless creations that are pumped out in order to keep people busy. Can I not say those things are low risk or no risk at all in terms of like they're designed to not be risky? They're designed to hopefully satisfy and just be pushed out. And in the same vein, they completely lack creativity. Meanwhile, there are people out there, not necessarily excluding anyone in this call right now, who've created videos that are far more artistic, that are, you know, premised on cr criticizing those seasons. And so, this is what I mean, I've kind of gone over it before, but it's just a perspective I feel like is lacking from Atatui. Um, and, uh, I, I may this. say so, I think this is like one of the worst scenes in the movie, because I, I really take issue with a lot of the things he and the writer are concluding about criticism here especially the idea that criticism critics take no risks 
they don't put their, their heart and soul and personality into their work. Meanwhile, all artists do. All artists are bearing their soul for the critic who just says, yeah, I don't like it. It's like, that's an extremely It reminds me of biased... when Chris Stuckman got enlightened and adopted a, premise, a, a perspective similar to this and said, <laughs> evolved, uh, we have yeah. an artist who works countless days, months, whatever, to work on this in incredible piece of work, and then we go and watch it, and then spend 30 minutes talking about it, and we pretend like we're like on the same level. It's like, what like, the fuck? We. We. <laughs> yeah, like, it's a uh, interesting spend word. 30 minutes. Me in your, yeah. 30 minutes. Yeah, uh, and it's like, no wonder you feel so parasitic at that point. Of course. <laughs> like, but, you know, like... Well, a, I, I, it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's just, just it's just I'm, beyond I'm, frustrating I'm, it's like you don't even you don't even aware you chris someone should be aware more than most of the scope of the content of review he's um had regular interactions as far as i'm aware with yms who's you know the lion king review you really gonna call that like a oh that's just a parasitic thing you threw together like and, and <laughs> which like people don't have that much they don't care that much about it like it's not that valuable to them yeah, I, like, uh, yeah, this is it's lacking. That's I mean, what are you saying about your YouTube channel? If if you like, oh, subscribe well, to that, notion, you know, he was the primary yeah. example, and so yes, uh, it should have been a lot to take away from that. If not limited to the fact that he feels uh, he's probably a bit of imposter syndrome, like how am I here when all I've done is this? Mm, he thinks well, very little that's... of his craft and what he does, which is a fucking shame. Yeah, and it's an opportunity to improve it, but the thing is, Chris Duckman, like many, treat YouTube as a stepping stone. They're like, now I can yeah. use this yeah, to YouTube prompt my actual just career. Some little thing, and then I'll go on and make a movie. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I agree about this scene. Like, I have a few problems with this scene. I mean, like, I don't think it's a terrible scene, but like, it's one of this. Like, out of a movie with a lot of great scenes, is definitely one of the weakest. Like. I don't I like how he speaks so reductively of criticism. Well, and it's presented you know, as he, very enlightened. He being, mm -hmm. Yeah, and like I don't believe he would have that conclusion about criticism. Him being a critic for so long, and it runs against the events of the movie because he loses his job in the end. But he yeah. says like cr critics don't r risk anything. Like he risks well, yeah, but, his whole but, career. But, 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 but the the film would say that the risk was what he said was the risk, which is the yeah. The one of the, nerd. the one thing I'll try and give benefit is the start of this speech. He says in many ways, and yes. then the rest of it. And so you could yeah. argue there's room yeah. for him to say no. There are some ways in which risks are taken, and then the film. Yeah, like the risk, the risk that he takes with the review of saying that a yeah. rat cooked a really good meal. <laughs> Yeah. Wait, uh, was, it, was it that, or was it that he said it was a really good meal, and then they got exposed as having and rats then they in the found kitchen? Out that they had yeah. rats in the kitchen. Yeah. But then it's like, hey, he had his little bistro that he opened up with a uh, with Remy. A small I wonder if yeah. I wonder if Remy's got a equity in that, in that business. Mola, most food critics don't make videos. Anton doesn't have a YouTube channel, and as such, will rarely receive critique of his articles. We don't know I, I, well, sorry, well, thank, sorry, thank you so, so much point. for telling me things I already knew. Good stuff. <laughs> does he? Does Anton Ego have a Twitch channel? Where he <laughs> yes. Because I'd watch that. He's I'd probably playing the Ratatouille, the official video game. There probably was one. Ooh, right? yeah. nice. Yeah, it's a bunch hey. of like cooking mini games and competitions. I can't remember. I think I had Ratatouille for Nintendo DS. Y'all uh, joking? But AI is on it. <laughs> <laughs> also, um. Some to then give a real answer instead of just making fun of you. Uh, the, the, there's a lot of craft in writing criti critique, like articles or forum Obviously. posts or anything. We went over this near the beginning. There's there's um, artistry to wording to written. Like, I, I can't believe I don't even have to make this argument. I think you know that a lot of a lot of well known and well regarded authors uh, wrote articles and critiques. Yeah. It's a really, really Edgar long, Allen proud tradition, that. actually, in, in English literature of literary criticism of articles in the form of newspaper responses. Like, some of the yep. greatest writers' feuds ever have taken place in the letters pages of, say, The Guardian. Like, Salman Rushdie against um, uh, Jean Le Carre, for example. Like, it, there, there's a huge amount of criticism that predates the dawn of, of YouTube. Just because he doesn't have a YouTube channel doesn't mean he's not getting read and criticized. Well, no, no, criticism of critics only started with YouTube. It only yeah. started in 2005. <laughs> well, and, and it's so reductive. It's like, do you really think Ratatouille is strictly about the food industry? Uh, uh, what is not, a, it can't be applied to anything else. Like, sure. Yep. Dare I say it's more about movie criticism? Oh my God. You know what I mean? Well, this video like, is, for sure. 
No, I mean like this scene in in Ratatouille, like the the writer's voice is shining through. So yeah, you can't you know, deny the fact would, that we're watching yeah. a film presenting the ideas about you know the menu. I I remember talking to Drinker about it, and I was like, I really feel like this is more about movies than it is about food. But um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's fair. I think he said it's like more so about art broadly, and I'd be like, yeah, that's totally fair. Uh, as is this, but you know, you can you can definitely see like it leaning toward a particular direction. And being well, you tend to write what you know. Yeah. And, it, and it, it, it wouldn't, you know, it doesn't take away from the film at all to have the people who created yeah. the film be like, you know what, I fucking hate, like, asshole critics. Like, yeah, okay, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I've I've on fine. negative criticism, which is fun to write and to read. But the bitter truth we critics must face is that in the grand scheme of things, the average piece of junk is probably yeah, more meaningful than our movie. criticism You're on designating top of the itself. copyright stuff, right? Hmm? You're on top of the copyright stuff, right? That's pretty yeah. long. I'm, I'm, just... I'm risking it, but I wanted that quote said in full for people. All right, I gotcha. Yeah. All right, I just just making sure you go with it. I'll, we I'll, might, I'll, I might just um, swallow it in terms of they, they get the revenue, because I really want these points to be clear. Like, Because uh, Ratatouille is a really fucking good film. But like it, that's one of the most troublesome quotes in all of his speech. He says like it's it's very likely the average piece of junk is more meaningful than our criticism of it. It's like wow. Speak for it's, yourself, uh, my dude. Exactly. So that is also like the, well, the average piece of junk probably owes far more to criticism than the film gives it credit for, or even most authors and writers and, and artists give it credit for. If you look back at the sort of the tradition of or the development of the tradition of like English language, English art forms, English novels, which feeds into English films. That owes a huge amount to critics like F.R. Leavis, for example, in the 20th century, or Harold Bloom in the 21st century. Like, critics who do their job really well are not just sitting there shitting on something. They are trying to collate the best examples of the best kinds of art form, which then go on to influence huge numbers of artists who want to find out what the best techniques are, where they can be found, what the mm -hmm. best examples of their craft happen to be. Like, critics, if they do their job well, are incredibly important in the development of art. They're not just like, randomly shitting on pieces of junk, which is actually more valuable than their produce. It's um, uniquely frustrating, too, to hear this from Anton, who should, as Cap mentioned just now, probably be the character in the whole movie to have the best insight into the value of criticism. Even though he's, yeah. you know, quote-unquote, lost his way, he should be able to provide insight on, like, well, wait, I know it may come across as though I'm just, like, this fucking grim reaper of reviews, but the, there is a great value here in terms of, like, he would be able to cite, like, people's careers that he's created, Yep. He's been doing this for a yep. long time, um, mm -hmm. and it's it's just a little bit lame that like we're, we're not acknowledging that, nor are we acknowledging uh, the creative works that he would have created in general. He the fact that he describes it as yeah, it's fun to write and read like trashing something. It's like why are you saying that? Like there's nothing else to it. Yeah, he says it kind of dismissively, and it's like no, that's worthwhile in and of itself. The well, fact the statement that it's also fun. fails on a bit of go no. Go for it. Go ahead. I was going to say, the statement also fails on a bit of a logical level because he's criticizing criticism and saying that uh, junk is probably better than criticism. Well, if you're criticizing criticism by doing that, the criticism becomes the junk you're talking about. And yeah, that doesn't work. That's interesting as a point of view, yeah, because mm. what is being this scene is supposed to be meaningful, but it's him writing a review. Hmm, interesting. But there are times when a critic truly risks something, and that is in the discovery and defense of the new. You see? So we were, see. We were almost there, because he's like, they do risk, and then he says it's basically only in the discovery of the new and the defense of it. And it's like, well, no. You can take Half risks in all aspects. Discovery, yeah. defense, or praise of the good or the bad or the neutral. It, it exists everywhere. It's and I mean, just... if, if, you know, talking about the whole idea of, of risk of, of criticism, you put, you make like a review of a film and you put up on the internet, you're going to fucking get criticism. Yeah. Like invariably, no matter what, whether it's positive or negative. Yeah, because reviews can be it. good or bad. Well, yeah, by the mm -hmm. way, Boy, uh, will people uh, let you know. Uh, as someone just mentioned in the chat, it's like, it was a huge fucking risk whether or not you knew what uh, the John, fucking Ebert said that games aren't art. That is a uh, risky yeah, fucking a thing to say. That was a stupid thing to say. Yeah. It's, uh, but... Well, it, it's undeniably had a huge influence on a lot of what people think of him in terms of his uh, point of view on art. Um, yeah, that's real awkward, isn't it? <laughs> the world is often unkind to new talent. 
new creations. The world is often unkind to critics. <laughs> what, what, what do we have to take away from that? Is that okay? Is it okay to be cry. mean to the, They're gonna cry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're gonna cry? You're gonna uh, cry? Well, I was gonna yeah, say, like, cow. is it... Uh, uh, equally, is it bad to be mean to aspiring new artists? Like, well, it depends, right? Like, what if the new aspiring artist is really shit and soulless and just trying to make it because they want to make it? You know what I mean? Like, they, they don't want to create things on the same level as Steven Spielberg. They want to be Steven Spielberg. And you're like, wait, but that, what do you mean? It's like, I just want to, I just want to have that acclaim. I want people to say I'm great. It's like, oh. We've once again moved back to criticizing the critics' work. If the world is often unkind to critics, okay, why? Well, because they're a critic. Well, what's there to criticize? It's, mm. uh, the logic, <laughs> it keeps looping back. It does. Uh, and that's because of what you said right at the beginning. Uh, criticism is an art form. And so if you, if you try to put criticism as op opposed to the art forms, then it's like, well, wait, but everything you're saying about the art forms, it just it overlaps onto criticism. So it just reflects every time. Ugh. The new needs friends. Last night I experienced something new. You know what's funny? Because now I'm just thinking about how it keeps reflecting. It's like criticism and critics need friends. They need other critics slash, uh, you know, audience members to let other people know. What if a critic has a particularly insightful and crazy new idea about how to view something, but they've got no viewers or engagement? Like, should it not be a good thing that people look for them and find them and then signal boost them? Maybe, maybe not. It's like this all it's all reflective. Every single thing he says about um, cooking or artwork would apply equally to the artists in the realm of criticism. Also, I just don't mm -hmm. think we have like a huge dearth of people who are like in support of new things that push the boundaries. There's like, like I don't know, half the population that's just kind of temperamentally inclined towards like new and novel and original things anyway, like you know there are people who are like like the things they're familiar with and there's people who are always seeking out new experiences and stuff like well, that i don't think it's a like we, we have a problem in that regard i think people are always going to be in in some percentage of the population just inclined and there are people who like worship at the feet of anything that's new and subversive whether it's any good or not you know what i mean like there are people who are always looking for new things already i don't see it well as there's that, that but have you noticed how we've all seemingly gone along with it? Who the hell decided that uh, new and inventive and creative beats out old and known but really well executed? I don't Creator remember agreeing to that contract. Why, why shouldn't we be searching for people who do what we've seen before? For example, just tell a simple hero's journey story, but they do it excellently with a new coat of paint. Does that not count as I, new? I've seen that already. Yeah, if you were it's like, not, I'm too familiar with this, like, doing I, the same thing what will be the point again, right? in signal boosting someone who can do things I've seen before but well? And it's like, I don't know, man, because that's celebratory. I don't, I don't understand. An extraordinary meal from a singularly unexpected source. To say that both the meal and its maker have challenged my preconceptions about fine cooking is a gross understatement. Gross, then, like a rat. And then this <laughs> this sentiment, which fe feels like a different point, uh, which is just, yeah, you should never, you know, a piece of artwork coming from a source you didn't expect shouldn't make it so the art is worse. I guess, uh, yeah. and, you know, you can be surprised. Like, someone you think is crap can make something really good, or vice versa. And that's the other thing. <laughs> Do you think the movie... I feel like the movie never takes the negative uh, side of all of these points, which would be like, yeah, always be ready for artists you trust to make shit. That is the reverse point being made here. <laughs> yeah. Which is fair, too. Yes, a lot of artists you think are great can make terrible shit. Never. Indeed they can. Yeah. Especially all the artists I like make good stuff. Especially if they get nothing but like praise, them. and then they exactly. they get a big head, and it's like, well, everything I should is try anymore, right? So they have rocked me to my core. Anton's speech explains why he felt reborn when he tasted Remy's food, because it reminded him of what it was like to finally taste truly good food again. 
but more importantly, a lesson of how we should act as a food critic. This lesson reinvigorates everything about Anton and shakes him to his core because he has found or perhaps refound the purpose of being a food critic, which isn't just about reviewing good food and sharing that knowledge with others, but to discover unconventional places. See, that's included in the first part. When you share good food with people for being good, presumably that includes old and new. I don't know why it wouldn't. It almost feels like you're disconnecting these two points. It's like um, the point you should just be focusing on is that the film would therefore, from his point of view, be about how you need to look for unconventional sources of uh, the art form that you enjoy. Which is a point. Mm -hmm. It's fine. Uh, it's just yep. uh, it's yep. weird to say that that stands as uh, an addition to pointing out what is good and bad when a lot of people who point out what is good and bad already incorporate that as part of pointing out what is good and bad. Where good food can come from and to risk going against the grain in recommending something new and different from an equally unconventional artist. A Wait. piece of art or a disparaged... Hold on. Wait. Uh, I, I might have misheard him, but uh, everyone was liking Gusto's at that point. He didn't recommend the rat, though, did he? He recommended the food. He, they it, make a great Gusto's, rat. Gusto's, the food. restaurant. Yeah, what, what I'm saying is um, you can argue he took a risk in... But this was before that the place was exposed, right? Yeah. To, to, just to lay it out, just in case, because this is how I remember the film going, is that he eats the food, finds out it was made by a rat... He quote unquote takes the risk, which I'm now reformatting in my head. He reviewed the place very positively and said the chef was one of the best in Paris. He didn't say the rat, the rat chef, the rats in the kitchen. He didn't mention any of that. He just said the chef was good. And then the place got exposed for having rats, which is not something um, Anton knew would happen. And then he lost his uh, respect and reputation because he had recommended food made in a kitchen where it was infested with rats. So, is it fair to say? Because this is this is new thoughts I'm having. He didn't actually take any risks, really. I don't think um, that, really. honestly, none more inherent than the idea of just reviewing something positively in general. in general. He definitely wasn't going against the grain. That's all I can say. Because the whole thing was the restaurant was doing well again, just like it was in the past, and this was his chance to shut it down again if he didn't approve. But he did approve, just like everyone else. Yeah, I actually, I think you're right. I don't, not only do I not think it's a risk, he's, he's kind of going with the flow. Well, I think in writing that review, he probably figured, like, the restaurant is going to be exposed eventually for what's going on. Because, like, you can only keep a lid on that for so long, like, a, a kitchen full of mice. That, you can argue, is like... a risk, yeah. But um, I think that the risk people tend to see it as is that he promoted rats. Um Sure. When in the review he's explicitly promoting a chef, which is a lot safer. If he had said like this food is made by rats and it's fucking I know, great, you'll find it hard to believe. But I swear to God, it's actually really good. Yeah. Like, even if that's true, everyone else did it before him. Like there was a critic before him in that restaurant. You're not everyone wrong. Everyone yeah, was like, already doing that. There would still be a lot of references to how like, well, everybody's been enjoying it so much. It's gotten so much press. That's why Anton's even here. Yeah, yeah, so he didn't I, I, go out of his way to find some little hole in the wall that actually has a really, really good ratatouille. Uh, to your point, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's a line in the review where he says, like, I met the chef. You know, it's always like, I, I, the, the chef is the finest in, in talking about him in a way, where, you know, he's just behind the scenes the whole time. Like, I don't know what he looks well, like. He's deliberately broad dude. because Anton knows what would happen if he explicitly described him as a fucking rat. <laughs> like, right. You'd be like, wait, yeah. what? That would have been the risk, yeah. It would have been the risk, but then given the power he's displayed as having, wouldn't that actually have been more likely to lead to a good result than leaving people to find that out on their own? Yeah, uh, not only do I think that's true, but I also think it would tie in better as a risk. He's like, that's a huge yeah. thing for someone like Anton to do. To, in his review, say, a rat made my food and it was incredible and you should do it too. <laughs> Because that, that's just like, what the fuck? But he's got the power and influence to have more of an effect with that statement than most people in the world artist that goes against the status quo but that deserves to be valued and upheld to others as pure great art 
even if it comes from controversial circumstances or is controversial in itself. That is why I think Ratatouille is a great film, because it traverses even the simple story of a hero chasing their dream and fighting against all odds to achieve it, into becoming a story that holds a bigger lesson for all of us when it comes to criticism and being cynical towards something that is different. I'll say this, it prompts big lessons about criticism. I don't know that it concludes very in-depth ones. No, because um, he's not cynical about new things in the movie. Like That's not his issue. He's cynical. He thinks everything sucks, and then he finally has something good. He's not like, ugh, all new things are terrible. I like things the way well, they are. Well, that I never pursue new yeah. things. Yeah. That's I would say the movie, movie claims he's ignorant of the positive experiences of the new. I'm not sure they showed it well enough. I don't think so either. And that is, we must encourage the discovery of new things in life and be willing to risk something, perhaps even a part of ourselves, to defend those new things that we genuinely believe to be good and are of value to the world. See, I feel like he's describing integrity rather than searching for the new. He's describing integrity with a bias towards new and original and novel things and has no se seemingly no recognition for the opposite side of that. Coin. Yeah, because I'd love to ask him. It's like, well, don't you think it's important to also project the something mainstream and well known to be good is good if it's good? And if he said, well, most people already think it's good, so there's not much point to that. It's like, OK, so what if most people thought it was good and it was bad? Is it now very important for you to express that it's bad? Yeah, what's our game plan at that point? And is that more or less valuable than the new? I have a There's quick an example, um, kind of a deep cut, but there is a uh, Felix Mendelssohn, classical composer, uh, had some really great pieces. We remember many of them today, but at the time he was composing in a style that was kind of old fashioned. He was doing a sort of classical era Perfect. style when everyone else was doing romantic era classical music. Mm -hmm. And people at the time thought it was like, oh, this is cute, but it's not very good. It's not very artistic. It's not very creative. He's just doing the same old things again and again. That's what critics at the time said. But now we look at it and go, well, this is like a really good, you know, concerto or whatever. So like, what, what does it matter that it was kind of retro or whatever word you want to use? Like, is, is there value in a critic at the time going, actually, this is really good. I don't really care that it's oh, not. Oh, gosh, yeah. Right. Now you're making me realize really new. Oh, no, I'm going to say it. New is relative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -oh. yeah. I was thinking that for a while, but I was like, it was never relevant to what was going on. Because, yeah, like, you know, right. You could show someone who's been watching all of the new Star Wars stuff who, for whatever reason, hasn't seen A New Hope. And they could watch that and be like, holy fuck, that was incredible. And it'd be like, well, yeah, okay, but it's not new. It's like, well, it, but it serves the same function at that point. It may as well be. And it might inspire them to make something. You know what I mean? Like, it's like the old becomes the new in a lot of ways. And you mix and match and move on. And it's like, how do you know when something is, quote unquote, actually genuinely new? And, um, I mean, I'll, I'll go ahead and say it. Like, when, when, when I was watching Andor, I was kind of like, man, this is unusual and strange, and not in a bad way, like, could I could I say it's new in the context of everything that's been made for Star Wars in the past almost decade at this point? Like, maybe. Maybe I could, right? And then I should be defending that because it's new. He's like, well, no, because that's mainstream, and it comes from a company that's made plenty of Star Wars already. And it's like, so what is new? It has to it's be, like, like, indie? In a hundred or... years, whether it was yeah. fashionable at the time or not won't really matter. People will just look at it as its yeah, own um, thing. A lot of people would, would say one piece, as someone just mentioned, is like being prompt, uh, promoted and defended. Is that new? One of the things I noticed about it and was talking about was that the story structure is so well-traveled, but that it's executed really well. The paint job is crazy, in a good way. But that um, would that count as new? I don't know. And at this point, it's, it really is just down to the individual fucking reviewer's point of view. If you said, like, why don't you promote anything new in terms of artistic formats? And then they could reply, I do. We just disagree on what's new. Mm -hmm. everything that he said in the last uh like sentence or two if you replace the word new with old like it would still technically be true what's happening here at least in my opinion is that he's entered this video with a premise without stating the premise which is that we are biased against the new uh inherently i don't agree with that premise necessarily i've seen a lot of people who are biased against the old 
Uh, but because he's entered this video with that premise, but hasn't explained it, he's making statements like this where he's trying to defend the new when he could easily be defending the old with the exact same statement. Yes. I yeah. Because um, people are starting to give loads of really great examples in chat. And I was just thinking, you know, when you go from the practical effects over to start doing CG, there's a lot of things that are shocking in a great way. You see stuff that's like mind blowing, and that you know it would have the tagline like "This isn't possible with any other technology." And I'll just go to the Balrog, right? It's an easy one. It's just like, whoa, that's incredible. And a CG, 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 CG is cool. Um, all the fucking Mooma kill, right? Like an army of them. It's like, whoa, that's fucking amazing. But we're at an era now. We're seeing CGs boring the shit out of people, annoying them, and they're being so critical to the point where I've caught people saying stuff like, "Like CG sucks," like as a whole. It's like, holy shit. To the point where if someone watches Iron Man 1 and sees him clank with his suit and walking around with it as a physical prop, they would be like, whoa, that's fucking cool, look at that. It's like, that ain't new. That's old, but it's coming across as new. It's a uh, super interesting to think about, but it's like, yeah, this, this video isn't going to get anywhere near that. It's got a very limited perspective on how this all works, and it's kind of lame, I guess. Lame's a good word for it, yeah. No matter how controversial or unconventional they might be. By viewing Anton's own rebirth and transformation, this lesson implies the notion that we shouldn't fall into being overly cynical and constantly negative with our criticism, because like Anton, we might fall into the trap of forgetting what it was like to experience something good in our lives. Because as he hints towards, there is a lot of good out there. We just need to find it. In the past, I suppose I agree with that. In isolation, he didn't go hunt it down. He just yeah. Went he, to well, you could argue he did the complete opposite. This was getting praise, and he was annoyed by the fact that it was getting overpraised, and so he went to go and cut it down. Like it's the he complete like, opposite actually, of finding something quote unquote new. Yeah, at least this is the, the problem with the definition of new. <laughs> yeah. Aside, uh, his desk was facing the wall, in that big room where somebody approaches behind him. That's uh, yeah. symbolic of his attitude toward the world. He keeps his back to it. He's not interested. Oh, wow. Cynical. Deep. I have made no secret of my disdain for Chef Gusto's famous motto, anyone can cook, but I realize... I'm going to pause there. That's a good place to yep. pause between the two sides but of the court. I realize... La -la 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 Only oh, now do I truly understand what he meant. I'm going to pause again, because that yeah. seems like a natural break. Boobly boobly boo. Mm -hmm. La la. Dee -dee -dee. Oh my god, we're three and a half hours into the stream already. How did that happen? Oh my gosh, we're just having so much fun. All I want to do is just have a chat with Ratatouille. Oh, just by the way, I feel like this art. stream itself is meta, because um, we're primarily known by a lot of people who do not like us as basically like the Anton egos of the internet. And we are spending a whole episode talking about how great Ratatouille is. A film about finding, you know what I mean? Like, there's, there's layers there, there's meta there, there's art happening yeah. all over the place, everyone. Could we be accused of over-criticism? Could my view of Ratatouille be accused of... Nah, not. Yes. Never. Absolutely. <laughs> Dude, people probably come away from the stream being like, wow, they hated Ratatouille. Wow, unbelievable. <laughs> Especially that one guy. Not everyone can become a great artist. But a great artist can come from anywhere. That's it's actually a quote I really love. Uh, I feel, I yeah, feel like it's very agreeable because I it's, think it's uh, pretty pretty based. It's got a, an element to it of reality. It's a bit of edge. I like it. Yeah, because uh, I think that the more boring one would be anybody can do it, which is like maybe it's like hmm. Which it's funny because I kind of think that anybody can get really good at anything, but it feels like this speaks more to the notion that um. It's it's not well essentially what he said right that the great talent can come from anywhere, not necessarily that every single person could become like the greatest at any given thing. Well, yeah, and then if you wanted, like, if someone said like, oh, you could be like, well, well, you don't have to be. There, there could be a movie about that. You don't have to be the best at a thing. You don't have okay, to be hyper talented. A... There's well, another I mean, movie that goes into it that I really appreciate, which is uh, Monsters University. I know it's not a lot of people's favorites, but I absolutely love the message about it that Mike doesn't need to be scary. He's really good at knowing what is scary 
and that could push him to new places because nobody thinks about scaring like he does. The uh, um, quote is. I was, Go I was just gonna say really quick, the Monster University is like the only one that I remember thinking I was like I liked this of the sort of new era of sequelizing everything. You know, like Incredibles two I... is horrible. Um, Toy Story four is horrible. Uh, Finding Dory, as far as I'm aware, is horrible. I haven't seen it. And then what are the other ones? Aren't there loads? What of uh, uh, Toy Story four? No, I mentioned that one. Movie. Like legacy sequels, if you could call them that, where it's uh, it's well oh, beyond Cars three. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, uh, see, but uh, see. with 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 Monsters University, you know, there's the quote, "It's okay to be okay," which was a quote I really needed at the time because I was really struggling, and I had really never struggled in my life before. And then mm -hmm. at, immediately after that line is said, uh, Sully bursts it, or Mike says, "I'm okay, just being okay," and then Sully says, "You think you're just okay, but you did all of this other stuff. Like, yeah, you're not scary, but you are fearless." And then Dean just drives it home saying, you did something nobody else has done before. You surprised me. And uh, like the, the perspective that greatness can come from anything or anywhere uh, really lives with me to this day. And I, I love the movie for uh, bringing that out. All right. I'm I sorry. would say that's the real heart and soul of the movie. The stuff about criticism itself is kind of off to the side a little bit. It doesn't seem when it's be... undercooked. Yeah. <laughs> but shh. I mean, you look at this one with the idea, because uh, I, th I think it's, you know, like uh, Ling Linguini essentially being puppeted around into being something that he's not is tied into this theme. Yeah, it, yeah. It's like he's not going to be a great cook, but that's okay because he'll be a great waiter. He's, he's better elsewhere that that's kind of that you can see a lot more that this is like this is the core of the film. And it's a really, really excellent one. Difficult to imagine. The, the line anyone can cook, I think, is very cleverly implemented into this film. Because, like, you don't want to be too verbose with it, because it's like the title of Gusto's book. And, uh, but it, it gets, it encourages pe everybody to cook. Not everybody can cook. Like, even if you think you can't do it, like, give it a shot. Try making That's something. Right. And even That's if right. you fuck Buy up. Buy my book. <laughs> well, it, it, it is it is a cool thing about the line is because the easy straightforward read is yeah everybody can cook and it's like well no it's it's a little bit more complicated than that it's more sufficient and it, it like that the initial read the basic read is not the full read the full read is what you know anton says here a great cook can come from anywhere that's what it means by anyone can cook yeah and you, and you can sort of understand everybody's like different positions and t interpretations of it like uh remy has like on the roof when he realizes he's in Paris, I think, or he, he's on the roof of Stowe's watching all the chefs, and yeah. they talk about the line anyone can. He's like, well, yeah, anybody can. They should. But and yeah, like, it, it, it speaks to the notion of um that there are things that you are more inclined to do than other things, yeah. like that maybe you could spend a really long time pursuing this thing, but you're already kind of more naturally predisposed to this thing, and you can find value in that activity. Yeah. Um, you don't need to make yourself, you know, the, the point being that you don't have to force yourself to be something that you're not. Right. And no, I, and everyone I, I should I, learn how to cook. That's, <laughs> I, I think that. Well, every, everybody yeah. should, I think, should at least try, you know, see if yeah. they have. Maybe all their, their able first dish might not be yeah, good. Start with cook. microwaving some water in a cup. That's, uh, <laughs> there you go. Easy. We're and, cooking. Fancy. And then, and then with Anton, I could, I, by the fact what? that he would wait, later wait, wait, wait. come to the sorry, what? Mahler, did you say that because of what I said about the expend for I, I can't lie. I can't lie. <laughs> that was that was just it floating in my head. Yes. Okay, that's fair enough. Everyone, on, we John. talked about we talked about expend for bowls on Metal Stream yesterday. But mostly, yeah. but mostly we talked about Mortal Kombat. Yeah, it's so, <laughs> all right. I would check it out. Carry on. <laughs> Um, I buy the fact that Anton took time in coming to the conclusion of what Anton actually meant by it. Because, like, if he's getting bombarded by all this shit going around all the restaurants in Paris and everybody's bad or mediocre, he would see that line of on Gusto's book and be like, God, this is your fault. You're telling everybody anyone can cook and everybody fucking chef. And now we all have to eat this dog shit and I'm, I'm tired yeah. of it. And I blame you. And he sort of gets caught up in that resentment. And so I, I believe that, like, okay, now I see. 
he's sort of like taken himself out of that cynical perspective and he's kind of well, I believe that of... like he he had to work yeah. his way there you know uh, I don't I think, think that's just that. like bad yeah. writing or anything or he's stupid if, or whatever if someone said to me at this point in time anyone can make a Marvel movie I would have a hissy fit especially if it was somebody of uh, clearly anyone can make <laughs> clearly anyone can make a Marvel movie that's, that's pretty clear <laughs> any asshole can just make a Marvel movie I yeah. would be exactly like Remy. Well, yes, anyone can, but that doesn't mean anyone should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I really like that opening of the movie where they he's being interviewed on TV, Anton is. He has some really good line, I don't remember it word for word, where he's like, like, oh, I don't he says something about how he doesn't agree that everyone that anyone can cook because I actually care about cooking. It's so like salty and Anton is salty. He is. He's a salty. He's salty <laughs> Maybe a little the bit. Food puns. That's too. where the real uh, jokes are. Yeah. I wonder what this like column is called if it had like a name. You know. Yeah, you what, know how, like, what is yeah. his col- Oh, his column. Oh. Yeah, um, yeah. Like, his, what would it be called? What do you think it would uh, be called? Well, thankfully, he doesn't write in the travel section where it would be called an ego trip. But there if it was in the oh, food yeah. section, yeah, we do. Um, ooh, yeah. What? Uh, oh, what? A, food pers- like a, a new pers. Oh, yeah. What would it be called? Would it have something to do with perspective, or would it be? Yeah, some- probably. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good. Uh, well, that yeah, little Monica, I'm- the Grim Eater, that could be the title of it, I guess. <laughs> I don't know if he, he'd call himself that though. Like, I, I don't called. think he would. Call I never claimed that, that name. The press gave me that. Name. I have no idea why they call me that. Actually, I haven't been able. That to That name it is distasteful to me. Much like the food I've eaten. I am a critic. Oh damn! I did a I double am. joke. I wasn't actually aiming for the distasteful. But I, do you remember that from Saw? Any of you from our? I arc? do. Oh. Rags, do you remember? It's, I don't mind saying it here, it's just so fucking funny. It's when uh, Hoffman calls Jigsaw a murderer and then he's like, I find killing oh, yeah, distasteful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then there's like this, <laughs> it's like this six second gap and then yeah. he just goes, to me. Those movies are shit. You got that to look forward to, everybody. It's funny as fuck. More humble origins than those of the genius now cooking at Gusto's, who is, in this critic's opinion, nothing less than the finest chef in France. I will be... So, France. Those those words, I think... I might be looking way too into this, but uh, I think the words he used there were very important. He said, no less than the finest chef in France. Now, obviously, you could take that to mean he is the finest chef in France. That could also mean that he is of the same level as those chefs, as in compare, comparing him. Yeah. Ugh, I'm not yeah. saying this correctly. No, no, no I'm I, with know you. I, I don't mean, even I know what you mean. Yeah, I follow what you mean. He's, he's no less than the greatest chefs in France. Not necessarily right. the greatest, but he's up there with them. Nothing less. Well, because rats are lesser than humans, so yeah, yeah. he's like, acknowledging him. His racism. Yeah. It's Returning true. to Gusto soon, hungry for more. This film isn't just about food and of the intricate world of culinary criticism. It's about how we choose to criticize and judge everything. Movies, shows, music, to ideas, opinions, or people themselves. The cynicism experienced by Anton isn't just the reflection of the cynical criticism of food or media or of art, but also of cynical ways we are tempted towards by judging others, perhaps too often without knowing the full story of who they are and where they come from. I believe Anton's speech... I don't know that Anton, like... You know, like we're not considering where they're from or how they made that. There's like, well, isn't that not generally better? As in, like, um, you appreciate their artwork whether or not they're from a particular thing, whether well, or not they're... that is yeah. like the point that they're getting at. It doesn't matter that he's a rat, that like that doesn't matter. That's not a factor, that, that's not factoring into it. He thought it was great before he knew it was a rat, and even after he knew that a rat cooked it, he still thought it was great, yeah. That's meant to be deriving that, that those sort of ideas of like where it comes from and hyperfixating on where it comes from and all and all those prejudices are part of the problem. 
church is urging us to be careful when judging others who may be different to us because we can often be pleasantly be, surprised. Be careful when judging others that are different to us. I was just trying to go back to remember the list of critics that he cited at the beginning of the video and wondering which of those he would say are prone to uh, only critiquing the person whose like, backstory they don't really know and then uh, like demeaning the art based on the personality behind it as opposed to the art itself. Because I don't know like all of the people that he, he listed at the beginning, but I know a few of them and I don't recall them ever doing that. Well, but... The, I, I just I wonder how applicable this is because what the film's talking about is a, a really like a, a, this is equally well founded and not that in this world rats are like almost human level in terms of communication and understanding so of course that changes a lot of things but if in our world like there's a justified sort of revulsion against rats in a kitchen of course because it can make things so unhygienic that people can get diseases and stuff you've got to be careful but if we go broad and say well it's about how you shouldn't necessarily assume like the worst about where a thing can come from. And and instead of thinking about that from the perspective of um, we want to encourage everyone to think that you can be an artist no matter where you're from or what your circumstance, you can get out there and be an artist. I love that. However, the idea that I can't judge a work or before it's out based on what I know about the creator, that's just a little silly to me. Like, of course I can. I know a lot about what I can expect from particular people instead of just being like, oh, I'll be absolutely neutral on consuming the next J.J. Abrams film. It's like, well, no. I am going to give it a chance and I'll praise it where I can. We'll see, yeah. But like, you know, we, we all develop profiles for all of these different artists that, that uh, are very consistently disappointing, let's put it that way, with a lot of, you know, elements. Um, I, I just I feel like it's yet another side to the coin that's going to be ignored, even though it's completely reasonable. And that everyone does it, by the way. There's no one out there who's never looked at a piece of work and thought, oh, shit, this is by him. Oh, well. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, you will give it a shot, you know, we'll try Like, that's normal behavior as far as I'm concerned. And yeah. it's not unhealthy. I wouldn't say you need to change that behavior is kind of what I'm getting at. But it can go too far. I'll agree with that. You could maybe say that Todd Phillips is not a true filmmaker and that you can't enjoy anything he'll ever make. Like, oh, that that's a little insane. Because a good <laughs> filmmaker can come from anywhere. It's like people get anyone can direct. Uh, shocked and almost want recognition that I would ever acknowledge Ozymandias as one of the best episodes of TV. It's like, yeah, but Ryan Johnson directed it. It's like, it's fine. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, he didn't write it. Well, even if he did, though, I'd still be able to acknowledge it. I'd be like, yeah, apparently he was fucking on point then, and he lost whatever it was. It would raise more questions about what happened, but... That yes. one's easier to explain than George Lucas and Ridley Scott. Like, what the oh, hell? Those Carl guys were involved yeah. in those, and then they were also involved in those? It's like... Yeah, what, what happened? I don't know. It's hard to... Old? <laughs> it's, it's old? What old. did it? Old. We've heard before that old could be quite the bite killer, so... Yes, that's true. <laughs> to see that they can offer things of truly great value to the world. Like Anton, we can easily fall into the trap of negative criticism of others and how one conducts themselves in their own lives if their lifestyles are quite different to ours or if they hold an idea or opinion that contradicts our own. This can be scary, which is why our initial instincts are to turn against it. I feel like we've gotten off the rails here because mm. judging people is very different than judging art. And he's going on a people judging tangent. Yeah, I'm not really sure who and he's I'm arguing with here. Well, and, and he started talking about like how new and different experiences you're automatically going to be against them. And assuming that you're making an appeal to like the state of change, nobody likes things to change when everything's in order or something. It's like, I don't know, man. I, like, this is again coming back to what even is new. It's like if someone enjoys the fuck out of, I don't know, Citizen Kane now. Would you be like, well, yeah, of course, because that's standard, that's old, and that's secure. Like, you were never challenged by it. And it's like, well, how do you know that? How, how, how do you not know that that was the most challenging thing they'd ever seen? I feel like there's so many aspects that are going to be ignored on this, because there's so many variables that can make someone against or for a piece of artwork that have nothing to do with whether or not it's new. In fact, I don't even know how much that comes into my mind when I'm thinking about whether or not something's good. Like, is this new? It's like, I don't, it's not really... I don't think. When was the last time you guys watched a, a film that made you go like, "Wow, this is unprecedented"? 
unprecedented. Yeah, you saw um, something in the film that made you go like, I have never experienced this before. I mean, probably Army of the uh, Dead with weird blurriness. <laughs> not not like, a that film, was a, but that was the a She-Hulk hilarious. finale. The She-Hulk finale really ticked me off when it got rid of the climax. So I was like, I've never seen that before. Yeah, I, I was. I, it's so funny now because I'm like, all the examples are going to be shit things, <laughs> like really shit things. It's they not come gonna... to mind easier. That's for sure. Yeah. Like, it's, bit, it's also partly the nature of it being unprecedented. It's unprecedented for a reason. Like most inventions are completely useless and crap. It takes sort of repeated use, honing, and usually marrying them with some older form and style, something that went before them, to innovate something good and useful out of them. But something completely unprecedented is almost certainly going to be shit. That's why it's so unprecedented. In terms of likelihoods, and that's the thing, is he going to acknowledge that? The, the vast majority of criticism of brand new experiences, unprecedented ones, People are critical because they are often shit. It's like, no, he's not going to say that. As humans, kinda, this we makes can me be... think of when uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey first came out. I read that uh, it was widely panned by a lot of mainstream critics because it was just perceived as too out there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but it gained a cult following. Since students were just like, whoa, like I haven't seen anything like this before. This is cool, and it's like intelligent. They saw the value in, it. and like, in a case like that, it's like, yeah, it would be nice if there was a mainstream to defend something new that actually had something cool to offer. But Isn't like, that... yeah, like you were, sorry, go ahead. Um, it, would that be an example at that point that would fit into Anton, or could it be explained by loads of things? Like, someone could be like, oh, well, you see. They were resistant to change, that's why they didn't really accept Blade Runner or 2001 or whatever. It's like, well, it could also be that they fucking didn't like it and uh, have since got an understanding of it thanks to other people that has improved their experience watching it or whatever have you. Like, there's so many things that could come into this, because I wonder if they would use that as positive examples of this phenomenon. They'd be like, you see, they resisted 2001, they resisted Blade Runner, they resisted Big Lebowski, they didn't see these things for what they were, they instead saw them as new, different, and therefore bad, and that we need to break that cycle. Like I said, to me, like uh, what, what if someone's review of, like, I don't know, uh, Blade Runner was that this is boring, rote, and basic, and it's like, oh yeah, look at me, I'm a sci-fi, look at me with my robots, so I don't care. <laughs> and you'd be like, Jesus Christ. So his criticism <laughs> is that it's that's not creative. <laughs> that's what I'm saying? And then at that point, it's just like, well, that's just shit criticism, and that's just a misunderstanding of the film. What does that have to do with new or old, you know? Right. I'm thinking about a lot of the movies from the last few years that I've really liked, and almost all of them have given me a sort of feeling of like, man, they don't make movies like this anymore, rather than this is something I've never seen before in a movie. Wow, this is incredible. Yeah, we you find know, ourselves like... saying that a lot when watching or re-watching classics or good shit that's coming out. We're just like, ah, oh, it's been a while. It's not like, whoa, I've never seen this. Yeah, it's just like, mm -hmm. oh, a really solid hero's story with compelling characters and good writing. It's not, you haven't reinvented anything. This is just really good, and we don't see a lot of it. <laughs> yeah. And that's an instance, as we said, where the old becomes the new. So at that point, it does get real confusing. Fearful of change and upsetting the established status quo. And Do you like how he's saying, like, fearful of change when, if anything, Anton and we would advocate we're desperate for change? change? Yes, he's desperate for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I mean, I'm just desperate for... Today. I'm just desperate for quality, is basically. Well, but that's the Whether change, that's change right? or similar. I guess... Yeah, I guess bad quality is the, the now. But if I had quality for 10 years in a row... I don't think I'd be desperate for something bad. No, you're right, absolutely. <laughs> but that, that, that's why I think he's wrong in this video, that he's like, we shouldn't be so resistant to change. It's like, I don't care whether or not it's change. I want good shit. But right yeah. now, technically, yes, I want change, right. because yeah. right now we're getting lots of shit. And largely for a good reason. The status quo is what maintains the order that we rely upon. And the traditions of the past and the social rules that we've developed are incredibly important to how we function as a society. 
may share lessons and wisdoms of what usually works and what usually doesn't, as well as teach us how to get along with each other. Thus, being aware of social cues and the status quo isn't always a bad thing. But trying something different doesn't mean that either. I believe part of why we're afraid of things that are different comes down to how we're so used to everything around us and anything that can change that order. So I feel like this sentiment would apply to the people who said, like, I can't see bricks in Star Wars. It it would be like, you guys need to, you're going to be fine. You're going to make it. It's okay. Be open-minded to a little bit of change. I'm not even going to concede that that's change. I believe there are bricks in Star Wars. Like, but... (laughs) If that were to be on that level, you know, instead, if you would like, you know, drastic character criticisms, and then someone said, well, hey, why don't we experiment with just having inconsistent characters? You'd be like, um, <laughs> what? What, what, are we, yeah, what the fuck? Thing that we have to fight against. We can become so entrenched and ingrained with our own current lifestyles that those same ways of life can become so integral to who we are and what we want to surround ourselves with. Therefore, we reach a point where we share opinions, ideas, facets about what we like and what we do so much that they in turn become part of who we are. They represent our personality. As much as I I feel like I want to agree with him almost completely, I would be like, well, you are going to acknowledge, though, the other side of it, meaning you can get attached in your identity to the nature of you as an artist never being criticized and that you can't handle it or that it's uh, something that ruins you even if it is genuine and um, important, and that that needs to be accepted as well. Like, don't tie your identity to being praised. You need to be ready for all kinds of aspects and stuff, because it just, it goes both ways. Like, there's a lot of problems with insecurities that relate to, like, you believe life should go a particular way, and when it doesn't, yeah, you can't a lot of it. A lot of what Ratatouille is saying about criticism and art and everything like that does tie into who you are as a person and your attitudes towards it. It's mm-hmm. not just the thing itself, it's how you go about it. You can't be... You know, it's the difference between being critical and being cynical, uh, or being, um, I guess, misanthropic or anything like that. But when something new comes along that's completely different and challenges our current lifestyle, our ideas, opinions, and facets feel threatened as they might no longer be needed in the future versions of you. Everything that makes up you, or at least parts of you, is being challenged and you become unsure of how to react to such a drastic change. This is where a new personality is forming, but it often involves discarding some old part of you. And re- I'm interested in the idea of the reverse of it again. I'm like, what about when you need to realize that the artwork is awful and that that's going to affect a personality a part of you as well. I guess it's the um in my head I'm running the reverse video, the problem with overpraise. So it's like how would it look? Yeah. What would it be about? Yeah, like I'd like an example. So the Disney Star Wars, for example. Um, what about my personality needs to change for me to like that? <laughs> and do I need to change or should it maybe just be better? Well, I would love it if he was in the call and he said, Well no, that's just shit. And you're like, oh okay. <laughs> just making sure cool. Yeah, yeah. Replacing it with something new. And importantly, something that we really don't understand yet, or know of as well as the old idea. That can be really scary, which is partly why I believe our initial reaction to something unknown is sometimes one of repulse, because we typically always fear what we do not know. Again, I want to agree with him, and then be like, and as we all agree, I assume, you can go the other direction, where something you don't understand, or something you haven't properly understood, and you just praise it, because you don't know what else to do. You're like, I'm used to praising this, so I'm just, yeah, praise, there you go, it's great, I love it. Well, then there's people who make their entire personality that they're interested in the cutting edge of subversive, challenging new things, and like, they, they... I, I don't like this insistence that it's a good in and of itself to like change your entire personality to like things that you don't initially like. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? As if it's a good in and of itself to realign your entire perspective so that things that totally re- try to reinvent the artistic wheel are good in your mind now. Like, what if, what if it just isn't good? If, um, Him- go ahead. Him saying the unknown was such a breath of fresh air because he's constantly saying new, and it goes back to what Mahler's saying. New is uh, is relative. Uh, so if you're somebody who you like, you're constantly trying to change up a trope, and then somebody says, "Well, what if we try the classic trope of guy saves the princess?" 
you're you instinctively reject that because you know it's an old idea but it's relatively unknown to you he's putting so much emphasis on new and yet that one time he said unknown just made everything he said like so much more coherent i think yeah unknown's better than new for sure um unfamiliar sort of thing the uh Does thing i was gonna apply in this case though because so like if we're going back to anton what what exactly is unknown to him like the thing that causes his moment of awakening and revelation is, is actually a memory of something that old is, that is exceptionally something... known that is exceptionally yeah. not new what's new is the source but he doesn't know that he doesn't know the source before he yeah, tries it and yeah. the source is, is irrelevant yeah so i don't know that the argument quite tracks the example no i think that's a fair thought and I was going to say, if I was to concede that TLJ's ideas are enough to consider new, then I would think that the criticism is fully formed at that point as an example of people praised the hell out of TLJ for the fact that it went off the rails, for the fact that it was different, for the fact that we just watched a film in the Star Wars universe that challenged the shit out of everybody. And then you can take it to the extreme, like, this would never happen, but imagine someone like had a canvas and didn't put any paint on it, or just painted it white, for example, and then it got charged like hundreds of thousands of dollars to be put no, in a gallery. That. No, that would, never happen. that would never happen. That would never but, happen, of course, because we as a society have some fucking standards. Yeah, that would never but, happen. But, <laughs> I mean, I, accepting your bizarre hypothetical, I suppose that would be something. So it would be something. So yeah, Listen, and, and, and if that were you, to happen, one might argue you are just praising it because it's new. And different and weird, and uh, do that. and this guy would then be like, "Yeah, well, that's better than uh, you know hating it because it's new." And it's like, "Well, how about both of you are wrong? Stop! <laughs> just why, who the fuck cares if it's new or old? Just praise it for what it is, or criticize it for what it is." Listen, I know it's scary, Mahler, but you need to change your entire personality such that you like TLJ. Because nah, <laughs> it's good. It's good to do that. Well, if I did that, then I'd probably stop liking the OT, and I don't want to do that. I'm alright. But that's a necessary just... part of your growth. Oh, no. exactly. You're just scared of change. That's <laughs> oh, all you are. You're scared. Yeah. I refuse growth or learning. There, you can quote me. Learning bad. There's something within us, be it because of biology or culture, that makes us wary of something. That we don't understand. But that doesn't mean we should give in to our fears. A great critic will be able to distinguish and judge the good from the bad while also allowing us to take those first steps to accept something different. This works. It's crazy but it works. We can be the greatest restaurant in Paris and this rat, this brilliant little chef, can lead us there. So if it's about whether it's good or bad, ultimately, because you yeah. don't want the critic to just, you know, praise all things for being new, then what's the point? Like, if it's, it always comes back to whether it's good or bad. Yeah, maintain so your why, integrity, call good, good, call bad, bad. Why this focus on the new if ultimately it's only about whether it's good or bad? Mm-hmm. What do you say? You with me? Fuck no, it's a rat, dude. Oh, are you insane? <laughs> are you fucking insane? There's a rat that controls you with your hair? <laughs> Bye, Will Why I is your nose so big? What the fuck? As one of my favorite YouTubers, Video Game Donkey, once said... No! <laughs> oh, what man. What do you like about him? Sometimes I want to wonder. See, I like see donkey. look, we, we need to live for about biases. Jokes? Is it the lack of insight? Is it the what? What part of it is good? I was going to say, uh, John, it's totally fair and fine to find Donkey totally entertaining, but like insightful, I draw the fucking line. <laughs> right. He, well, um, he wouldn't be my go-to for like an in-depth breakdown of something, that's for sure. One of the things that bothers me is how much, uh, how little effort he puts into like the research side of things, the accuracy side of things, and a lot of the quote unquote insightful things I've heard people quote about him are things other people said like a decade ago. And it bugs the hell out of me that they get attributed to him. A critic's right. power comes from their consistency in their voice, it is through their extensive. Oh, like their integrity? I guess no, I think you. I think you just improved what he said because he said consistency of their voice. Which is not quite the same as... Yeah, because that's a bit broad. Like, well, you could mean a lot of things with that. Yeah, if you just have a consistent perspective, like, that doesn't make your insight valuable. Well, because, you know, if, like, Critic A says it's only good if there are women in it, Critic B says it's only good if there's explosions in it, and Critic C says it's only good if it's three hours long or more, 
Like, they would all have integrity if they maintained those three perspectives throughout all the movies they review, even though that might be a worthless perspective to all of us from all three of them. But I could still say they have yeah. integrity. True. Expensive expertise with the reviewing that makes them more certified as a critic because their breadth of knowledge on a topic helps them become the masters in knowing well, what works and what yeah, it yeah, can. Yeah, it can. It can also destroy their poison. perspective. Yeah, yeah. It, can ab it can absolutely just act as complete you know I mean? total poison. This whole video's problem is that he doesn't acknowledge the other side of the coin, ever. All of these things mm -hmm. that he's saying have equal and opposites that need to be acknowledged as well what doesn't, and articulating exactly why. These are incredibly important traits to have, and they should not be understated. But to be a truly masterful critic, there has to be more. The other half to the story is to discover and defend the new, uh, to help us understand- Stop. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's just a misunderstanding, I feel like, of this- If this the whole... new is only- he said it himself that the new is valuable when it's good, so yep. that's, the, that's the thing. It's not half the story, it's the whole story. Well, and as we said, you know like um, Night Before Christmas? If I took yes, someone I who did not have any familiarity with the state of the industry or with film, really at all, they just didn't know much about it. We watch a couple of films that are just, you know, Lord of the Rings, whatever else. And then I'm like, how about we watch a new film, brand new, came out yesterday, Night Before Christmas. And they're like, sweet. And I show them it, they would never be able to tell. Like, I could just be like, this is, this is just a production. Obviously, there's maybe things that give it away if they're really good at understanding, like, film uh, i'm trying to think of like exactly what could give it away maybe credits would give it away as well but you know maybe, excluding but, a yeah. lot of what i'm talking about yeah uh, you, yeah the, the um they might be like holy fuck this is revolutionary and it's like it's really not actually and this comes back to the whole new is relative thing this guy like what is new to him is not new to the next person and so it's it's right. really not the focus it really should be on good and bad quality not quality creativity non creative works which by the way i, I feel like is another aspect for him to talk about is there such a thing as like a a, a film or a, or a, you know <laughs> what if i was to present to you my artwork calling it steamed hams when i'd in fact just gotten a bunch of crusty burgers <laughs> is that is that an artwork or 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 am i kind of a phony am i a shallow phony yeah, that should I mean, be derided steamed hams even though they're obviously grilled exactly <laughs> dude that that is like a, i don't I know the I, heyday I of that wondered, meme. that was amazing i remember the heyday of it being just one of everybody's favorite like things in the simpsons but this was before memes this was before you know there was such a thing as simpsons <laughs> back memes. in my day back in my memes yeah. I, 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 I've always really liked the line, you call them steamed hams despite the fact that they're obviously <laughs> grilled. There's something just so amusing about yeah, he's, that. Yeah, he's being overly critical at that point, Friggy. Yeah, and that just, is, he should appreciate the new. And no, Skinner's scary. steadfastness, he's just like, yes. Yeah. yes. Well, yeah, the fact that he's giving him a thumbs up as his house is Skinner. burning down. <laughs> Seymour, yeah. the house is on fire. No, mother, it's just the northern lights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the awkward thumbs up. Help! Help! And then the, 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 the running lawyer. sound effect. Like, da -da 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 -da. Yeah. <laughs> there was Damn. a lot of good ones in that episode. Because, like, you remember the it's one where uh, Nelson was laughing at the dude in the small car and then he gets out and he's like, I hey, think <laughs> after him. Yeah. Should you I therefore be made the subject life. of fun? I guess yeah, so. Like, would you, would you <laughs> like it if I laughed at your misfortune? <laughs> <laughs> that is the smallest, that is the largest automobile I could afford. Why is he talking like that? I love that <laughs> fucking character. He's funny as hell. You never see him again. No, nope, he's the Simpsons there, log man and he appears off. once. There's so many good, like, one-off Simpsons characters. You, you know, well, I don't know if he's a one-off. Do you remember the, do you remember the, the, it was like the day where it was really hot in Springfield mm -hmm. and there was this guy playing his guitar. He's like, sunshine on my shoulders makes me happy. And this one dude just walks up and punches, punches him, him in the face. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He shows up a couple of times, only a few. And I don't think we ever find out his name. You know, but, you know, despite being old, if you were to rewatch the classic Simpsons, you might just feel like they're new. Oh, yeah, and by the way, that's, uh, we were talking about it again in terms of, uh, you know, the eras of, I don't know, man, I don't think it's nostalgia, like, goddamn, you know, mm -hmm. Simpsons, Golden Age Simpsons growing up with that, that was, like, some big shit. 
Oh yeah, the writing. Was it wasn't brilliant. just because it's funny as it fuck. wasn't just because it was a thing I watched when I was a youngster. Yeah, well, and as was mentioned, it's not just Simpsons. Like, uh, people, a lot of the comments on the video were like, "The Sting is a part of a series of episodes and seasons of just fucking quality animated comedy from Futurama." Mm -hmm. It's like, yep. Yeah. Why something's difference should be valued to illuminate and reveal the truth of things and ideas that we do not know. That is the ultimate takeaway from Ratatouille, because... What? <laughs> That's the <laughs> ultimate takeaway? That the good is valuable in and of itself? Like, sorry, the, the new is valuable in and of itself, because it's different? I mean, I would pick many, many... Like, if, if we're talking about the ultimate meaning of Ratatouille, again, I feel like it is the a great cook can come yeah. from anywhere. That's, like, the Greatness most central from meaning. anywhere. Not that different is good. I don't know. Yeah, if and and and, and if we wanted to move on to it, it would be that creativity is good, mm -hmm. not necessarily. I wouldn't even say that the film is making the case that like new exclu. It feels like the don't way be more afraid fundamentally... to be creative. You should, you know... yeah, create things and don't be afraid to be creative. That exactly. I mean, that's one of the first that's... things Gusto says in that recording at the beginning of the movie. He's like, "You have mm -hmm. to be bold. You have to go out and just fucking do it. Fearless. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, do it, you fucker." That's what he says. That's what he says, yeah. Like Anton so states, cool. a critic's true power comes from being the hunters of discovering something new. Disagree. He doesn't not, do that the, anyway. I don't even remember that quote, yeah. <laughs> like, but... I, think that's, I, don't I don't know whether that's he says quality. that or not. He doesn't well, like, do it in the movie. It's so easy to appeal to all these other meaningful things. It's like, what if someone told you, what if the greatest artist all fucking time told you that a critic giving them a scathing, like fucking heartless and cruel review is what got them motivated to make their next great mm. project? What does that mean to you? What does that mean in general? I don't know. There's a lot of things you can take away from it. What is a critic's job? What is their purpose? What is their sole honor to this world to do? It is to discover the new and back it up. It's like, well, that's one thing they can do. They can do a lot of things. What about the, the critic who boldly says, this fucking thing right here is shit, and you're all loving shit. And then everyone goes, man, he's right. We love shit. Oh, Never man, thought about I it like love that. Shit. Yeah. Man. <clears throat> um, I feel like a lot of people admit uh, that TLJ kind of red-pilled on like a lot of the quality of film for them, individuals. Uh, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm included to some degree, for sure, because I came out with a similar experience of, what the hell did I just see? What's happening to me? <laughs> on, the, uh, on the subject of food, if we wanted to hone in on that, how do they feel about, you know, like Gordon Ramsay, a highly accomplished chef, and his very scathing critiques on, like, Kitchen He's overly nightmares. critical, Fringy. And Hell's Kitchen, where he's, like, deliberately... Like, a lot of, a lot of the point of Hell's Kitchen is to uh, orchestrate situations that are challenging and to put a lot of pressure on people to see how they perform under that pressure. It's just that... The equal opposite thing proves true every single time. When I make something and someone says, oh man, elements A, C, and E are great. You should do more of that. And then the other guy says, B and, uh, B and D though. Oof, need to work on that. And I'm like, thanks, useless guy. I'm going to go with the praise guy. <laughs> it's like, okay. I don't know. nice about it. No. I would argue that most uh, artists, and this would include critics, want to connect with their audience. That sure. would probably be like my guess as if you're talking about art on a broad concept, that would be the goal. So I would say discovering the new is not necessarily going to connect you with your audience. Yeah, well, it's all components. I feel like these are all elements that can be included, but he's treated as like it's the be all and end all. And it's like, oh, yeah. strange. That, yeah, it's not, it's, only... yeah, it's, it's not. It's a tool. It's not the goal. Like, it's, it's, of course, nice when it happens. Like if there's a new thing that's yeah. cool and nobody's paying attention and says, you know what, this is actually pretty sweet, check this out. And then it gets a bunch of attention and deserves um, praise and, you know, it skyrockets in popularity and deservedly so, it's actually good. I mean, that's a nice but to just sum up the the entire purpose of a critic is just to defend the news. Well, there used to um, be a, a function in society. That function he's describing of finding the new and supporting it through thick and thin is the function that patrons used to provide. That was the job of a patron. The patron wanted to have their reputation embellished by the fact that they'd gotten onto the next big thing before everybody else did. When critics become patrons, I actually think that's a pretty bad thing. Because automatically, then you're you're asking the question of criticism generally: Are you being honest about this artwork and assessing it on its merits, or are you assessing it based on the person you support or don't support? Did you discover this person and that makes their art good? I don't like critics as patrons. That happens occasionally, and it never seems to end well. 
And even if they don't support it themselves financially, if what they're after is a reputation for being on the cutting edge, it's like, well, how do I know necessarily that you're recommending things because you think they're good or just because you want to seem Just because hip? they're new. And you want the appreciation. I was going to say, what an alternate timeline where Remy makes a couple mistakes. He throws in an experimental ingredient and it's not a good choice. And he puts it out there. He eats it, uh, Anton, and he says, Pugh. Okay, and writes down a bunch of things like, you've clearly overcooked this, you've added this when that's a distinctly, like, combative taste with this, and you've, um, you know, you've done this, 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 and it's just like, next time, actually try. Oh, uh, here's then, an example, though. Well, wait, and then, okay. uh, you know, that goes back to Remy, and he's, like, depressed. Let's just pretend this film is fucking two and a half hours now. And then, you know, you get a speech <laughs> from the chef ghost that's like, you never should have built, like, your assumption on your artistry from whether or not Ego approves, but at the same time, Ego's not some monster. Listen to what he said. Is any of that useful? Is any of it something that you can take forward? And then maybe he takes it in, he ignores a couple of the things that he thinks Ego was wrong about, whatever, makes the next meal, gives it to Anton, and we get the ending as it sits now. It's like, does that become a bad movie? Because Anton was actually helpful with the criticism or something? What I was going to say in terms of like an interesting one to think about is what is Remy doing when he sees that uh, Linguini ruined the soup and he goes along and fixes it? He doesn't, you know, levy the criticism to his face, but it's about recognizing right from wrong and like going that extra mile to fix it. Are you saying that him changing the soup is a form of criticism? Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> he has oh to my recognize accept the new. Bad. He did yeah. not accept the new. That's he why didn't Remy accept the new. You're right. Well, that's right. The, the new was vomited out by uh, <laughs> Joel, Joel Linguini. And then the face that Remy makes when he smells it is so good. Yeah. It's oh, God, eye. yeah. It's, it's funny it's as like, fuck. Ugh. I need to find a way to fit a reaction like that into... Maybe I'll find a way to put it into the Ahsoka edit. Yeah. <laughs> Just Every time Just you him. say the name of a character, it's Remy's face. <laughs> With his oh, eyes bulging out of his head. head. <laughs> <laughs> Sabine. <laughs> 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 If it's all about supporting the new, though, surely you could just throw any combination of random shit on the plate, and that would be supportable, <laughs> worthy, right? Like, no one's ever thought before of wrapping strawberry flan in bacon. That's a really bold move. That's it's the thing, man. So support it. Well, I guess the, uh, the interesting one was um, another example in the film. Remember how they were going to, off, off uh, menu, order um, one of, um, one of uh, I can't believe it, uh, Fat Man. Yeah, one of Gusto's um, recipes that was considered pretty bad. And all it took was Remy doing a little bit of criticism and going, you know, uh, not going on the recipe and changing it. And that was already like an experimental thing, but it stemmed from criticism. How... Criticism of the new that was flawed to make something new and good. Yeah, how are we not at the point where we've basically proven that criticism and artistry are like interwoven? There's... They have to be. They have to be. What does it mean when, you know, Gordon Ramsay is going to a restaurant as a cook, so you can't, you know, do the argument of like, well, he can't do it. It's like, well, no, he can walk the walk and talk the talk. And what does it exactly. mean when he's being critical of his own stuff or critical of other people's stuff in order to help them succeed or push them in that direction, even when his criticism, a lot of the time, is fucking harsh. It's harsh, you know? But the people who take weird... it on board and run with it often uh, do, do quite well. People do this weird thing where they separate as if they're actually meaningfully different uh, criticism mm. that happens in the artistic, like in the crafting process itself, and criticism that happens afterwards. You know, what yeah. I mean? as if it's like it's not essentially the same thing. And like people go, oh well, the first one is obviously necessary because you need feedback yeah. as you're making it. But no, we don't. But like, once it's uh, done, you know, fuck it. Even though that after it's yeah. done, that feedback can feed into your next creation, or exactly. you know. Depending on what discipline you're in, if you're cooking, right, you try the dish again, and it's like, yeah, no, it's pretty good, but, you know, don't, you know, you need to, I don't know, reduce this a little bit more, or, yeah, you know, maybe you, try this combination, put a little bit more salt in it, you know? The efforts I've been putting into saying, like, you know, the most important element of the critic is the integrity. It's like, similarly to an artist, you might argue the most important thing is their integrity as an artist. And I guess what I would yes. say as a comparison to make this so very clear to the guy who made the video is that if you're presented with a guy who's like, check this out, I made, you know... Um, I'm trying to think of an elaborate way to be critical of food as a critic, and you, you know, like I have actually managed to cook up, you know, a version of their own food, kind of like what Remy did, right? And and if it was presented as this is my critic format, I take the food they gave me, taste it. If I think it's wrong, I then recook a lot of what they gave me, 
to prove that even with the ingredients after they've been cooked, I can make something that's much better. You know, uh, uh, what I'm trying to <laughs> in, uh, infuse is an artistry, right? And then the comparison is that there's another guy who throws the plate onto the table and then unrolls a bunch of potatoes and puts like, you know, some mud on them. And it's just like, this is different. Try it. And it's like, who of these two is the one that took the more risks or had more creativity? And it's like, well, the critic obviously isn't because he's just, you know, fucking around. But the artist, look at this. Look at this poop with potatoes. I just, oh, Ugh. wow. And I just, I hate poop potatoes. And at that point, it's just like depressing. And you're actually like damaging what could be great critics from, you know, taking on their artistry and pursuing their careers and dreams just because you want to like sell that critics themselves a parasitic or a, you know, a, a, it's just lame. <laughs> gets around then it sounds like a critic does risk something they get risk being called a parasite i still like i almost want an answer from him what does it mean when someone watches the finale for game of thrones and then criticizes all the plot holes and then the second half of the video is rewriting it at their own whim of mm. what the story should be is that now criticism happened? and art or uh, they separated how does what it happened work? They do criticism but while they're doing it they're painting like this incredible landscape you know like that's their footage <laughs> While they're yeah. shitting on, uh, you know, Game of Thrones, and they make tree, something beautiful. Yeah. yeah, a happy little tree, you know, while they're talking about it. Because, like, hmm. sometimes I actually believe, unfortunately, that there are people who think, like, like Chris Tuckman, that his format is, like, the scope of criticism, and that's it. And it's like, dude. Yeah. That's, like, the shit criticism. There's so much amazing <laughs> shit out there. Part of the thing with Chris Stuckman is that he's clearly trying to make sure he's on the good side of people in the film industry such that like he could work with them because that's what he wants to do. Because there's a taboo in a lot of the entertainment industry about openly negatively criticizing other people's work. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're in the industry, I've always hated it because it seems like a sort of, I don't know, like a culture of sense, a culture of censorship to a degree, like all these people have negative opinions of movies, but it's just like, oh, don't talk about it because that you know, that person might take it personally, and then you'll never work in this town again or something. You know what I mean? You never work Where in you... this town again. Yeah. You'll never work. <laughs> you'll never. Well, and, and of course, I've been in this town again. Treating the statements and actions and, and creations from Chris as genuine, but yes, you could assume that a lot of what he's said in the recent years are because he's he's realized quickly. It's like. I mean, it's, it's not much of a coincidence, is it, that he makes a video about how we should be nicer to directors when he starts properly, like, directing? When he wants to yeah, mm. start directing. How curious. I don't know. I find <laughs> it's a real strange that he I mean, so I, significantly I devalue but... so much of his work, though. It's just so funny to me that you don't need to watch his videos anymore, because if he's talking about it, he liked it. <laughs> Because mm. he doesn't talk about things he doesn't like. Well, anymore. and I was about to say, someone will be like, well, you can find out the reasons. It's like, I mean, usually half of his video is just saying what the thing was. It's, it's not yeah. really. Yeah, and it was directed by this person, and it was written, well, I don't know if he often says who it was written by. You know, just <laughs> a summary of, of, like, facts about the film, rather than... I think it was um his Hill House review, where it was staggering. Oh, he talks about, yeah, Mike Flanagan yeah. made it, Mike Flanagan also made all these things. I like Mike Flanagan. Hill House stars this person who was also in this, and then and then you're like, wait a minute, there's only a third of the video left. What the fuck? You haven't even talked about mm -hmm. what it is. Like, what the? How does this work? Yeah. And being someone responsible enough to defend something that is different but also valuable, it is through. So why not just valuable? Why do we have to throw the different part in? It's like I said, he comes into this video with a premise, but he didn't state the premise at the beginning. So he just assumes we all agree with that premise that we're judging it's new harshly. Yeah. Failure to make sure that what's in your mind, you got to make sure it goes into other people's minds. We Reverse know mind reading, money. like you said yes. before. Yes. Do the talking. Through the critic's breadth of knowledge and expertise of why something is genuinely good that empowers the trust in their voice, but importantly... It's like he's almost there, isn't it? He needs to think about this a little longer and then he'll yeah. come to the conclusion like, wait, it is all about it being good and bad. It's not actually... A... It's funny because that's where he started. He was like, it's not just about good and bad, it's about new. But then every time he talks about new, he also qualifies, that's good though. Like, so it's yeah, about good and good. bad. Yeah. I don't, I don't like this be... idea that you know if any if anyone out there focuses all of their criticism they devote an entire channel to singing the praises of the lord of the rings movies or something like that that they're missing half the puzzle because they're not going out to hunt down new things to also 
praise if they're good. You know, if you just focus on old things, you're not really a critic because you're missing half the puzzle. It's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yes. Like, I don't, I think you could never do that and still be a good critic. It's all about that scope shit I was talking about where it's like, you know, it, it depends on what they're trying to achieve with the, the video itself or the whatever format it is. Like, you know, is the guy who only talks about Lord of the Rings better than the guy who talks about all the film? It's like, well, but there's a, there's a different goal there. There's different things that are happening. Mm -hmm. The critics' willingness to lend their voice towards something that they recognize as being genuinely good, even if others are scared to see it. Something that challenges current perceptions on what is art, but that the critic can see for themselves. I feel like that's just jumped in here when it hasn't been set up at all. What is art? Yep. You haven't done any groundwork for that. That's, that's a whole new thing, a whole new paradigm. Selves ...will become something of great value in the future because it breaks the old ways of thinking for the better. This is the only way something new can be discovered and what leads to word of mouth spreading... Do you say it's the only way? Is it f through, through critics? Mm, don't know about that. Or is he just saying it's the only uh, way through it being shared? Yeah, if you include at that point, critics just... in the general sense of word of mouth. Yeah, but at that so... point, that's like saying it being shared is the only way for it to be shared. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, okay. It is a little like that, yeah. About something different that people should try. There needs to be someone bold enough to start the process because when someone recommends something you haven't seen before or talks about a new idea, opinion, or even just a social trend, you in turn are about to discover something that is new and potentially good. And so this is kind of running back, I think someone mentioned this as well, is like the people at the beginning of the video, I don't, of all the ones I'm familiar with, I don't know any of them, and there are people I don't like from that selection, who I still think recommend things that are off, uh, you know, against the grain or, or off the mainstream. Mm -hmm. I don't know that this is a problem. Um, as long as the reviews are good as long as they're yeah. good reviewers that's kind of the key well something that doesn't get acknowledged that's so fucking true is that you understand of all the things that are released in mainstream there's loads i don't even know exist yeah imagine how like is when whenever even the most popular movies probably the case that even the most popular movies less than half of anyone has seen them um there's a yeah. lot of stuff out there either and so when just, someone recommends you know, a fucking, a movie, I'm trying to think of what would be a good example here, like, something that's mainstream but loads of people just haven't seen. Puss in Boots 2 was like that for me. There's a lot of people, um, they're like, really, the well, second Puss in Boots movie? I'm like, no, it's actually, it's really, really good. Go I mean, it the, the Lord of the Rings. I guess that would super apply. Mainstream, I mean, super mainstream, made about 20 years ago. A lot, I just, a lot of people haven't seen it. And that's the it's thing, I the feel like it's the, it. it's another form of cynical to be like, you know, what do you recommend? And someone goes, Lord of the Rings trilogy, and you go, ugh, of course you recommend that. And then some other guy's like, well, I haven't seen it. And then it's like, oh, well, yeah, good then, go see it now, now that you know about it. And then that same dude is like, oh, well, do you, why don't you recommend something that most people aren't aware of? And it's like, that guy wasn't aware of it. It's important that he should be made aware of it. It's really fucking good. Right. Yeah. And then, like, it comes across as, like, snooty, right? It's just, like, I don't like that you're recommending things I recognize. It's like, okay, I'll do better next time. <laughs> Something that might... I get the feeling that uh, this isn't the topic that wanted to be... I, I might be, like, pushing boundaries, but this isn't the topic that this guy wanted to talk about because he keeps randomly diverting to talking about not art. He keeps talking about, like, people and their personalities and social stuff. It feels like he wanted to talk about that found the movie about art, and then he keeps making non-sequiturs to it. It was just really frustrating. No, yeah, I think you're right. There's, um, we need some redrafting in this video, is what I've discovered. Cause <clears throat> there's, um, Don't be overly critical now, okay? There's a core that's nice. working, and he's understood a lot about Ratatouille. I just feel like there's a lot that he's missing, and my god, other side of the coin. Flip that coin. Look on the other side. There's stuff on there. <laughs> It'd be no, different. Think, uh, somewhere in this video, he has a line where he's you know, artists in the creation of their art offer a piece of themselves. And that's probably what he's using to, like, sort of go off into that territory. But, like, I, I agree, he shouldn't be... He's spending too much time over there. But also fun. And something that eventually might become the new norm. 
It is only in this way that risking to think differently that can truly make an impact. It is only in this way that I believe should be the highest ambition and ideal for any critic for any medium. Nah, highest ambition for any medium and critic is integrity as far as I'm concerned. Make sure you stay true to yourself and the work itself. Um, I'm including like the accuracy part of that essentially in that. Mm -hmm. the, um, I don't. I don't care if you want to cover nothing but films with Arnold Schwarzenegger in it. That's fine. You go. You do you. Just make sure you keep that spirit intact. Um, and if someone else says like no, they need to watch Stallone films too. I'm like no man. They can just do Schwarzenegger <laughs> if they want. That's okay. Try something new. Watch Rocky. <laughs> this is exactly what Anton realizes and expresses in his speech. He comes to the sobering acknowledgement of who he is as a Odd person fetish. and of the worst part of being a critic. The very fact that a critic risks very little compared to the role of the artist and that the average piece of junk an artist can make will sustain more meaning than any criticism that he could conjure up with. Which Boo I and piss. Boo, Boo and piss. piss. Boo. Um, especially the irony of the, this whole section that he's drawing that from is criticism. It's Anton criticizing himself. I once went oh, to he's, a, he's just repeating the dialogue from the scene as if it's gospel, but like yeah. that scene is flawed. The scene is flawed. Like new things. Like, as, as a critic, I, I once went to this this poetry open mic slam thing in London. Um, which is where you get to hear all lots of different people with their brand new ideas and the amount of sheer horror on display is, is quite <laughs> impressive. Like there's one person who stood up and said, so I've been thinking a lot about words and oh, no. you know, like they connect together and just <laughs> proceeded to spend five minutes just reading off a list of random disconnected words and then inviting the audience to make a connection between them themselves, <laughs> according that poetry. Now, if you're a critic and you want to try and explain what makes art work, what makes art not work, they, what are the great examples to look back to? Are you going to go to something like that, or are you going to go and read, I don't know, W.H. Auden or A. Houseman or someone who actually knows what they're talking about, will, which will be somebody who is old and established? A, a load of new stuff is just meaningless garbage. It's not. And the critic will be much better served by, and actually offer something much more valuable to the world by ignoring that and in, fav like in favor of understanding what about the old stuff really, you know, makes it click. Bro. Not boo and piss. What's the opposite of boo and piss? Yay and pee. Uh, no, Cheers and cum. <laughs> Cheers and cum. Yeah, okay. Cheers and cum. Yeah. Cheers and cum to you. Cheers and cum. Yeah. You are. This it. makes more sense the more you think about it because how many famous critics. It's like Dudding Kruger. It does make sense and then it's going to not make any sense the longer you go. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, man, this fits everything. And then you're like, wait a minute. It doesn't. Oh, stuck in. Fix. Liar. Do you remember. And how many famous wait, artists. Wait, hold on. Can we rewind can that just a second? Sure, man. Boop, 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 boop. This makes more sense the more you think about it, because how many famous critics do you remember? And how many famous artists can you name? That I don't think that's a good example. That's, that's not fair. Not, that's like, not a fair, no, yeah. It that's, um, I, I don't even know that. You don't have to conclude from that that artists are worth more inherently because of that. You could also, you could include, uh, you could conclude. Sorry, how many famous firefighters are there? Like, I know that you could be like, well, that's, that's, yeah, I was about to say, like, even surgeons. If you wanted to, like that, yeah. Even if you wanted to focus in on creativity, there are a lot of people who just don't get known. Yeah, famous carpenters. contributions. I know one. Like, favorite, to, uh, I mean, famous cameraman. Uh, yeah. Yeah, how this many is, this, is, this is a fucking horrible point. How many people could name famous animators, like, compared to naming actors? And then, you know, of course, like how many... Uh, and then, and what, what are we to make of that? What is the implication there that you know more actors than you do animators? Of the you know very, very... You know writers, for sure. Of the yeah, very definitely. generously delivered, if the world could actually name 1% of directors, that are really great, by the way, as well. That's another qualifier I'll throw in. What does that mean about the other 99%? That they're not worthwhile? Mm, yeah, like I, what I is the, the moral message here as well was that you know if something is new and unfamiliar and different, then it's intrinsically more valuable than something that's very familiar to you. In which case, if you know fewer critics, critics are probably more important. <laughs> you, you know, more critics. really fucking funny too <laughs> yeah. is that, and I'm going to point this at you, Efab Chat. A lot of people yeah. in there, they could probably name more critics than directors. If it's potentially. Uh, Depends on how much time they spend on YouTube. <laughs> like they might I be able to. So, yeah, the YouTube yeah. component. Yeah. And then what does that well, mean? That the critics are more valuable. Like, what a stupid metric. That annoyed me a little bit. 
this if point I, ignores I, I, that I that fame all, any activity that comes with fame usually has a face attached to it and usually that face isn't everyone included or the even sometimes the most important person a lot of times that face is like the 27th most important person well it's so like i said how many people could name like animators a lot like it's not often that people know of animators uh but like what what are we what are we implying because we don't know people's names yeah like or next, the next to why, animators, you could have, you could have gone... sheer amount of vfx artists that yeah. work on these fucking marvel yeah, absolutely yeah that just get lost in a mass Proud. I guess we don't care about you them know? now. They're not as autistic. But the thing that fucks me off about this is like you could have come to the alternative conclusion, which is that wow, how unfair the critics don't get to be remembered as much as the artists, even though they're adding a lot to the world. Even they direct though, people to important yeah. artworks that they have art artists' works in the form of their review. And it's like, and nobody gives a shit because it's not seen as artistic, which is part of the problem. But instead, he's concluded, well, there you go. They're not very valuable, are they? It's like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Twist the knife, why don't you? History is not kind to critics because we, as a society, largely focus on great creations that come from great so artists. Fuck you. you. I yeah. have so that something to say about that. That was a terrible person. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's such oh, a I'm fuck sorry. you, Robert. Like, sorry, uh, uh, critics out there. You don't make work that's greatly valued. Sorry, you just don't. <laughs> it's like... Hey, bud. How many production designers can you name? Ah, see, history's not very kind to production designers. Because, because they don't make works that people really value. Care. It's like, no, we so do. We just don't dumb. know their name. We watch movies and go, wow, that's a great movie. Not everything that has value comes with fame. It, do it doesn't work like that. Yeah, who invented the potato? Was it God? <laughs> like, who even knows? <laughs> What? And is a very <laughs> the pit is pretty he valuable, okay? <laughs> very good reason for that. These artists have dared to discover and find something new. Shut Some up. Like this... there, are, there are a lot of artists who dared to discover That's something not even... new who don't get remembered. Yeah, I was about, well, I was about to say, the, the key to being remembered as a director isn't making something new. It's making something fucking great. That's going to be the key. Yeah, and even then, even then, you might not. You might not, well... People no. Yeah, well, that, so this is the other thing. Most people know the names of really shit directors, too. What does that mm -hmm. mean? How many well, people know who directed The Lion King? How many people could actually tell you who directed it, despite many people saying it's, like, one of their favorite films of all time? Oh, I don't even know. Damn. And then... Yeah, the thing. Yeah. People don't know animation directors. People don't know their names. And then how many people know who directed... Oh, I gotta be careful with what I pick here, actually. How many, how many people know who Michael Bay is? A lot of people. Well, yeah, well, I was gonna say like the room. Does everyone know who directed the room? And it's like a lot of people do. And it's like, does that mean the room is fucking great? Like, no. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, man. Like, what what an ill advised conclusion. How have you not noticed at this point that your thinking is a little uh, holy? Something different and to be valued. This is the artist's noble ideal, and it should be the same ideal for critics. You know what sucks too is that like he's managed to convince himself that the artist's role is new and like creative when there should be a space yep. in culture for artists that provide you something familiar and comforting and that they're important as well. Mm -hmm. yep. Like, yep. I don't know why we don't value those who like if you want to see a story of someone overcoming great odds in a very like well known like I said hero's journey type thing. There's nothing wrong with that. The implication that's like you fucker, you should be getting, you should be desiring new experiences. Like, what if I want? that experience because of the fact that it's so valuable to me. A lot of creative people are just temperamentally inclined towards new experiences and they think that's all creativity is. And they look down on anything that isn't that. Like, oh, you're just making paintings that, you know, people with no taste buy to put up in their apartments or something like that. I'm doing, I'm putting a banana on the wall. That's new. <laughs> it is new and <laughs> eating that banana is new as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm familiar no with that. For you. I'm familiar with that as an art installation, but that's so funny. Like somebody just doing that in their house, like in their <laughs> living room. So just, just have yeah, I've been putting bananas on my walls for years, and no one ever gave me any cats on the back for. No it. one ever gave me fame. But uh, I don't know if you know, John, but uh, the the previous I think 251, we covered a video that talked about an art installation that was blank canvases. Oh, right, yeah. It went for a lot of money, too. Uh, it's the kind of shit that's just like, okay, 
this is a joke, and that's yeah, the point of it. Right. It's there's, gotta there's be. There's a famous yeah. anecdote when someone dropped their glasses, I think it was, in an art gallery, and they fell into a corner and everyone assumed they were an installation and started taking pictures of lost property. It's like, it's not art <laughs> or creation. But if you compare, you know, going back to the actual great artists, the ones people actually remember, the chances are they've spent the majority of their life learning older styles in order to innovate, innovate off of those. So any great Renaissance painter spent years and years and years learning the styles of the old masters before they became learning them the themselves of what they did with that. Same yep. thing with cinema, like the most popular directors, you know, whether or not you think they make good stuff, I think James Cameron has a pretty patchy record, but he's incredibly popular. What is Titanic? Well, it's basically Romeo and Juliet on a ship. It's an old form in a new medium, but the form itself is ancient. And knowing that ancient form and its enduring popularity is what allowed him to make such a wildly successful product. So most great artists are not old like inventors who create brand new things. They just find new yeah. uses for old things. And I right. think that's best Your accentuated by John Williams going back to oh, yeah. uh, Gustav mm. Holtz, right? Like yep. it would be, Holtz, among um, others, someone yeah. could say like, he's a fucking filthy ripoff. Or they and could they say have. he's inspired. It drives me nuts. Yeah. People, this thing. Oh God, that drives me fucking up the wall. Yeah, and that, like, if oh, someone in a hundred years up. from now makes a story about a fob kid who wants to explore the galaxy in his sci-fi fantasy world and defeat like an overwhelming force, be like, this is just fucking Star Wars. It's like, well, it might be. It might also be completely like original and considered alongside all the other elements that are involved in it. Like, you gotta calm the fuck down. That can be new <laughs> as well. Uh, something that comes up a lot when we talk about different things. The difference between rip-off and inspiration is complicated, I'll admit. And the thing, the very thing that makes John Williams the most memorable, probably, of all the composers is, you know, that the use of the light motif. But the light motif, he, you could trace that back to Monte Verdi and however many centuries ago that was. And, like, it hasn't changed much in the basic form and idea of the thing, but he thought, well, let's apply this much more rigorously and classically to film soundtrack. And lo and behold, he creates... The compositions that accompany the best known works of film and in large part they're the best known because they have some of the best and most memorable soundtracks to them it's a really old idea but he just applies it in new ways also can i reverse engineer what he said in this video to chatify critics he basically said these guys work tirelessly to you know express themselves in their art form knowing they won't be remembered for it <laughs> like, man good on you lads keep at it Everyone's gonna shit on them for being mean, but they do it anyway. Yeah, meanwhile the artists of the world are like, I'm gonna get famous, yeah, and I'm, that's why I'm doing it. Meanwhile the critics know they can't get famous, so they must be in it for the art form. <laughs> While we yeah, might I, uh, It makes me... Sorry, go ahead. No, I just made a pun. Go ahead. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, I was just thinking of, like, fashion shows. And I'm like, that's a a realm where maybe people should be not trying so hard to come up with something new because it feels like every <laughs> outfit is just like trying you must understand what is everything that's conventional all the standards wardrobe. that develop for like film review to the average person maybe sounds as alien as it does to us when someone comes out dressed as like a half-eaten fish that is like oh that that's fashion <laughs> you're like it is it's like i i can't explain to you the decades of analysis the the fashion theory that would explain this but yes it's good you're like all right <laughs> like, well they yeah. say that fashion is clothes that are meant to be more observed than they are worn right and i'm like that doesn't make sense to any other artistic merit because music is meant to be listened to film is meant to be uh watched like so people are like well you don't look at a picture then judge it on how on its use and i'm like it's uses i'm supposed to look at it like if you're if you're taking clothes and you're assigning a different function uh, or not not assigning a different function, but getting rid of one of its primary functions, it, it being worn, that, that doesn't make any sense to me. But maybe right. I'm just overly critical. Or out of touch. Well, the, the image I was thinking of was that uh, black latex thing that Sam Smith wore <laughs> uh, relatively recently, where it's just like, it's so ridiculous if you haven't seen it. Yeah, it's like it. bulging in all these weird places, like it's inflated with <laughs> air. And it's like like you were saying, like it goes totally against the function of clothing. Like you wouldn't wear that. Like so, so what is the point? It, I mean, it's like deliberately trying to look top the other one in terms of ridiculousness. It's like why are we even doing this anymore? Like, I think what, to a degree, what's the point? We're all we're all lucky that films are so expensive to make because it's part of why film hasn't gone off the same deep end a lot of other art forms have. 
You say that like, as though we're not like driving I, no, off the cliff be, that is film no, quality. You, it could be. It could be so much worse. I like, get you. Yeah, at, I get you. like modern fashion and bananas on walls and stuff like that. Like the fil film. Film. Well, could it be is said? A bit safer from that because it's so expensive to make. No one's gonna just make the banana on a wall equivalent and put it in theaters. I would say oh, film yeah, okay. has a reputation <laughs> that is expensive to make. A good film is not necessarily expensive to make. Um, compared to all these other art forms, yes, it is. Yeah, put, I'm taking a banana it has to that wall. Reputation. No, it, it actually is expensive to make a feature film compared to clothes. But you to said put on film with walk. a feature film that, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's what we're talking about is feature films and shows. Yeah, those are expensive to make. Yeah, I think what Cap's saying is you're never going to see the banana on a wall equivalent coming out of Disney or whoever and entering theaters. Like, it's not going to happen. They just. No. <laughs> Partially because they need to make money or else they're not. It's know. the kind of it's the kind of thing where if it was submitted, even Disney would be like, okay, yeah, but no. <laughs> like it's, it's sure, but nah, we're not doing that. Remember well, the people, I see people in the chat are saying like the point of the fashion thing is tension, and I agree with that. But it's like I'm you know, willing to admit you, you that can... they throw the standard out of wearability or whatever. I, I get it, but that, I, I assume sh uh, but the point being made was kind of like that's something you don't expect as a as a normal viewer entering that culture of like, oh, wearability is not important to the clothing. Okay. And what is yeah. like what what are we doing here? You know, if we're just here the to same get way attention, that you could make a film yeah. with a blasting horrible noise, and someone could be like. <laughs> That's unconsumable. And you're like, well, no, but that's part of the art. And you're like, okay. I don't like it. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. We gonna say something then, Cap? Uh, uh, no, no, go ahead. All right. For critics, while we might not remember the names of prominent critics, we do, however, remember the names of someone that has recommended something that has pleasantly surprised us and that we've greatly enjoyed. We remember oh. that someone who turned us on to a new show. Well, that's just our. Well, that's just our ability to remember names. And, I mean, at that point, yeah, we're and, talking. Th that's that's not that's <laughs> that's not an issue with the criticism. Yeah, that's nothing to do with anything, really. Artist. This is just like a a human memory association kind of thing. Do you remember the guy who picked up your hat when it blew off the other day? Like, like, like maybe. <laughs> the guy who picked up your hat and blew off. He didn't say his name. He said, no need oh, to thank no. me. Anyway. Well, he, he had to do the hat and said, hello, I'm Simon. You're like, Simon. Yeah, that's right. When wow. Shady do-rags, when, when his do-rag was on just a little too tight, and it sprung upwards and shot high into the air, and that one guy caught it before it the ground. What was go. his name? We'll never know. He was gone before I. He turned around to thank him, but he was he was He's gone. Already gone. Like but the wind. Was it vanished was into it the an, mist? Like was a, it an angel? Like was it a uh, who? What like tears in the rain? No, no, yeah. no. That's not the He's quote. Gone. It's like burps in the wind. I think that's what he like, says. <laughs> like burps in the breeze. <laughs> who I am is not important. I go where I need it. <laughs> do you remember? Do you remember? Because there's loads of Family Guy stuff that I find hilarious. Remember when uh, they're parodying It's American Beauty and Peter's watching a bag and then yeah. it, it goes up to God and he's like, it's just a bag floating in the wind. Do you have any idea how complicated your circulatory system is? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's okay. Even like, even God would be like, I've made some shit art, but you've got to appreciate I've made some really good stuff. Stop, stop going for the fucking banana on the wall. <laughs> like, appreciate the good mm. stuff. <laughs> different than we now love. We remember that moment of two, discovering and finding something new that we like. And it is in this way that we too should remember why being a critic can be a good thing. You know what's funny too is like, take Boiling Point, we recommended the hell out of that. It's relatively yes. unknown, it's very low budget compared to a lot of things that we often talk about. And then um, if this guy had said like, yeah, wasn't that great discovering something new? I'd be like, what do you mean by new? Because I don't know that I'd call Boiling Point new in an uh, other than the fact that it was new and uh, I hadn't seen it before. There's nothing yeah, in Boiling or, or Point or like that made it, me rethink my perspective on film or anything. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? And it's like, okay, so it wasn't new. And it's like, well, I don't know. I don't know. What is your definition of new video maker? Right. I mean, it's not the certainly not the fact that it was like meant to look like a one shot. I mean, that's not. Yeah, I've seen that before. That before. 
important as being a critic isn't about being negative or cynical for the sake of- Can you name a critic well, that would have said I it was? <laughs> yeah, like if I'm I'm a critic and I just I just if you ain't shitting on something, you suck. <laughs> it's all about shitting. Shitting everywhere. That's what you do. Being pessimistic or being cautious or afraid of something that we don't know or don't understand. It's about finding that moment, that new thing, that different idea which makes life good again. But what if that and new and different idea is negative? What if I go, wow, I've realized that stories that are about, like, I don't know, characters that try to achieve something and uh, get it easily, a shit. Is that okay? Am I allowed to have that conclusion, or is it negative now, so it's a bad one? Is that a new to thing? To be fair, he's, he said that makes life good again. It's hard, because he keeps pausing well, that after could make life important word. Good again. Do you, do you, this is, this is going to be a get, get a bit difficult, but what if you were snapped out of loving everything, and you felt life became better and more meaningful because of that? You know what I mean? Like, you watch everything and you love everything. And then you're like, one day you go, wait, a lot of this stuff is actually shit. Like, actually awful, and it's embarrassing that I liked it. And then you look back in a year's time and you're like, fuck, I hated the time where I was just loving everything. It was nonsense and meaningless. But now, I have this full palette and scale, and it's way better. And one could argue, like, what was injected into that person's life? It's like, well, a bit of cynicism, a bit of uh, critical thinking, a bit of negativity. And they feel their yeah. life was improved. What about that? And uh, I don't know. I can't. I have a hard time picturing it because I like I envy people who don't analyze every single thing they watch. You do. So I'm like I can't. I can't just do that. <laughs> do I mean, you actually like though? If you could, time. if you could flip a switch that makes it so you enjoy all media, would you flip it? No, I would. I would yeah. not flip that switch. No. But when I say I envy them, I'm like I. I would like to feel that joy they feel as well. But I would red. not give up my it's analytical <laughs> it's ability to do it. Oh, he vadered. He vadered. What? I vadered. If Did someone, you? You... no, it's just it's it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's just it's just. Why do you mock me so? It's just how how matter all of this gets from thinking about all the different things that have happened over the years. Oh, okay. It took me. Oh, okay. I know what you mean. Oh, okay. I see what you mean. I accept. Okay. Sharing that knowledge and experience with others—that is the Ratatouille way. Believe me, no, it isn't. I've muted. We're good. La 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 la. <laughs> Man, he's... I guess uh, oh. they would have monetized the fuck out of this or demonetized it. You know, the Ratatouille <laughs> people, I mean. But the Pixar, is he a Disney big whatever. channel? Maybe he doesn't even have to worry about that sort of thing. He might have privatized it early and then like months early and then once like all the copyright stuff was done, released it. Maybe. That's that. Um, a wholly straightforward view on the state of criticism that lacks any and all sort of, I mean, I hate to use the word, but nuance. Like better, I think of like counters to your own position, come on. Yeah, the arc he went on was that, like, yeah, criticism's mostly about, you know, saying this is good and this is bad, but there's more to it. And then halfway through, there it's like, like, that's only half the story. Like, what's good and bad is only half the story. There's a whole other side of the new. And then at the end, it's like, the most important thing is the new. Like, he just, like, as the video went on, it was more and more prioritizing that discovering new things and telling people about them that's what a critic does that's what a critic is that's what the essence of criticism is also he's got a video from four months ago called uh why tv shows are getting worse and the thumbnail says quantity over quality like hmm uh, being a little overly mm. critical there bud i also yeah. see that uh, <laughs> why, why oppenheimer doesn't cut the mustard an, and atomic, an atomic misfire fire, and it has Homer sleeping in the courtroom with his Glasses on that makes it look like he's awake. Oh, it's boring. Oh, come on, man. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know. Is that the, I guess that's the implication of Homer sitting there with his glasses, but yeah, that's unfortunate. <laughs> is cut I mean, the mustard a thing? I've yeah, never cut heard the mustard. That you have cut the mustard. Yeah, yeah. Is, yeah, it's not up to snuff. Yeah, it doesn't cut the mustard. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, I get that up to snuff. No yeah. fucking clue. I cut the mustard. <laughs> <laughs> means well, that I don't normally probably not mustard. a good idea because it's gonna confuse people. But hey, whatever if you want to use it. Um, yeah. Well, I think uh, the the 
I think the video as a whole makes like two major mistakes, which is people for some reason forget that when you're doing video essays, there's still essays uh, and there are specific for uh, formats to follow with essays. One, you got to address points that could be used against you, because if you don't, you either look ignorant or you look um, disingenuous. Uh, and this video doesn't seem to come from the perspective of uh, new can be bad or that we 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 have a heart. It comes from the perspective that we have a harsh criticism on new. So it's constantly defending new. Um, and that's the other thing. You can't assume thing. You can't assume that your audience takes your position on certain things. There are certain truths in this world that we do accept to be true, like gravity exists. Uh, but usually <laughs> that's, nice and fundamental there. Uh, but uh, that's more of a size thing, like like the basic structure of plot. You know, exposition, rising, exposition, climax, etc. You know, we accept that to be true. Uh, but things that we don't accept to be true, exist. like you have to establish that at the beginning uh, or somewhere throughout your video. Because if you just assume that premise and you go on that premise, your audience who disagrees with that premise is going to be like, "Wait, none of this makes any sense. What are you talking about?" <clears throat> Well, the, the, so part of the issue might actually be that he feels like this is all very straightforward and intuitive. Um, I have no idea if he's ever thought about a lot of the equal and opposite counters or just sort of uh, this whole obsession with new and has he ever... Ins like, I think I think he would treat that as a given. Like, we all value new things, new experiences, because we're humans and that's what we like, right? And it's just like, well, his, his deeper thought on that is, well, we fear it sometimes because it can breach order or continuity with... Uh, our expected existence in this world, but ultimately it's just like, you got anything else to say on that? Like, there's so many other thoughts, especially when he when he threw in that one part where he mentioned uh, what would even can be considered or counted as art. It's just like, holy fuck, you can't be bringing that in. That's uh, what's that as we a variable? You can talk about it if you want to talk about it, but it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, we can do it. We'll um, do it. I don't know. Yeah, and and I don't know that um. That Ratatouille fully supports a lot of the points that he was making, as well as a lot of the points that Ratatouille itself was making. Um, which is arguably a hot take as well. But hey, uh, the video wasn't the worst thing ever. It was alright. It wasn't the worst right. video that we've covered at all. No. Wasn't even close. Yeah, chat, be nice. I feel like it could have been at least ten minutes shorter, because like a lot of it, especially the end, was just repeating the same mm -hmm. thing of like discovering the new and to do that like he kept it felt like a lot of but like i kind of sorry what a lot of what you cut out oh sorry uh rephrasing the same essential point of like critics a critic's job is to defend the new and so like okay i get film it like... says is nothing more important than finding something brand new yeah. you just didn't find a brand new thing to illustrate the point with but you know right um, which wraps us up on that video. Uh, is there anything else anyone wanted to say about it? Nah. <laughs> um, no, I guess not. It's not, it's not bad. No, I'm good. It's not the worst I've ever seen. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe we, we don't want to be overly critical, videos. okay? Gotta be constructive, <clears throat> non-negative. This was a new experience for us covering that video, and that in and of itself is beautiful if you think about it. Well, I, have, yeah. I have at least learned that yeah, the next time I watch a film that's that really, no. really shit, I might just be scared of it. So I'll have to, you know, reevaluate <laughs> where I'm coming from. Um, I mean, I do agree that critics should look beyond, like, convention in evaluating new things that come out. But like, he sort of he, I feel like he thinks critics have this bias against new things, and they don't really, for the most part. I don't think. So, like, my, I, I feel like this didn't really need to be said. I don't know. In my experience, I, I find that a lot of people who are professional critics watch way more movies than the average person and are much more prone to criticize things for being unoriginal than the average person would. It's almost the opposite problem. Mm. Mm. Right. Well, that about does it, I'd say. Beautiful. Incredible. What's everyone's opinion on Lion King one and a half? It I never happened. saw that. Never saw it. Yeah, I didn't uh, see it. it's a it's a fine movie to put on for kids, but it's a downgrade from both one and two. Do they actually call it one point five or whatever? One and a half. One and a half. Depends uh, on the region. Some places called it three, but yeah, America called it one and a half. Oh, that's lame. <laughs> what is, so, what's this? Gold blitz. <laughs>
in Wales. And then, hang on, I gotta cover down. Um, every goddamn time. We know what Rags is talking about. You know, he's just so goofy looking, I wanna hug it. So I'm gonna be honest, what? that's not quite what I meant. And then, I didn't need to take this negativity, I'm going to quit making art and go to space. Don't go to space! This is obviously referencing to uh, good old Ahsoka, for those who haven't caught up, should be watching the EFAB TV episodes, you foolish fools, if you haven't. Yeah, yeah. Another foolish. Beautiful Beowin artwork. We're all looking very uh, beautiful. <laughs> oh. Is oh, Rag supposed to be ripped there, or are those breasts? Yes. No, I'm ripped. <laughs> He's ripped, yes. Okay. I'm ripped. I'm ripped. <laughs> <laughs> Super He's strong. Just so goofy. So um, going to Manus is not funny. Yes, yeah, but don't go to space. Thank you very much. And I was going to say that uh, we're probably going to wrap up there. But before we do, I'd like to say thank you so much to Shady Do Rags for welcome, Absolutely. brand new episode, brand new mm. guest. Appreciate you. It was a lot of fun talking to you. And do you want to tell the audience where you're at, what you're up to, and and what they can watch of your stuff? Uh, nope. yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was, Go for it. Go for it. I had to, yeah. I had to mute it. my freaking mic because I was coughing. Oh, no. <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt you. Okay, hold on. <clears throat> hey, hello, how do you do? Shady Do Rags here. Welcome to EFAP. We're ending. Where you can find me is on YouTube.com slash at Shady Do Rags. Uh, I am known for reviewing cartoons. I recently hit 200K. Uh, and uh, I went on break recently, so there's not mu there's not much from September. But after that, I got sick, so I should be returning soon. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter. Uh, I don't know what my Twitter is. Hold on, <laughs> you, can you can find, find me on there somewhere. <laughs> you look hard. Whatever enough. my Twitter is, I'm there. Uh, uh, I oh, think you uh, mean twitter.com slash twitter.com slash shady do rags yep there that's, you go. <laughs> that's definitely me uh and if you're interested in king of the hill or superhero shows from the 2000s or pretty much cartoons in general i do talk about that stuff uh my audience will probably tell you that they really like my uh and analysis abilities uh comedy and my uh appreciation for uh morals because i do talk about morals and how they affect us in the name real world, three so. good morals name three good morals yeah such a friend. Uh, gravity um, exists <laughs> <laughs> i would say uh be a good person there you go don't That's be beautiful. a bad person Ooh. and don't pressure people to think of good morals on the spot yeah and don't be overly oh, critical okay. don't right. over criticize <laughs> All right. That's no, you can be overly critical. You can definitely be over overly critical, especially uh, of Ratatouille. You have to be able to admit that Ratatouille is meant to be a good critic. <gasps> that's. I'm sorry. That's the. That's the standard. Bom, bom, bom. Well, links in description and in chat. And uh, yeah, thank you very much um, for coming on. Next up to say thank you to, of course, would be uh, Mr. Little Platoon. Thanks, thanks for joining us, talking about criticism and all that stuff. I would say, and will say, uh, to talk about your channel and what you're up to, though I imagine EFAB Chat are very familiar with you at this point. But that won't stop you, and nor should it. What are you making? What are you up to? Uh, no, well, thank you for having me back. Yeah, as soon as this is finished, I'm going back to fighting copyright on this Mandalorian video, which was supposed to be out a month ago, and then today, and still isn't. So, yeah, that's going to be hopefully out tomorrow. Nice little four and a half hours of being overly critical of the Mandalorian. So, um, Good. that's what's coming sucks. up next. You've learned are nothing, you, um, What's that, Dad? Are you immediately jumping into Ahsoka by any chance, or...? Uh, I really shouldn't for my sanity, yeah. but probably <laughs> will, yeah. Oh, no. Well, uh, thanks, of course, once again, for joining us. We're always happy to have you, mate. Um, uh, well, uh, John, what are you up to? Tell the good people of the world. Oh, well, uh, people know me for rubbing the Chief. I'm still making those. I made a new one called Chief's Big Wiener, parts one and two. I just put part oh, two out the other day. I didn't know Chief had a big wiener. I'd always... He does. I've always like, imagined fact. that he probably would, but... Yeah. It's very big, and he becomes Prime Minister of Canada because he's so big. Because of... And yeah, it, because, or just, yeah, it's because directly unrelated. related, yes. Because of his big wiener. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, John Graham on YouTube. Um, don't criticize me, though, because... <laughs> <laughs> Only if it's positive. I have feelings, so yes. criticism is bad. And Mr. Capital O Opinions, always a pleasure. Oh, what are you up to? 
Well, thanks for having me. Believe it or not, Devs 4 is almost done and Woo! will be out soon. Uh, oh my god, Devs, then... that's a terrible fucking TV show. Correct. <laughs> I'm going to be overly critical about it. Before oh. then, probably, we'll probably do a stream on our channel talking about The Creator, new sci-fi movie that just came out, which I haven't seen yet, but assuming it's any worth talking about at all, we'll talk about that I've, on stream. I've been hearing rumblings. Week rumblings about this mm. film yes rumblings indeed oh, not the bad rumbling good rumblings that. you know good rumblings, good rumblings. yeah Ooh, those are the best kind of rumblings uh, i rumbling think drinker saw it today rumblings. so i will be seeing what he thought of it soon enough to get an idea of whether or not this is a movie for the ages or we should be overly critical of it i don't know it really matters how much it's new i would say that's really the yes. defy exciting factor um well, uh, Rags, Ring, anything you guys want to mention? Um, no, not in particular. No, not really. Uh, well, you know the deal. I'm just currently, presently working on uh, Ahsoka EFAP TVs. And which... they're in the end. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And Mauler is helping me finish them off. So... Well, I'll, um, I'll may as well go over the, the schedule at this the... point. Yeah. Okay. So, uh,. And funnily enough, this will this will include some cap uh, work here as well, right? So we're we we've just crossed into the first in in British time, which is actually the expected date for the release of Soul One, which was edited what? essentially exclusively by Cap. I think I did some extra copyright stuff, which I had to do for all of the Saws, just because of how much of a monster YouTube was specifically with Saw. Um, don't know why they're desperate to. Keep a hold of Saw or something. I don't want people to know the truth. Um, particularly, I think episodes, uh, episodes, movies four, five, and six. I think you'll notice that the copyright in it is excessive. But I had no choice. Um, it was, it was actually getting to the point where I, did I not link you, uh, for a, 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 they did like a four second one or something. It was insanely small. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I had to go heavy with uh, protection compared to something like Ahsoka, where you guys actually get to look at. You know a scene almost sometimes and it's like whoa look at that <laughs> a scene um so you get in that i was about to say tomorrow but for me it's technically today the day after you get in saw 2 whoa. that's just how this has worked out day after that you get an ahsoka episode 5 but now i'm starting to rethink and we might it might be five and six together because then it would be a week and you'd get seven and eight together which is the plan because we're boy. trying to Keep the fuck up here. We've we. I was about to say we fell behind, but that's really not true. They released them too fast. They okay? released two episodes, yeah. and that put us behind right from the outset. Well, we also had to edit the video. The Star Wars is never going to grow up. Yeah, one, so. that was a bit of a detour. And then it's just you know, it takes it takes some time to to make these. So yeah, give me an idea, chat. And this is a genuine question. Answer honestly. Would you prefer it that we released like Ahsoka episodes individually, but stacked together in terms of like you know? The third is one, the fourth is one, the fifth is one, the sixth is one. Like, uh, the days of October, I mean. Or would you find value in them being packed, as in, like, five and six together, and then seven and eight together? And don't say you don't care. I'm trying to figure this out. God, Not us the you same said, video, <laughs> right? But just releasing on the same day? It's kind of... Why don't you, uh, like, do a poll? Well, because I can read. You got individual oh, together. Wow. Individual. <laughs> yeah. wow. Are you keeping track? Are you that. counting them? All no, right, I'm, not gonna I'm not going to determine it based on like down to 51% or not. All, all I can oh, already I tell. So you're, you're, you're comfortable so with this rude. imprecise way of doing it. Well, yeah, because okay. yeah. I was curious if it was going to stack one way, the other will go uh, in, in the middle. And it's, it, it looks like it's mostly in the middle. A lot of people are saying together and individual. And so... It's hard to say. Well, I'll have to figure it out. I'm not sure. I'll talk to Rags and Fringy about it. We'll figure it out. No worries, folks. Yeah, but that's right. Your the, fate's in our hands. The the truth of it is that by the eighth, right? By the eighth, you will get Soul One, Soul Two, Soul Three, and then Ahsoka Five, Six, Seven, and Eight. Right? The one yep. week you get all of them, which is yep. very oh, why. Yeah. Very why. I'm tired. This is very why uh, on the 7th <laughs> there's not going to be a mainline EFAP episode because you get in all of them and it's going to be my birthday stream as well. So I'm going to stream oh, a ooh, game. Hooray. Who knows what it might be? Might be a heavily requested game. Who knows? But I'll try and do a, very, a big old long stream and um, yeah, you got loads of stuff to come. And that's just, this has been non-stop editing. In fact, this stream should probably end sooner rather than later because i got to do a few hours on, on Ahsoka Episode 5, make sure I can get it out for Tuesday at the very least. 
Um, someone said Last of Us 2. <laughs> no. <laughs> I can't wait to see Mahler play The Last Mahler. of Us 2. Never oh again. boy, I've been chomping at the bit to see him play that. I've heard it's really good. And forever, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, yeah, the Souls are releasing across the month, and um, there's ten in total. So There are ten Saw movies. Yes, so actually, as of in. two days ago, I think. Has anyone said anything about it? I haven't seen anything about Soul 10. Peep, there's some... It's the getting some praise. Ooh. Yeah. So funnily some enough, rumbling. if you want to talk about, you know, critic reviews on Rotten Tomatoes and everything. Oh my god. It's uh it's high Ooh. compared to the other four films. Oh my god, man. could it be the film that we actually end up saying is good in the Soul franchise? I don't know. That I don't would know. be that would be pretty funny. <laughs> Excited. Uh, well, yeah. So anyway, uh, that's it for us. We're still um obviously doing super chat catch ups are in their own format. They release every well. Jesus Christ, this is going to be like an upload every day uh, on the Moolah channel at this point. <laughs> yep. Have fun with that, so everybody. don't complain! Don't yeah. you, don't I saw, you dare complain. I saw you, Mr. Gilbert, putting in the super chat saying, man, EFAPs are so short lately. The fucking... Yeah, like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> you got so much EFAP. Fap also, everywhere. this was, this was like over five hours, so... It was. <laughs> it was. What? If, it, if it's not 11 hours, 11 minutes, it's short. It's true. Yeah, it seems that way. Um, but yeah, fuck on you, that, Gilbert. <laughs> on that note, that's what I have to say about that. Uh, that's 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 that. We're gonna gonna head out. So, um, thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you for the kind donations and messages, and just uh, hanging out with this vidya. But for now, we're gonna say goodnight and goodbye. Doodle pip. Yep. See goodbye, ya. everybody. Bye, everybody. See, you. Oh, See you later. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. bye.